What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei back with Reborn as Thor in High School DXD. Record of Ragnarok X DXD. Part 2. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel and for more exclusive content. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Location. Lingvi, future Helheimel Judner, Hell's Palace. POV. Third person. Aljudner was a stronghold located in the heart of the great island of Lingvi, and the only stronghold in the land of the dead. But unlike other fortresses, Aljudner was not exactly built Aljudner was created. Created from the will of a special person, who wanted only one thing a home to come back to. Or better a home that had someone to go back to Hell's childhood, consisted only of the relationship she had with her older brothers, as her father had warned her and her siblings to stay hidden, as the world does not accept the stranger, and tends to hate what it does not understand. Obviously, the five-year-old Hell didn't understand what that meant. She, like her siblings, just obeyed her father. Until Aden appeared and welcomed them with open arms, calling them nephews. And so the three childs of Loki went to live in the realm of the Aesir, which was called Asgard or Asgard. For a while, everything was perfect in Hell's vision, she had a big family that loved her, and still had her brothers and father, all that was missing was her mother. But when Hell turned 10, Loki had said that her mother, Ungerboda, could not see Hell or her brothers, due to certain events Fenrir didn't care, because he didn't understand that sort of thing, and simply continued to play for Asgard or Jormungandr felt resentment towards Ingerboda, because, for him, it seemed that she didn't want them. Hell lamented for days. It took her a long time to get over this news. Hell's new family helped her freak was a good loving mother figure that Hell sought out, and Odin and Loki always ensured that she smiled throughout the day until one day Odin changed. He became more distant from Hell and Jormungandr, and he looked at Fenrir with apprehension. The three Loki children didn't notice this change in attitude immediately, they just thought the fun uncle was upset about something they did, Hal thought the uncle had suffered one of Fenrir's pranks again, like if Fenrir had pissed in Odin's boots or something. It only took a few weeks. But Hal's new family slowly began to distance themselves, and it got to the point that only Loki did not treat Hal and her brothers coldly and then, Jormungandr was sent to live in Midgard by Odin. When Hell asked Loki the why the answer was that her brother was growing too fast, and soon no house could house him, Midgard would offer more space for Jormungandr to grow up. Hell did not like being separated from her brother for such a reason, but she had to accept it, as even Loki supported Odin's decision. And Hell has always trusted her father. And then Hell's powers manifested the ability to see and control souls, was the first thing Hell discovered she could do for Hell, it was as if her eyes saw a new world with new colors. At the age of 12, Hel had found her happy place in a world she considered fun. Until Odin noticed Hel's talent and he didn't take the news very well. No one should have the ability to see and touch souls in Odin's view, it was a total disregard for the cycle of life of the souls. But Odin still knew it was a unique ability just a few beings had that ability. And whoever had this ability was associated with only one thing death. And so, Hel was recognized as the personification of death. Odin then proceeded to send Hel for a single task. Rule the unworthy dead. Hel received the news positively because she thought that if she had an important job and do well, she would have her lovely family back. And so, at the age of nearly 13, Hel was sent to the land of the dead for some people, the realm of the dead was the worst place in the great kingdom of Asgard or, but for Hel, as soon as she stepped into the land of the dead, it was like a part of her return. She felt complete. And more powerful than ever. Just at the age of 13, she created the palace of Aljadnir and ruled over the dead for years. Loki and Fenrir visited her frequently. Until Fenrir was arrested. And Loki's visits became less frequent until they stopped altogether. Hel, however, still had hope that one day her family would visit her again and show them her success in her task, ruling the land of the dead. So she remained waiting in anticipation for someone. And waited and waited and so, for years Hel remained alone. For company she rescued a few souls here and there to become her new friends to pass the time, but it wasn't the same thing. 
and only a few souls who still had some conscience could talk, but they all behaved similarly, everyone avoided socializing with hell. Because the souls were still afraid. After all, no one would be comfortable when someone has their soul in the palm of their hand. So the souls, who still had some conscience, acted respectfully towards hell but never sought to socialize, and so, the souls hell rescued to be her friends became servants. It had been more than half a century since she had received no visits from anyone. And Hell had given up waiting and thought that she would be alone and be forgotten, until Thor appeared. When Thor introduced himself as Odin's son, Hell had never been happier in years. Because she, in a way, got what she wanted which was someone from the family came to visit her. As much as it wasn't Thor's intention he gave Hell a wonderful gift. She hasn't been forgotten. But then Thor had to leave and now, in Iljudnir, in the dining room fit for royalty, the Queen of the Dead sat at a long imperial table preparing for dinner. Hel was sitting at the end of the table with her fork and knife in her hands. It was then that plates, held by spheres of green color, were appearing and being placed on the table, the plate seemed to be floating. Hel just smiled. What do we have today? Ah! Fisk stupid I all! Said Hel in delight, and a something like. Fish and beer. Hel then enjoyed the smell of the food more before continuing to speak with a smile. Smells great I must expect the same taste as always but, I must give my compliments to the cook. I guarantee you it must be pretty good Hell stopped talking quickly when she remembered something, and she took her eyes off her plate and looked at the table, the long imperial table had a total of 100 places for people to sit, all the places had plates and cutlery, but there was no one seated. There was nobody except for Hell herself. She was having dinner alone. Like always. Hell then stopped smiling. Sigh I did it again ha huh? said Hell, reflecting. Hell had enjoyed her cousin's visit, even if it had been brief, she just wished he'd stayed for dinner, and tasted some mortal cuisine, just like her, and had a little chat. Famine I lost my appetite, said Hell. And, oddly enough, the plates and cutlery responded. Because they gave off a green glow and began to float towards the exit of the banquet hall. The green flames from the candelabra on the table went out at the same time. Hell then looked at the knife in her right hand the only cutlery that remained on the table. Starvation may come out too said Hell, dropping the knife from her hand. The knife, like the other cutlery, began to float. But unlike the others that gave off a green glow when they floated, the knife that was called Starvation, gave off a dark glow, as if a shadow were enveloping the mere knife. The knife then floated slowly, but not to the same path the others followed the knife was heading elsewhere. Hell still sat at the table. Sigh well maybe tomorrow someone will show up too? Yes. Remember Hell, stay positive. Besides, my cousin invited me to go to his house whenever I want and me guard will dad be upset if I leave Lingvi for a while? Ask Hell worriedly. Knock knock but Hell's thoughts were interrupted by a noise at the door. Knock knock Hell was startled and froze into silence for her, it was like she had heard something she hadn't heard for a long time. Knock 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 Hell jumped up from her chair, and looked toward the source of the noise, it was the doors to the banquet hall in which she found herself. This noise was coming from the door meaning that someone was on the other side knocking on the door. When Hell realized the meaning of the knocking, she began to smile excitedly. I've waited for so long to say it again Hell whispered to herself. Hell then sat back down and uttered words that had not been spoken by her for a long time. You may come in. Hell said out loud. As soon as Hell answered the door opened. Hello, cousin. Sorry if it's an inopportune time. Said a voice. Hell was excited but confused. Cousin? Said Hell, not understanding. After all, it's not every day that someone visits Iljudner twice in the same day. Not even her father. Yes maybe I should have warned your servants, but Gangladi and Gangla don't move fast, so I just asked where you would be, and they gave me instructions about you having dinner, so I don't want to sound very intrusive. But is there any space in the banquet for more hungry mouths? Said Thor, scratching the back of his neck with a nervous smile. Hell just got even more confused mouths? In plural? Asked Hell in surprise. It was then that Hell noticed something small walking slowly to a stop beside Thor. It was small and a little different, but Hell recognized those eyes anywhere. Fenrir? Hell asked uncertainly. Fenrir seemed to react to his name being called, because he has gotten prick ears and tilted his head a little to the side until he began to growl softly in a warning. But Thor soon interrupted Fenrir. Hey! Answer your little sister in a proper way or if not, no Aaron see me when we get home, Thor said with a tone of sternness. Fenrir stopped growling and looked at Thor. 
He then lowered his ears in defeat and looked away and began to whimper in response. For Hel, who lived with Fenrir during her childhood, it was just Fenrir's way of apologizing. Thor, while facing Fenrir, did not notice that someone had quickly crossed the banquet hall. You rude hungry wolf, at least look the person in the eye when you apologize huff, said Thor, until interrupted. By a hug from Hel. Thanks for bringing him, Hel said, smiling. Hel then pulled out of the embrace and looked at Thor, still smiling radiantly. You are always welcome here. Sit down, and make yourself comfortable, Hel said as she gestured toward the table. Both Thor and Fenrir walked towards the table and walked respectively to the left and right of the seat at the end of the table. Where Hel's seat was. Hel then sat at the head of the table, being followed shortly thereafter by Thor on her left and Fenrir on her right. Fenrir had to climb onto the table because of his size. It was then that Hel clapped her hands twice. Famine. Please bring one of him bring three specials of the day, please, Hel said the last part in delight since Thor's return, Hel hadn't stopped smiling for a single moment. The long imperial table soon lit the candelabra on the table with a green flame, and three plates with the Fisk stuvid eye all, floated towards the table and landed perfectly. Fenrir wasted no time and started devouring his food. Thor just stared at his plate. When Hel realizes this, she was a little worried did she do something wrong? She soon lost her radiant smile quickly. Hel then began to speak nervously. Do you don't like it? Is it the fish? Do you don't like trout? Can I order another dish ah? It's better for you to tell me what do you like, and then I'll tell to my cooks Hel was then interrupted by Thor. Wow. Easy. Calm down it's nothing like that. I was just surprised. It's just that I've never seen this dish and I don't recognize this cuisine, so I'm not sure what is it Thor explained. It was then that Hel understood it wasn't because Thor didn't like the dish, he just didn't know what it was. This seemed to calm Hel. So Thor made a little comment. But it smells quite good, said Thor. Thor then proceeded to cut a piece of trout and ate it calmly, very different from Fenrir who had already finished his plate and was licking what was left until a second dish landed in front of him. Fenrir's eyes gleamed before starting to devour the second dish. As Thor savored the food, Hel stared at him nervously, waiting for some response as she ate her own food. Not only does it smell good, but it's also delicious. My compliments to the cook. Said Thor smiling and cutting another piece. When Thor said the last part Hel froze. Yes I agree with you said Hel in a weak tone. Thor, noticing Hel's lack of voice, looked toward her. It was then that Thor saw that Hel had a big smile on her face but she was also shedding tears. Ha hey, did I say something wrong? Why are you crying out of nowhere? Thor asked quickly, dropping his silverware and rising from the table. Thor then wiped the tears from Hel's face with the sleeves of his coat. Fenrir had also stopped eating when he noticed Thor's movement, he looked towards Hel and tilted his head to the side in confusion Fenrir seemed to sense Hel's mood. As soon as Thor finished wiping Hel's tears, he returned to his seat, but he didn't take his eyes off Hel. Hel, however, kept smiling. But at least the tears had stopped. As soon as Thor sat down, he intended to ask if Hel was alright. But Hel, however, began to speak first. Let's get back to eating. I guarantee it's delicious. Don't worry, there will always be food on the table so you can dig until your stomach is full. While we eat cousin why don't you tell me how Asgard or Asgard is doing? Ah. You said you live in Midgard, right? Tell me about Midgard first. How it is. Or rather, when I come to visit you, could you show me Midgard, please? Hell spoke animatedly. Time skip. One day after Thor's journey in the land of the dead. Location. Asgard remain palace throne room. POV. Third person. In the throne room of the Aesir realm, Loki, Frigg, Njord, Skadi, and Odin, who was sitting together with Frigg on his famous throne, the Lidskith. These people were arguing about the future of the next generations. Odin. You are my king, and I respect that, you have won the war fairly and honorably and established peace for the first time between us, the Banner Gods, and you the Aesir Gods, you need to consider what I'm asking carefully, so that this peace may exist for many generations to come. As it stands now if by chance we die, another war may break out, and it will be our own extinction due to our numbers. Explained Njord, leader of the Vanner Gods. I thought your son was the god of peace Njord, but does it look like he's also hungry for power? Loki asked with a slight edge of sarcasm. Odin frowned. Loki. Have more respect for our allies. 
Don't make such accusations, even if it's just a joke for you, we're talking serious business," said Odin, with finality. Loki then held up his hands in surrender. I just think brother that the situation is peculiar, after all, they are asking for too much," said Loki, explaining. Scotty then rose from her chair in a rage. Asking for too much? We want to establish a lasting peace. And we seem to want this more than all of you here. Shouted Scotty pointing to Loki and then to Odin. Loki then smiled. Control your wife, Leader Njord after all, Jodens are quite prone to doing shameful things in search of unnecessary c-o-n-f-l-i-c-t, said Loki. You are a Jodin too. Replied Scotty. It's true, but I didn't grow up among savages like Y-O-U replied Loki. Scotty grimaced. You bastard. Screamed Scotty already creating an ice spear. Oh do you really want to fight, Scotty? Such limited behavior and thinking as expected from a wild one, Loki said with a tone of disappointment. But you could see a mocking little smile on Loki's face. That's it. I will skin you alive and hang your skin on the branches of the nearest tree and offer you to Larader. Shouted Scotty. Before Scotty could leap towards Loki, Njorda grabbed her arm. Enough. Shouted a voice. It was Odin, and he was angry. Loki if you're going to create unnecessary conflicts, you'd better leave, if you choose to stay silent. And you Scotty, my brother speak some truth you are asking too much said Odin, with a frown. Loki chose to remain silent, but Scotty Odin. Please understand. As much as Free does not seek conflict, the other Vanner gods are not like that old blood, Odin old blood means settling scores. Some gods lost cousins, uncles, parents, siblings, lovers, sons, and daughters during the last war against the Aesir, and I'm sure there are some Aesir who lost someone too. Free and Freyju are pretty much alone, Njord and I managed to keep the other gods in line because we fought in the last war too, but Free and Freyju didn't and they are the future leaders, so we need to secure their position, said Scotty in supplication. It was then that Freyg decided to speak at this point. And this is how you intend to secure their position as leaders? By marriage? What kind of guarantee do you have that this idea will work? Asked Frigg. Njord then decided to explain. We can only respect force it's the only thing that will keep everyone in line. No one in their right mind will question Free's leadership, if his brother-in-law is the future king of Asgard or, as well as being the most well-regarded and beloved god by all his people. It would be long-term suicide, explained Njord. My son will not be a guarantee. Shouted Frigg. Frigg quickly rose from the throne and walked towards Njord. Have you ever thought about how this idea can go wrong furthermore, even if we accept marrying Baldur with Freyja, what stops the rest of the Vanner gods from silencing Free and putting his sister in power? Ha! Huh. This marriage proposal is ridiculous. It can go very wrong. I will not let my son be killed because of old blood, I also lost my father in the war against you. But Odin and I ruled over the Aesir without a problem, said Freyg crossing her arms. It was then that Scotty could stand it no longer. Of course you ruled without a problem, who doesn't remember the blood eagle that King Odin used to do with some of his captured enemies? No one is crazy to challenge Odin knowing very well what he has already done during the war. Shouted Scotty. Odin then chose that moment to speak calmly. This is what happens in a war. For every blood eagle I made, I saved ten of my people from an unnecessary fight in a war, if both parties have equal numbers of soldiers, the greatest weapon is the fear you cause in your enemy, but now that the war between us is over, I have let you keep your titles as leaders of the banner, and your status as prince and princess. That was my way of starting to ask for forgiveness for what I did, said Odin silently. The room was silent until Njord began to speak. Sigh I understand that, Odd and I also had to use fear as a weapon we, banner gods, have a long history with you Aesir. But you have to see the reason. If we have succeeded in uniting the Aesir and banner royalty, there will never be a risk of future conflict, in addition to ensuring the peace between the Aesir and banner, said Njord. For a moment the room seemed to have gone silent once more, it seemed that all the gods present were considering Njord's words. If we do our kids never married for love, Frigg said. If we do, then no. But again, we didn't have that privilege of marrying for love either, said Scotty. And it was true. Odin and Frigg were married for politics. Scotty and Jord? Politics too. A Jodin with the leader of the Vanner gods. And Loki and his current wife, Sigyn? A political marriage to allay the other gods' distrust of Loki, marrying him to an Aesir goddess. As much as they don't marry for love. Just like us, they can learn to love each other over the years, said Odin. 
Loki then raised his hand, the intention was clear he wanted to speak. Scotty, when she noticed, frowned. Odin then nodded but gave him a warning look. I understand that you want to propose this marriage to avoid bloodshed what I don't understand is. Why Balder? He's a good fighter and has a talent for magic I admit, but he's far from instilling fear in others, he's more loved than feared, and for this specific situation, it's not the best choice, explained Loki. Scotty and Njord were confused. Could you explain then Loki? Asked Njord. Our aim is to quell any future rebellion, and, as my brother has already commented, fear is a good weapon when both parties are alike in strength after all, you're better to be feared than loved when you want to end some rebellion quickly. Unfortunately, for this situation, Baldur won't help, his first title is the god with the gold heart, he's too innocent he's too good. So it won't work Baldur is loved but not feared, explained Loki. Scotty seemed to think. So who do you suggest? Asked Scotty. Before Loki could respond, Odin interrupted him by summoning Gunnar and hitting the ground with it, drawing the attention of those in the room. This meeting is finished because it looks like I have an unplanned visit, said Odin looking at the throne room door. The gods then looked towards the door, and initially did not understand that's when they remembered the capacity of the throne of Odin. This meant that Odin saw something coming towards the throne room. Scotty then spoke. Are we under any attack my king? Any invasion? Asked Scotty, ready for combat with an ice spear in hand. No it's just my son explained Odin nervously. The gods were confused, why would one of Odin's sons come to the throne room now? Besides, couldn't the guards or the Valkyries stop Odin's son from interrupting this important meeting? It was then that Loki, noticing Odin's growing nervousness, asked a question. Odin who, exactly of your children, is coming here? Asked Loki suspiciously. Odin turned towards Loki and smiled. It's your favorite nephew, brother, Odin said with a smile. Loki widened his eyes. I'm out of here, Loki said. But before Loki could make any teleportation circles, he was interrupted by something. Bam that was the noise the throne room doors made as they fell to the floor after their hinges were smashed from the wall. It was then that the god saw a figure with his boot raised in a kicking position. The funny thing is that the figure was bound by ropes of energy, an immobilization spell used exclusively by the Valkyries, the ropes were tied on the leg, arm, and neck. The figure revealed itself to be Thor, with a frown. It was pretty obvious that he was pissed. Thor then smiled when he realized who was in the throne room. Oh. Well, you're here too Uncle Loki said Thor as he entered the throne room, ignoring the energy ropes that were tied him up as Thor walked. He dragged by force the three Valkyries who were trying to immobilize him with the energy ropes. The three Valkyries were trying to pull Thor, but they were failing spectacularly. Thor continued walking, closing the distance between himself and Odin until he stopped a few feet away. I want to have a little talk with you, Dad, and Uncle Loki a talk about family, Thor said, narrowing his eyes. Thor then snapped his knuckles. It was at that moment Odin knew he would know a pain not so pleasurable. During this moment, Scotty got an idea as soon as she saw the strongest Norse god and smirked. Yes if it's him it might work, Scotty whispered to herself. Time skip. 9 years, current age. 3890, BC age of Thor. 110, years, location. Midgarder Thor's house. POV Thor. A few years have passed since my adventure in the land of the dead and, by extension, Niflheim. I came back with what I wanted plus so much more. A being capable of killing gods became my guard dog. Also I made a new friend. I knew Hel had a difficult childhood. But I had no idea it was so bad I still offered her to come with me and Fenrir to Midgard, but she insisted on staying in the land of the dead according to her, it was because she already felt that was her home. So I stopped persuading her to move, but I assured her that I would visit her whenever I could, plus I expected her to visit me in Midgard. It took a whole year, but finally, after I visited her several times, she came out of the land of the dead and visited me in Midgard she only stayed for one hour, but I made it worth it. And the result is that we saw each other frequently over the years, I still tried to look for Jormungandr to get him to talk to his little sister, but it seems the bastard left the coast of Midgard after my last fishing trip. Also I had a nice conversation with Odin and Loki. I couldn't be more disappointed and decided that I would get a little revenge later. Well. Besides sending them both to the healing chamber at the end of the conversation. I felt bad for the Valkyries cleaning up the mess in the throne room afterward, but I didn't feel bad for the spilled blood. 
Regarding goats, when I came back from my quest in the land of the dead, I started testing the goats, and ended up discovering that, at full speed, they could be faster than Skibladner itself. When I discovered this detail, my mind quickly started to think of new possibilities, but to preserve the safety of the goats, I chose to make a simple vehicle. The goats would be the engine. The vehicle? A carriage. And soon I will do the first test drive. But I had to put the ultimate vehicle project aside for good reason, the reason? Well another member of the family was born. It was a miracle that Frigg had gotten pregnant with Odin in less than 100 years, and there were a lot of celebrations in Valhall. Of course, I also celebrated and overdone the meat again. And because it was such a big celebration the party went on for three days non-stop. In other words for three fucking days I drank meat non-stop. There is only one word to sum up how I behaved during the celebration wild. Initially, I didn't intend to drink too much so on the morning of the first day of celebrations, I didn't go overboard. It was on the afternoon of the first day that shit hit the fan. The reason was simple Hermod. My brother found out, because of an extremely drunk Prince Vanner, that I had forged the Brisingaman, and he thought it was a good idea to take advantage of me being drunk, and have me sign a contract to forge a gift. His goal? Offer the gift as a dowry and negotiate with Njord for Frege's hand in marriage. I didn't even notice that the fool was slowly increasing the amount of mead that I was consuming until it was too late. When I woke up, I thought it was the second day of celebration imagine my surprise when I found out that the celebrations were already over. So the three days of celebration had already passed. How did I find this out? Well I had another surprise in the morning after the celebrations. The first surprise of the day? It all started when I woke up on my bed in my old room in Asgarder's palace along with Sif, lying on my chest, and two other women, whom I recognized as two waitresses from Valhall. We were all wearing our birthday suit. Well yay? I mean it wasn't a totally bad way to wake up, but the problem was that the headache, caused by the hangover, cut off my mood. What can I say? I had the worst hangover of my life. Does that make me an alcoholic? Maybe yes? But again, these were human values. But now I was a god, so I didn't know if alcoholism could be considered something awful. But putting the hangover aside, it was a satisfying morning? Anyway, while I was trying to get out of that position I ended up waking up the two waitresses from Valhall, who silently apologized and began to dress quickly and leave the room. They didn't even let me say anything. Sif, however, remained asleep. As soon as I finished getting dressed, I left the room and looked for a nearby waitress to ask them to deliver some food to my room for Sif. Later in that day, I ran into Sif, also hungover, and we ended up talking about how we ended up in that situation. According to her, who was less drunk than I was, it all started when Vali was turned down by a waitress. My brothers and I were sitting together because it was an important celebration, and as soon as Hermod saw Vali fail in his attempt to court a waitress began to laugh and quickly scoff at Vali's failure, saying that perhaps he would be more successful if he tries court with men. Vali didn't take it well. In fact, according to Sif, he even tried to court the same waitress more insistent. I knocked him out and then asked the waitress to not serve at my brother's table again during the festivities. According to Sif, Hermod complained to me, saying that I had exaggerated and, according to Sif, I replied that he should go suck a dick instead of talking shit, because then he would be using his mouth for something more useful. Hermod did not take my mockery well. And he said that I didn't know how to court, and that he would never find a woman in bed, and began to question my preference. My drunk self, by some miracle, ignored him for a while. He didn't stop mocking until I lose my temper. I turned my face to the closest woman, who ended up being Sif, and asked, Hey me and you, let's fuck? Was it primitive? Absolutely. And, as Sif was already a little drunk, she went with the flow and replied, Okay. She accepted and we ended up in my room. The two waitresses? They showed up when Sif and I got hungry or thirsty during our physical activities, and they stayed because Sif had invited them. The ironic thing is that, according to Sif, one of the waitresses was the same waitress that Vali tried to court. Fortunately, Sif told me that I didn't fall for Hermod's scheme, so no contract to forge anything. So, in short, it was an interesting party? Yes, in a way, it was kind of interesting. Anyway, after a few months, the newest member of the family was born. His name was Hod. And, unfortunately, he was born different. He was blind. My family was disappointed after all, we were a warrior society. A warrior born disabled? He wouldn't have a very good childhood so I decided to help him in some way. 
the best way I found. I will create something that will help him a little during his life. As soon as I got back to Midgard, I started working on my little gift to Hod the Iron Nanny. The most competent nanny in the world. I was also thinking about my little brother Baldur's and Tenery, so I had to busy myself with finding the items to forge these things. Initially, I was thinking about creating a bow for Baldur. But I stopped to think about that because he doesn't really like using weapons Baldur prefers the classic. The fists. So I decided to give him the classic weapon that would only become popular a long time later. The weapon? A custom knuckles, English punch. Nothing can beat the classic. I also decided to give him my old fishing dracker, the same one I used when fishing Jormungandr. I had no more use for the dracker, as I could build a better boat. After some time collecting items and building gifts, I was finally done. Baldur's boat was a simple dracker with some runes like the always at sea level rune, and storage for the fishing loot. The dracker didn't have much fishing equipment in fact, it only had one fishing line. It was my spare fishing line. Made from the spinal cord and muscle fibers of a Groot slang. In my opinion, it was the perfect gift. Anyway, there was only one thing missing I already said you can't go I said looking at my stubborn little partner. Whining it was Fenrir the stubborn one didn't want to let me go. While I wanted to bring him, I wasn't sure if he would behave. After all, he still had a primitive mind. If Fenrir saw Odin or Loki I'm pretty sure there would be two more bodies in the quota of the God Slayer. Don't worry cousin, I can take care of him. Said a voice. I looked towards the voice and saw Hel, she was visiting again, and by coincidence, it was the same day as Baldur's centenary. By the way you can't, I said in finality. Hell looked surprised. But then sigh if I can't stay, and since you seem to be on your way out, then I must return to the land of the dead, said Hell, her shoulders slumped. What do you mean? You're coming with me, I said. This seemed to have surprised Hell. And it looked like Fenrir had understood the basics. His younger sister can go, but he doesn't. And then he began to bark in indignation. Woof. Woof. Barked Fenrir. Ugh all right. You can go too, but you won't leave my side. I said, in a warning tone, to Fenrir. Whether he understood what I said or not, he didn't show it. I just hope it's a no-kill party my then remembered something important. Hell's answer. When I looked at Hell again, I could tell by her expression. That she was afraid to go. I don't know cousin it's been many decades since I went to Asgard or I don't know if it's a good idea to go with you, maybe it's better if I stay here or go back to the land of the dead, explained Hel. So she was afraid to go to Asgard or, while it may be my brother's centenary party I, as a prince, have every right and must be there. Just like you, as a princess of Asgard or, have every right to be there. Don't worry you can stay close to me if you're not too comfortable with the eyes of others I said. It was a struggle to make Hel act more confident. But it was to be expected from someone who has been alone for a long time. So I had to give a little nudge in the right direction. If no one from Asgard approves of Hel's presence at the celebrations well, I want to see them try to unjustly expel her from the party, with me next to her okay I'm coming with you. But don't leave my side, okay? Please ask Hel, still a little uncertain. I swear, and besides me, you will have your older brother as Asgard's scariest bouncer, I said pointing to Fenrir. Who chose that moment to scratch behind his ear with one of his paws, he seemed to be enjoying the feeling, because he had his tongue out as he scratched. Ha 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 what a scary bouncer. Said Hell, looking at me. I'm still training him I replied grumbling. Nice time to do this Fenrir perfect timing, sigh here I said to Hell, pulling a small package out of my storage necklace. As soon as Hell took it she asked as she looked at the package. What have inside? Asked Hell curiously. Inside the package in your hands is a miniature dracker inside a glass bottle, this is the gift you will give to Baldur, I said in finality. Hell looked startled and now held the package as if it were the most fragile thing in the world. No. I can't. What if I break it? Besides that, it was you who did it. If I gave this for Baldur it will look like I did it. Said Hell as she tried to give me the dracker back. I just pushed the dracker firmly into her hands. I won't deliver it. I already have another gift for him, and as you are going to participate in the festivities you must bring a gift, especially if you are family. Also, it's not quite lying you're just going to offer him the gift, it's not like you're going to say you made this dracker. And don't worry about breaking the gift, the glass that is protecting the dracker will absorb the impact, and it will break, but it will leave the dracker intact, I said, assuring Hell. She then nodded. Right so let's go now? 
asked Hell, with a small smile. She seems to be more excited. Well compared to the fear she'd had before, that was a good sign. Yes, come on I'll teleport us to the Rune of Asbru, Bilris Bifrist, here in Midgard Rai said. Next stop, Centenary of Baldur. Location. Asgard Valhall. POV. Third person. Today was a very special day in Asgard because today was the birthday of the most beloved god of all. The light of Asgard and heir to the throne. Baldur. The god who, according to rumors, only with his presence, peace prevailed over the discord in the environment. Known for being a just god and for his purity, that's why his first title the god with a gold heart. The vast majority of Norse gods worship their future leader. And so it will be a full day of celebrations in Valhall. Baldur. 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 Shouted the people of Valhall, rooting for one particular man who was seated to Odin's right side. The man just smiled sincerely and waved at people. It was then that Odin rose from his seat and raised a hand, and then the screams from the hall stopped immediately. Today we celebrate the birth of the future king of Asgard, or, my son Baldur. Said Odin aloud. As Odin made his pronouncement, all the gods and beings of other races, who were in Valhall for the celebration, listened in silence. I must say, I feel a little envious of my son because it seems my own people want me to resign and let him take the throne already ha 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 ha, said Odin, laughing. Ha 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 while the room laughed a little along with Odin. Some people exchanged nervous smiles. Because they wanted exactly that. Ha 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 maybe I'll do just that after all, I couldn't have asked for a better son, I'm sure he will be a great ruler, and I just hope to be there to see, as every parent wishes, the wonderful things my son will do, said Odin. Odin then took the drinking horn, which was copied by the audience. To Baldur. Odin said loudly and raised the drinking horn. The audience screamed shortly thereafter, copying their king's actions. To Baaladhar. May the festivities return. Said Odin, as he sat down again. And so the music started playing again, the guests then went back to talking, drinking and eating. Until after a few minutes. The voice of the guard who was at Valhall's door, rang through the hall announcing the arrival of a person or rather, people. All hail Prince Thor. And his guests. Said the guard aloud. It was then that most people in Valhall looked towards the new arrival. Odin froze his gaze on someone. For Odin, he saw his son Thor, dressed in his white coat and with a dreaded Njolnir tied to his belt. The first guest to be noticed was dressed in a black cape that covered most of the body, and, mainly, the face someone mysterious but from the figure, Odin suspected it was a woman which yielded a twinge of pride in old Odin. It was the last guest who held Odin's gaze. It didn't matter if it was small or big, near or far, or even another color Odin will always recognize his death. And his death was being held by the arms of the mysterious woman beside Thor, his death was only a few meters away. Fenrir was in Valhall. And he was looking Odin in the eye, daring the All-Father to even blink, and Odin didn't dare look away. What is the meaning of this Thor? Freak shouted, she had recognized Mimir's killer. Odin remained silent as he rose from his seat, still meeting Fenrir's gaze. The hall was dead silent. The music had stopped, and the guests now alternated their gaze between Odin and his son, the strongest Norse god. The cloaked figure, who was standing next to Thor, seemed to have gotten nervous, and seemed to want to get back out of Valhall. But as soon as it took the first step back, it was caught by a hand on the shoulder. It was Thor. Don't worry I always keep my promises, Thor said softly, and gave the figure's shoulder a comforting squeeze. Thor then looked toward Frigg, who had questioned what he had done, and narrowed his eyes. Valhall is the hall of the gods and, by the law of the guest, no harm will be done to the people who accompany me. They're under my protection anyone who has any complaints, talk to me, Thor said firmly. Frigg was silent. There was nothing left to do Thor placed people under the law of the guest in the hall of the gods. While the guest law has to be respected it's still me who welcome guests from Valhall, said Odin, for the first time since seeing Fenrir. Thor then took his gaze from his mother, Frigg, and turned to face Odin. If you have any complaints about whoever accompanies me, it better be for just cause after all, you don't want to be recognized as the bad host who unfairly expelled the guests, would you? Thor asked. Odin was silent and stared at Thor until he dropped the gaze. Sigh while I'm usually the one who receives guests in Valhall for today, I'm not the host, said Odin in a tired tone. Thor then understood who he must be facing. And so, he turned his gaze to the person who would be the host for the day. 
The people in Valhall Salon followed Thor's gaze and looked at the most important person of the day in anticipation Balder. As soon as Balder understood the situation he rose from his chair and walked slowly towards Thor. With each step Balder took, Fenrir's warning growl became more and more noticeable. As soon as Balder was just a few steps away, Fenrir's growl reached the point where it was so loud that the entire hall of Valhall could hear it. Balder then stopped just an arm's length from Thor, and shifted his gaze between Thor and Fenrir. Thor's response was to raise a hand, which silenced the growl almost immediately. Balder was silent for a while, which served to make Valhall's guests more nervous, it didn't help that Thor was the biggest man in the hall, both in height and strength. Balder then decided to speak for the first time since Thor arrived. And he spoke with a smile on his face. Good to see you again, big brother said Balder. Only then did Thor respond with a smile. Indeed, little brother. Good to see you, said Thor. Balder then embraced his brother Thor, but the embrace quickly ended. You will always be welcome brother and that goes for all who accompany you, said Balder, speaking the last part aloud. The request was clear, the host let them stay however. But before we go on with the celebrations could you introduce us to whoever accompany you, brother? Asked Balder in curiosity. The figure that was covered by the cloak seemed to freeze not knowing how to react. Balder seemed to have sensed it and gave the figure a comforting smile. Don't worry. Nothing bad will come to you while I'm here, I'm sorry if I left you pressured to reveal yourself, I was just curious my brother hardly ever comes with anyone, I just want to know who it is, said Balder, apologetically. The figure seemed to have relaxed a little but was still unsure, so glanced toward Thor. It's your choice but remember no matter what you decide, I won't let you be harmed, Thor said, looking at the hooded figure. The figure seemed to have made up its mind after some thought the hooded figure then handed Fenrir, who had been previously in its arms, into Thor's arms. And then the cloak that covered the mysterious figure collapsed into shadows, revealing a face well recognized by the gods and other races. Before Balder could speak he was interrupted by the surprised gasps of people in the hall, and soon Valhall Salon was filled with not so welcoming whispers, what is she doing here? What is Prince Thor thinking? It's not enough to bring the god slayer, he brought the bad omen too, this is madness. Balder will expel her won't he? He has to expel her. I don't think Odin will let them stay any longer as soon we can get back to the festivities. Every whisper was heard loud and clear, and for every comment said hell heard each one, and her mood seemed to drop with each hit. It was then that a particular comment surfaced. I'm sure Balder will drive these two freaks out of here, and lock them where they belong before throwing away the key. Bam a loud noise interrupted all of Valhall's whispers. It was then that they looked at the origin or rather, the origins. It was Thor and, to everyone's surprise Balder. Both had stepped the ground at the same time, so hard that it created cracks in Valhall's immaculate floor. It was then that Balder spoke, not turning his face to the crowd. It seems like some people already know you, but I don't, so I'd like you to introduce yourself properly, so, could you do the honors miss? asked Balder. While Balder asked the question, Thor looked out over the crowd and stared at them what Thor was doing was clear. He was challenging whoever makes the next comment. Coincidentally Fenrir began to imitate him and made a point of looking out over the crowd, growling low and mostly showing his fangs, the same fangs that killed Odin's advisor, Mimir decades ago. One was known as the strongest Norse god, and the other was known as the god slayer with these two watching, none of the crowd dared to say anything. It was then that a voice whispered, I I I'm Hel I'm Loki's daughter, who is the brother of Unking Odin by blood oath and I, came here to wish your congratulations, your grace, Hel said, whispering and bowing awkwardly. But then Hel felt two hands in her shoulders, and when she looked confusedly towards Balder, she was startled by what she saw. Balder was smiling. Welcome cousin, said Balder. Hel didn't even notice that she had started to smile too. Time skip. Five minutes. After Balder's not-so-warm welcome ended Thor and Fenrir did not leave Hellside, as soon as they were seated at a table. All the other occupants left. The message was clear. While Balder may have allowed we will not make your stay any easier. While Hell looked a little uncomfortable, Thor and Fenrir followed her to the table. So, on a long imperial table of over 100 seats, there were only three occupied seats. Thor and Hel were seated next to each other, and Fenrir was lying on the table devouring a piece of meat, and facing the main table that was Odin. When Fenrir turned his head in the other direction, that's when Thor and Hel noticed someone approaching actually it was a small group of people. Can we sit with you? Asked the group leader with a nervous smile. 
It was Vider, accompanied by Hermod and Vali. The three brothers were trying to give their best smiles, Thor did not respond and looked at Hel, who seemed to get the message. Feel free but I'll suggest you sit a little farther away from Fenrir, or he'll think you're out to steal his food, Hel replied with a nervous smile. Vider was the first to be seated from a safe distance. But Hermod and Vali hesitated Fenrir had turned away from the head table and was looking at them. Hermod tried to make a joke to ease the tension, but he failed miserably. Yeah good advice, I like having my hand you know? It helps me feed, get dressed and among other things, if you know what I mean, Hermod said, wiggling his eyebrows as he said the last part. Hermod said Thor in a warning tone. I I don't get it, Hel said uncertainly. Hermod was surprised by Hel's answer, and then he looked at Thor. For real? Ask Hermod in disbelief. Thor just shrugged. I I feel like I should be angry, Hel said. It was then that Vali commented. Ha 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 ha. Relax cousin, everyone can get annoyed because of Hermod. He's the messenger god who wants to be the comedy god, but it's easier for him to piss someone off with his horrible jokes, said Vali, mocking Hermod as he sat down at the table. Is that so? So why don't you try making a joke? Asked Hermod as he sat down at the table. I am the god of rancor and the personification of daylight I'm not a comedian at all. Said Vali, impassively. My CIC so don't talk about me like that if you can't do better. Besides, some people like my performance your mother, for example, said Hermod before being interrupted by Vali. You better not bring my mother into this, said Val in a warning tone, looking at Hermod. Hermod raised his arms in surrender, but he had a small smile. Ha 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 the laugh that started at the table came from the least expected person Hell. Even Thor and Fenrir stopped eating and looked at Hell laughing heartily in front of strangers, that was definitely a good sign. Thor smiled before turning to look at Hermod. No such jokes here got it? Thor asked, narrowing his eyes. Thor spoke with a smile. But that smile instead of welcoming promised pain. Hermod nodded nervously, not wanting to push his brother's patience. And so, Asgardr's most maladjusted family began to eat comfortably while having fun. Hell, who has never felt such amusement, can't help but laugh at the antics of Hermod and Vali. Until after a while, someone else decided to join the little group, someone Fenrir and Thor noticed. Can I join with you guys? Asked a voice. It was Balder, with a smile. Vider looked confused. Balder? Aren't you supposed to be at the head table? You are the host of the day, you still need to receive guests there, Vider said, confused. Ah, I don't think it's necessary. I can receive guests at this table very well. Also, I would like to meet the rest of the family members said Balder looking at Fenrir and Hel. Fenrir didn't seem to mind Balder's presence, because he was still devouring his food. Hel looked hopeful. Please, cousin, please feel free. But you're the host so you don't need anyone's permission to sit, did I just insult you? Please I beg your pardon for Hell said nervously. Until got interrupted by invigorating laughter. Ha 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 Balder had started to laugh, and Thor was smiling playfully at the interaction between Hell and Balder. When Balder stopped laughing, he began to speak. Thank you cousin, for allowing me to sit with you and no, I'm not insulted, so there's no need for apologies, said Balder, with a smile. Oh sure said Hell. And so, the conversation at the table of the children of Odin and Loki, returned until more people showed up. That voice who is it? Asked someone. The table then stopped the conversation and looked towards one person. The person who had spoken was a child who appeared not to be looking towards anyone, and he was accompanied by three other people, one of the people was Sif, who was holding the child's hand as if she were guiding him. Another woman, whom no one seemed to recognize, was holding two servings of food. The last person was a man and, to Thor's dismay, was someone he knew, hello, my friends. It was free. Thor heaved a tired sigh and turned to Sif. How? Thor asked in a low voice. What Thor meant was. How did he come with you? Sif seemed to get the message, then gestured to the child. It was clear then to Thor free took advantage of his little brother joining the table, and decided to go to. Prince Balder. Could we join you at the table? Free asked with a smile. But. Balder did not reply. He appeared to be hypnotized. When Thor realized that Balder would not speak because he was distracted by something, he resolved to respond. Sigh feel free to join us, free and you too, after all, you're following my little brother, said Thor, looking at Sif and the unknown woman. The child when he recognized Thor's voice said with a tone of happiness. Is that you Thor? 
said the child with a small smile, raising his hand. Thor smiled and softened his gaze. Yes, Hodder come here, Thor said, reaching up and taking Hodder's hand and pulling him, slowly, so that he could sit beside him, between him and Hel. Both Hel and Fenrir stared at the child but not in a hostile way. Thor then turned to Free, Sif, and her friend. You can sit down, but... Who's your friend Sif? Thor asked, curious. It seemed that Baldur was curious too, as he paid attention to that question as well. Her name is Nana and I met her today, but we got along really well, explained Sif smiling at her friend. The woman, now identified as Nana, smiled back. What can I say I liked her personality, Nana said, pointing to Sif. Thor just shrugged and gestured for them to be seated. And so, the long imperial table which was only occupied by three individuals, was now being occupied by another seven people, totaling ten seats taken it was still a small number compared to the table's capacity, but the occupants didn't look like they care about the vacant seats, because they were engrossed in conversation at the table. However all this time, Baldur was the only one who was silent he was looking at Nana time skip. Ten minutes. POV. Third person. The party in Valhall has returned in full force after the unexpected arrival of some guests, some people stared at the table, which the children of Odin sat, with disapproving looks. The people at the table of the children of Odin did not care for the looks as they were having fun in their own way. Let's go Baldur. I bet all my savings on you. If you win I promise I will give some part. Cried Hermod, as he cheered for his little brother. At this point, Baldur and Vider were competing in an arm wrestling match. There was always this uncertainty of who was the second strongest among the children of Odin, the strongest son of Odin was undoubtedly Thor, who also held the title of strongest Norse god. Odin's weaker son would be Hodder, but that was mainly due to his age after a while, Baldr emerged victoriously. Ha ha ha, I'm sorry brother. But it looks like I came out victorious this time, said Baldr, looking at Vider. I must say I am impressed Prince Baldr. I never thought you were on the same level as Vider who is already famous among the Asgardians for his strength, Nana said with a smile. It was then that the children of Odin, who knew how Baldur behaves, realized Baldur was shy. Ah thank you, Miss Nana, thanks for the compliment, said Baldur. It was at this point that Hodr chose to speak. Bah! My brother Thor is much stronger. You must know about his adventures in Jotunheim, said Hodr. But then Thor stopped eating and looked at Hodr, and spoke in a warning tone. Hodder we've already talked about this. Don't be a sycophant remember what I said? Thor asked, looking at Hodder. Hodder looked embarrassed. Yes, the sycophant is the one who wants something from you I'm sorry, said Hodder. Thor placed his hand on Hodder's head and ruffled his hair. As long as you learn I forgive you, Thor said. Thor then looked at Baldr and decided to comment. Baldr I think this is a good time to deliver your gift, Thor said. Thor then opened the storage space from his necklace and took out a small box, then handed it to Baldr. Thank you brother said Baldr. While Baldr opened the small box, Thor looked at Hel and gestured toward Baldr. Hel understood what Thor wanted, so she summoned a shadow and pulled out a small glass bottle that had a dracker inside. I must say brother, you know me well. Said Baldr with a smile on his face as he had two knuckles, English punch, in both hands. Baldry also brought you a present I I hope you like it, Hal said, as he held out the glass bottle. Oh. A dracker for decoration? Asked Vali, curious. No, when you get close to the sea, remove the cork, and the miniature dracker will transform into a fully functional dracker, said Hal, remembering what Thor had told her during their trip to Asgard. Baldr looked at the present and then Hal. Thank you for the present cousin thank you very much, said Baldr, with a grateful smile. Hel then smiled as if she'd done everything right and won a prize. Ah why didn't you thank me like that when I gave you my gift? Asked Hermod. Baldr then looked at Hermod impassively. You gave me a fish Hermod a trout to be exact, said Baldr. Hermod shrugged. It was a big trout, Hermod replied. No no, it wasn't, said Baldr. The people at the table then started to laugh. But then Thor looked at Hodr with a smile. You know I was thinking about giving your present earlier, Thor said. Hodr then perked up. Really what is brother? Give it to me, please? Asked Hodr excitedly. Easy brother. First of all, I must know have you ever taken lessons from mother on how to mold your divine power? Thor asked. Yes, she already taught me how to do that. Said Hodr. Well then, said Thor. 
Thor then made another portal from his necklace's storage and pulled out a piece of parchment with several runes written on it Balder, who had a talent for rune magic, identified some runes, such as blood bonding, vital energy, and guardian, but there were others runes that he didn't recognize. I'm just going to take some of your blood, okay? It's only going to hurt at first, said Thor. Hodr then nodded seriously and held out his hand towards Thor. Thor then asked Sif for her sword, which she handed to Thor, and then Thor made a small cut on Hodr's palm, from which some blood came out. And then, Thor used that blood to stain Hodr's forehead. As soon as Thor smeared blood on Hodr's forehead, he then placed the piece of parchment on Hodr's face. The runes are written on the parchment then glowed and then disappear when Thor removed the parchment from Hodr's face, something was different. Hodr now had a single rune on his forehead, in the same spot that Thor had smeared with blood. Very well now, Hodr, I want you to listen to me, focus your power exactly on the same spot I touched on your forehead, so you can unlock your gift, said Thor. Hodr nodded and did that only to be startled by the result. Ah! yelled Hodr, nearly falling out of his chair. But before Hodr fell, Thor caught him. Calm down Hodr, breathe calmly, said Thor. Thor what did you do? Asked Baldr, worried. But then, before Thor could respond a disbelieving voice spoke first. I can't see? Said Hodr. The people at the table were surprised when Hodr made such a statement. Is it serious little brother, how many fingers do I have here? Said Hermod. Two? Said Hodr confused. Once again the table was surprised but confused because not only Hodr got it right. Hodr got it right without looking at Hermod. It was then that everyone, except for Hodr and Fenrir, looked at the only person who was smiling at the table Thor. I'll explain, Thor said. Location. Asgard Valhall. POV. Third person. Thor could you explain to us how Hodr is seeing exactly? Asked Baldr. Yes. Does that mean you surpassed Mother Frigg in rune magic? After all, even Frigg couldn't restore his side with rune magic, said Hermod. Everyone at the table looked at Thor, who hadn't stopped smiling. First of all I didn't surpass Frigg, Thor said in finality. The table then became confused. So how is he seeing now? Asked Vider. I'll summarize it as simply as possible. The piece of parchment I placed on Hodr's face had some convergence runes as a link between the mother runes. One of the convergence runes linked three things his vital energy, from which we draw our divine power, with the body, or to be more specific the mind and the heart explained Thor. It seemed that Baldr had understood the meaning of this however, some had not. I don't understand how did this help cure Hodr's blindness? Asked Vali. For Vali, it didn't make any sense after all, his brother was blind, but he managed to see so the runes shouldn't affect the eyes. It didn't help technically Hodr is still blind because he still has complete visual impairment, replied Thor. Vali was confused, but then, how can he see? Asked Vali. He doesn't see exactly, I didn't know how to cure his eyes either so I had to choose another path. Basically, when Hodr channeled some of his divine power into the rune, he activated its secondary ability, which is to react with the heartbeat and send out a pulse of energy every time there was a heartbeat. When the pulse hits something, it returns towards Hodr and passes that information to his rune which processes the information and creates a kind of image of the environment, and he can turn on and turn off this ability, since he needs to focus his power on the rune on his forehead, so he just needs stop concentrating his power on that spot, and the link will be severed. So basically, Hodr is still blind, but can see by another way, Thor explained. What did Thor created? It was something that at the time only existed in his first life a radar. The people at the table seemed to understand most of what Thor said. Except for Hodr, who still had no idea what Thor was talking about, and Fenrir, who didn't understand a single word and was more focused on eating. Thor's inspiration for making this skill came from one of his favorite Marvel characters the Daredevil. But he knew the disadvantages that such ability had, so he decided to change it a little, so that Hodr wouldn't get hurt. I must say, brother it's an impressive skill. But now I got more curious which rune is the receiver of these pulses you commented on, besides, you said it was the secondary skill what is the primary? Asked Balder. If it were possible Thor's smile grew wider. I'm glad someone noticed the answer would be the same for both questions. The guardian rune is the receiver and primary ability of the protector rune of Hodr. But it's better to show Hodr would you like to have a little arm wrestling with Free? Thor asked. Free was confused. Now wait a minute, I didn't agree with this, Free said, frowning. 
for free, it was dishonorable to compete against a child. But Thor just kept smiling and just looked at Hermod, who seemed to get the message oh what was it, free? Are you afraid of defeat? I wonder how the beautiful Freyja would react if she learned that her brother is afraid of a child, said Hermod. Thor knew Freyja would never approve of a competition against a child in fact, no one at the table would want to compete against a child. However it was pretty easy to piss off a god. Okay. I accept the challenge. But don't complain later. Said Free. And so, Free and Hodder prepared but before the competition started, Thor decided to talk to Hodder. Hodder pay close attention you will channel your divine power into the rune as before, but now I also want you to mold it out of the rune do you think you can do that? Thor asked. Hodder thought for a while until he smiled and nodded. Well the match will start when Baldur slaps the table, Thor said, looking at Baldur. Baldur was still uncertain because his little brother Hodder could get hurt when Thor realized this, he spoke. Don't worry he'll be fine, Thor said, smiling calmly. Baldur didn't look very convinced, but he decided to go on. Competitors ready? Asked Baldur. Free gave a confident nod, while Hodder gave an uncertain nod. When Thor realized Hodder's insecurity, he spoke. Remember what I said Hodder said Thor. It was then that Hodder frowned in concentration, and in that same instant the rune on his forehead glowed purple. Baldur chose this moment to announce the start of the match. Let the challenge begin. Said Baldur, as he slapped the table. As soon as Baldur announced the start of the match, Free applied force to finish quickly, but it did not turn out as Free expected. Most of the people at the table were surprised by what they were seeing Hodder, just 10 years old, was matched in strength against Free, a god over 140 years old, and one of the strongest Vanner gods in the Norse pantheon. Thor didn't show a noticeable reaction, but inwardly he was anxious that the rune was working properly. It was then that something happened that Thor had been waiting for, and that left the people at the table scared. An iron arm emerged from Hodder's body, and began to help Hodder win the arm wrestling match. It was at that moment that Thor gave a manic smile. Thor was happy for a good reason. He had replicated almost perfectly, one of the abilities of a particular anime. Hodra now had at his disposal something as never seen before. A few seconds later Free had lost to a 10-year-old in arm wrestling, it was at that exact moment that Thor laughed like there was no tomorrow. For now, floating comfortably close to Hodder, there was armor. A quite intimidating armor. This is cheating. It's cheating, right? Free asked, looking at Thor. No, my friend. After all, it's just an armor powered by Hodder's vital energy said Thor. Thor what is this? Asked Baldr. That, my brother, is the Guardian. It is responsible for two things. Receiving information from the pulses and creating the image of the environment to transmit even the mind of Hodder, and its main function to protect Hodder by responding to his will, said Thor. Thor called him Guardian for good reason after all, he couldn't call him by his original name without others calling him weird. The original name? Stand. Time skip. 90 years, current era. 3800, BC age of Thor. 200 years. POV Thor. Well in a way, today was a special day. Today completed two centuries that I was born in this universe. Odin had invited me to celebrate my birth in Valhall early in the morning. Right after Baldr's centenary, most of the gods had distanced themselves from me for a stupid reason. They distanced themselves because they were afraid of Fenrir and Hel, who became people close to me. I even insisted on celebrating each one's birthday in its own way, of course Fenrir was easy to please, his birthday was practically just a mountain of Italian food on the table, just for him Hel was more complicated. This was because she never celebrated her birthday together with anyone so she kind of didn't know what to do. A great example? When I handed a gift to Hell, she started to cry, saying if she didn't know whether to open it or keep it as a keepsake, because it was her first gift too. As soon as she said that the next day I had another conversation with my parents and Uncle Loki. After a few more parties and with me bringing Hell and Fenrir every time, the gods got used to their presence. The hate had turned into indifference. It didn't matter to me, I wouldn't force anyone to like Hell and Fenrir whoever wanted to bond with our group, come to us. I had already decided that I wouldn't beg for validation from others. During the parties, Hell, Fenrir, and I would sit at a secluded table and calmly ate dot dot dot, but we weren't alone. Baldr, Hodr, Hermod, Vider, Vali, Sif, Nana, and Free always joined us, and after a while, the group gained a new member. Freyja. She started by accompanying her brother and became a regular during the celebrations. 
Anyway, after 200 years I didn't know what else to do. I still trained regularly, as well as forging and creating new runes, it kept me busy for a while. So I had to figure out what to do, even if it's considered ridiculous by others, it was then that he remembered something I had said decades ago. Christmas doesn't exist yet. What a disappointment. I won't wait until Jesus is born to have this celebration. Although I couldn't celebrate Christmas itself after all, I'm from the Nordic Pantheon. Also, the date of Christmas is unknown even in my previous life, even if Christmas was celebrated on the 25th of December, literally, the odds that Jesus was born on that particular day, are 1 365 days after all, the calculations that were made, had a margin of error of a few years. So I decided to create my own Christmas. I'll have some fun. The first thing I did was create my means of transport, which would be my cart. The ultimate vehicle was finished. And with the two goats pulling? I could fly over Midgard in the blink of an eye. I managed to build some things like wooden toys, skis, sleds, wooden swords, even dolls, and among other things, why did I do this? It was time to meet the mortals. And I wanted to make a good impression. What's the best way for a stranger to like you? Give a present. It will almost certainly work I mean should it work? Anyway, keeping all these gifts plus a lot of food inside a red bag, obviously quite roomy I was planning for the day I was going to do this tour of mine in Midgard or when should I go? Well, as I wanted to make this day a tradition, I chose a memorable date. The winter solstice. And then I waited patiently until the day finally arrived, and I was ready to hit the road. I was standing outside my home in Midgard, or, wearing my white coat and carrying the red bag on my shoulder along with Mjolnir, which was faithfully attached to my belt. It was already getting dark when I decided it was time to go. Finally it's time to make history. X, Jibo, Tangrisner and Tangjizdry said, whispering to my necklace which glowed in response. A blue-colored portal shone in front of me, and from it emerged the two goats already attached to my vehicle. The goats had been used to my presence a long time ago, but they still got nervous when they saw Fenrir understandable. After all, Fenrir was looking at them as if they were his lunch. As soon as I climbed into my cart, ready to go, I heard a voice. Prince Thor. Hang on. I looked towards the voice and saw someone I didn't expect free and Frage's mother. Scotty. What the hell is she doing here? As soon as Scotty approached, she looked strangely at my transport and the goats, but then placed her eyes on me. We we need to talk, said Scotty. I honestly didn't understand, I never interacted with Free and Frage's parents, at least not more than necessary. After all, technically, I'm still an odd and bastard. I shouldn't relate to the nobility of the gods any longer than necessary. So what she had said confused me. We? Need to talk? Since when? We? What exactly do you want to talk about? I asked suspiciously. Do you won't invite me into your house so we can talk in a more reserved environment? Asked Scotty. I think she expects a lot from me no I replied. If there was one thing I learned it was never to invite a person into your home when you don't know their intentions, if you want to talk, the talk will take place out here besides, it won't happen now, because I already have plans for now, I said. Today was the winter solstice. I've waited months for this day. I will not keep it for next year. But. It's something extremely important. Exclaimed Scotty. And what I'm doing now is important to me. I won't stop just for you to have this talk I said in finality. Was I rude? Absolutely. But so was she. Nobody likes to drop what they are doing just because one person has demanded to become the priority. It was then that Scotty gave a defeated sigh. Very well when are you available? Asked Scotty. Well she was more understandable? This was somewhat surprising coming from a Jodan known for her explosive temper. If you wait a few minutes is enough, I won't be late. I advise you to wait outside in the front yard, I will be back in a moment I said. While I wouldn't interrupt my plans I was curious as to what she wanted to talk to me about. It can't be such a bad thing right? Fate I just raised a flag, didn't I? Sigh alright, Prince Thor. I will wait for your return, said Scotty as he walked to the front patio, where there was a bench to sit on. As she is the personification of the winter, I'm sure the cold doesn't bother her. Well I'm leaving, I said. As soon as I climbed into my chariot I put the bag back in a safe place and took the reins smiling. Tangrisner and Tangjister let's walk a bit, remember let slowly, so that we can be seen higher. I screamed. And it went as expected Tangrisner and Tangjister shot skyward quickly. Soon I was far from my house and approached the first house, not discreetly by the way. 
The problem? Tang Risner and Tang Jister made too much noise POV. Third person. A small family of five people was sitting calmly nest the fire the two adults, the man, and the woman looked with regret at their sons and daughter. Hunting and harvesting were not favorable this year there wasn't much food, so it should be rationed. The man and woman still chose to eat fewer portions, so their children would have more food. Winter is cruel, and if you weren't strong you could sleep in one night and not have the strength to wake up anymore. And by the scenario the youngest child, a boy of just eight summers, was getting weaker with each passing day. It was then that the family began to hear a noise. A very loud and frightening noise. That sometimes heaven did when it was angry. Rumble 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 it felt like it was getting louder louder, is the sky angry? In the middle of winter? Said the man, confused. It was then that something strange happened the sound suddenly it stopped. Knock knock the man and the woman were surprised. Was there anyone out there in that cold? As soon as the knocking on the door stopped, the sky got angry again. Rumble 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 now it felt like the noise was fading away. The man, suspicious, went to check he took a small copper knife and walked slowly to the door, along with his eldest son, 17 Summers, who also had a makeshift copper weapon in his hand. As soon as the man opened the door he was surprised by something. Huh? Said the man, confused. In front of the door of his house were some things made of wood, and something he didn't expect bags. It was then that the woman saw the bags, and then she walked over to open one. What she saw surprised her so much that she started to laugh. Ha 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 it's a blessing from the gods. Said the woman, lifting the contents of the bag to show the man, who was her husband, and their eldest son. Beans. It was then, that the eleventh summer girl gathered outside and looked at the sky. Dad. Look. Said the girl aloud. It was then the people looked to the sky. The sky glowed due to bright snakes, lightning, and the frightening sound the sky made when it was angry. But there was something never seen before a man he was quickly distancing himself in a chariot. What was frightening was that the bright snakes apostrophe lightning hit the chariot, but the man didn't seem bothered, and every time the chariot changed direction, the sky screamed louder and louder. It was then that the girl said the same thing her family was thinking it's Thorn or Location. As Gerdra Valhall. POV. Third person. In Valhalla's hall, a celebration was taking place. Today, the birth of one of Odin's sons was celebrated, consecrated with many titles, some being the Drunk Calamity, the Killer of Giants. But the main thing? The strongest Norse god. Now, the vast majority of people avoided Prince Thor, due to certain people who now accompany him to all celebrations. Who are these people? It was Loki's children's one was known as the God Slayer, and the other was known as the Bad Omen. No one liked the people that Prince Thor had established a kind of friendship, but that friendship had become tolerable for most. Anyway. As today was Prince Thor's name day he was expected to be at the party correct? Well, not exactly. Where is he? Asked someone. It was Odin, who had asked his wife, Frigg, about the whereabouts of their son Thor. He said that today he had something important to do so he only stayed in the morning and left right after the banquet at lunch, replied Frigg. But it's his name day. Beyond that, Scotty and George said that today would be a good time to talk to Thor about the proposal, said Odin. I tried to contact Thor through runes, when he answered me he said he wouldn't come. That morning party was enough, sigh Frigg said, giving a tired sigh. He is my son. Even though he is technically illegitimate, he is entitled to at least one day of celebration. And he just wants a morning of celebration? I cannot do that, it would be considered a disgrace to others. The Thor's image, was damaged more than enough said Odin, irritated. Why was Odin angry? Due to Baldr and Hodr being his sons with Frigg, this meant that they are the successors to the throne of Asgard, with Baldr being first in the line of succession, therefore the legitimate heirs are treated differently. The illegitimate children, on the other hand, had fewer privileges than the legitimate ones. A good example? It's the name day parties. At the name day parties of his legitimate children, all races in the kingdom of Asgard must participate. At the parties of his illegitimate children, attendance was optional. Thor's parties were quite popular, at least among the parties of Odin's illegitimate children, especially after the skirmish at Edgard Castle. Everyone wanted to be associated with Thor, it was mainly out of interest, but Thor had made friends with some very influential people in the realms. However all that changed after the centenary of Baldr. I understand my love I told him the same thing. 
but the answer he gave me he said he was tired, but that he would make an effort to return by the end of tonight, right after finishing his scheduled chores, explained Frigg. This did not seem to have calmed the All-Father. Don't worry out and I'm sure my nephew must be doing something important enough to have to ignore the festivities on his own name day, said a voice. It was Loki with a knowing smile. This is no joke Loki, said Odin, annoyed. Well I never said it was replied Loki. But regarding the proposal of Njord and Scotty Scotty lost patience and asked me to tell her where Thor lived in Midgarder. She said she would pick him up or, if he's busy, talk to Thor in Midgarder. While she talks to Thor, Njord is offered to pick up Freja, said Frigg, in a marrying tone. Honestly I still don't like this said Loki, with a frown. In Loki's mind, this was nothing in favor of the Aesir literally, the leaders of the Vanir gods would gain a living weapon of extortion, while the Aesir would gain practically nothing. Sigh while I understand your position brother. It will be necessary to secure the peace of Asgard, said Odin in a tired tone. But that was not the whole reason for Odin because Odin offered his eye and willingly tortured himself in the branches of Yggdrasil, he received the gift of wisdom. But it wasn't necessary to have this gift to see that the world was changing, whether for better or worse he wasn't sure. And there is nothing scarier than uncertainty. Before the commemoration of Thor's name day, the gathering among the leaders of the other pantheons took place. The leader of the Greeks did not go, again, and the tension between the Nordic and Slavic pantheon was growing rapidly. The reason was simple influence of territories in Midgarder. It was very likely that this tension will evolve into two scenarios, the first will be an all-out war between the two pantheons, with the risk of this war spreading to other pantheons, such as the Celtic pantheon. The second scenario, and what Odin wants, will be a small dispute between two representatives from each pantheon to resolve this little skirmish. I just hope Freyja is reasonable about this possible coster, Frigg said, concerned. It was then that a voice roared in Valhall's hall. Odin. Where is my mother? Needless to say, Freyja was upset. It was at this point that Loki chose to comment. Humph yeah, quite r-e-a-s-o-n-a-b-l-e apostrophe, said Loki. Shut up Loki I already have a headache to deal with said Odin, rubbing his temples. Location. Midgarder. POV. Third person. After only a few minutes, Thor had returned to his home, and it seemed Scotty was still awaiting his arrival. She looked unfazed. All right, we can talk now, Thor said, crossing his arms. As much as Thor was acting rudely, this was mainly due to Scotty's unexpected visit, someone he never talked to alone, in his home and, from Thor's point of view, demanding to talk. No matter what Scotty said to Thor at that time for Thor, she wants something he has, and depending on what she asks it will come with a price. After all, Thor initially suspected that maybe she wanted some weapon or artifact I'm not one to stall, so I'll get straight to the point I want to ask if you could marry my daughter Freja, said Scotty. Thor didn't see that coming. Huh? Said Thor confused. For Thor this it wasn't the conversation he had in mind. Sigh maybe. Is this a good time to finally walk into your house and sit down to talk? Asked Scotty uncertainly. Thor just gave an uncertain nod and walked towards the door in no time did he say anything. What the hell could he say? As soon as Thor invited Scotty into his house, he offered Scotty to sit on the sofa. Want want something to drink or something? Thor asked uncertainly. Not really thanks. But I think the sooner we discuss this, the better it will be for us, Scotty said seriously. Right why don't we start from the beginning? Said Thor, as he sat down in the chair across from the sofa. Scotty looked a little confused. I already mentioned I would like you to marry my daughter, I assume you know how the contract works? I asked Scotty. Yes, I know that part said Thor, narrowing his eyes. For Thor, who had lived two lives, one of the things that were hard to get used to, was accepting to drink meat at a young age, like four years old another thing. It was the marriage between the Norse gods, and how it worked. It was a kind of contract between two families. The contract was called Koster. Basically, the marriage consisted of two parts, the betrothal and the marriage, and this whole process started with the negotiations, always taking into account the interests of the families of the groom and the bride, if Thor were to comment on how this marriage worked basically, he would say that it's not exactly two people joining, but rather two families as a whole. Everything started from the groomer his father, who carried out the proposal to the father or guardian of the bride. If the bride's father or guardian were satisfied with the proposal, the suitor would have to pay for the bride, and in return, the bride's father promised to give the dowry after the marriage. 
both the payment for the bride and the dowry was incorporated into the bride's estate. The two men, the groom and the guardian, shook hands in front of at least two witnesses and set the date for the celebration of the marriage. The bride's consent could be consulted, but generally, this was not done. And this was a summary of the arranged Nordic marriage, called Koster. That was a big no for Thor but Thor knew a fact about Koster. Norse marriage between Norse gods only served to solidify alliances. Now Thor was just hoping to ask a question I know very well what Koster is I want to know why? Thor asked. It was then that Scotty understood. Since you know the purpose of Koster it's easier to explain why. Let me tell you this if I and Jord die there's a good chance the Vanner gods will rebel, said Scotty. This seemed to have caught Thor's attention, I thought no one would have that courage after all, Free has two of the most powerful weapons in the Nordic pantheon, the Sumarbrander and the Gullenbursti, said Thor. And it was true Free, basically, had the best toys. The Skiblander was a well-known flying ship, not only in the Nordic pantheon but in other pantheons as well. But Free had other things besides the flying ship Sumarbrander was a golden sword with a blade as hot as the surface of the sun, but that's not why the blade was known what was its main skill. The sword was simply capable of dueling alone. That thing is very alive, and it doesn't need help to be wielded. But another thing that scared the others was the Gullen Bursty. Basically, it was a golden boar immune to magic. If the magic doesn't work the right thing would be to go to the brute force, but there's a little problem. Now, Gullenbursty might not seem like such a big deal, but if Thor were to compare a god fighting that thing, it would be like a man facing a battle tank. The tank runs over the man. Gullenbursty will, literally, runs over the god. Of course, this comparison was made with a weaker god, but Gullenbursty was still a force to be reckoned with, and this boar only obeys Free's commands. It was these weapons that defined Free's strength. While it's true about Free's weapons he doesn't like using them very much, said Scotty, embarrassed. For some reason this was not surprising to Thor. After all, the irony was noticeable some of the most powerful weapons of the Norse gods, in the hands of the god of peace. Sigh where am I into this story? Thor asked wearily. That seemed to have alerted Scotty for now, she has to choose her words carefully first of all, please just listen to me. If you have any questions, please save them for the end of the explanation, said Scotty. Thor thought for a moment, then nodded in affirmation. Well where do I start first of all, it's a fact that the war between the gods Vanner and Aesir was the second bloodiest war in our pantheon. Both Njord and your father committed things cruel. They had their reasons for being like that, but I won't go into detail. The problem was that war leaves wounds, and even when both parties are reduced to numbers so close to extinction, the old blood remains for some, but this is usually resolved with alliances between both parties. But. There is no rope that binds the Aesir to the Vanner, in fact, since the end of the war, we have remained separate from you Aesir, and as no bridge has been created between us, the feeling of settlement of scores grew stronger. This coster will be the first bridge that will be created to strengthen our alliance, but as it is it will be the first coster. One must choose very carefully the people who will marry ideally, it would be between the royalty of both races of gods, explained Scotty. For Thor, that was a pretty short explanation, but, it was clear that coster was needed as soon as possible. Scotty herself has said that there was no coster between the Vanner and Aesir, even after the war ended, that was a mistake. But again, what Scotty commented was a fact must choose very carefully the people who would marry and generally, royalty was ideal. The royalty of the gods after the war, it was very deteriorated and still had a grudge against the things that happened during the war, Odin with his blood eagles where it was one of the bloodiest rituals Thor had ever heard. Njord with his stretcher where Thor noticed Njord's gooky creativity with hooks. In short, no one wanted to marry the person who did these things to their relatives. So it seemed that the responsibility would fall to the future generation of gods the generation that Thor found himself with. The generation of the Aesir, sons of Odin, was made up only of men. And the generation of the Vanner, sons of Njord, was made up of a god, and a goddess the god was disregarded as a candidate for the Koster for obvious reasons, so there was only the goddess left. Freyja. Basically Freyja didn't exactly have a choice after all, waiting until Odin had a daughter was too risky. Freyja, in theory, need to marry an Aesir god, son of Odin. However. Be honest Scotty why, exactly, me and don't you dare lie, Thor said, narrowing his eyes. The Vanner didn't have many options, but it was because the Aesir didn't have any women who were Odin's daughters. There were far more options as a bridegroom for Freyja. 
Not to mention that, among those options, two gods were first and second in line to the throne of Asgard. Thor knew he wasn't just an illegitimate child, he was the fourth illegitimate child. If Scotty took him as an option and discarded the rest of his siblings, then it only meant one thing, be honest all right then because most of the gods piss themselves out of fear when you're in the same room as them it's more obvious when you're drunk, said Scotty, impassively. Well. That was a very unique way of using words. But it wasn't a lie. Thor was remembered as a hero who defeated 1000 Jotuns but after the centenary of Baldr, the hero adored by the people turned into one of the most feared gods by the vast majority of the people of Asgard. So let's face it you want me to be some sort of weapon that will instill fear in this skirmish between the Vanir gods. By marrying Freyja, Free will secure his rule by guaranteeing a brother-in-law who is Issa royalty, and powerful enough as a bonus, said Thor. In short yes, said Scotty. Thor looked at Scotty impassively. Sai do you realize this is the biggest bullshit I've heard? Thor asked. Scotty looked indignant. It's not bullshit. It's something that needs to be done for lasting peace. Said Scotty. No, it's not. You said you want to crush any idea of rebellion, but Odin won't be on the throne forever. Baldr will assume his rightful place and rule Asgard and all its lands, and my brother is adored by all, even by the Vanir gods. So the chances of anyone rebelling during Baldr's rule are extremely low. Thor said. Scotty was silent. That might be true, but only if Baldr assumes the throne sooner. And even if Baldr took over, there would still be a chance of rebellion, Scotty said trying to explain. But she was soon interrupted by Thor. And you think marrying Freyja to me is your best chance for peace? Even if I accepted the way you're describing the situation, there would still be a chance for rebellion as well, Thor said. True but it would be a much smaller chance and when Baldr takes the throne, the chance will be reduced from almost nothing to zero, said Scotty. Thor was silent, reflecting because what Scotty had said made some sense. If a cost recurs between the gods Aesir and Vanir, the chances of rebellion are reduced, and after Baldr assumes power, probably the rebellion will never begin. It was then that Scotty got up from the couch and started to approach Thor, and did something that surprised Thor, because he never imagined that the proud Scotty would do such an action, Scotty knelt and bowed. Please I just ask you to consider said Scotty. Scotty, the Jodan ally of the Asgardians, known for the most explosive temper of all she was begging. Scotty, despite being a Jodan, was Njord's wife and Free and Freyja's mother therefore, she was part of the Vanir royalty. But it wasn't just among the Vanir that she was royalty. Scotty, during the war between Aesir and Vanir, was a kind of Princess Jodan, because she was the daughter of Jazi, the leader of one of the oldest Jodan's clan of the Pantheon. For a royal to kneel and bow, in addition to begging, for a bastard well desperate situations call for desperate measures. Stand up, you're just embarrassing yourself said Thor. Thor was in a complicated situation. Out of curiosity why did you spare the trouble to ask me what I think about all this? Thor asked. Scotty didn't stop bowing but answered the question. It was on the advice of King Odin and Loki they said you don't like to be kept in the dark and dragged against your will, said Scotty. Hump so they learned said Thor, with a small smile. Thor then looked at Scotty, and his smile faded. Thor rose from his chair and took Scotty by the shoulders, and urged her to her feet, now Scotty was a little nervous, as Thor was by far taller, Thor hadn't stopped growing for some reason, and while Scotty was considered tall, with six feet Thor eclipsed with eight feet. In short Thor was quite intimidating with just his height. It was at this moment that Thor chose to speak. Did you talk about this situation with Freyja? Thor asked. After all, the bride's consent could be consulted, but usually, it wasn't the problem is that Freyja is the goddess of love. There is no arranged marriage, which usually starts without love, with the goddess of love. For Thor, this situation was comparable to forcing a carnivorous animal to become an herbivore. I asked Njord to pick up Freyja so we could talk right after your name day celebration but you weren't in Valhalla this afternoon, so I asked Freak to tell me where you lived, said Scotty. That's not exactly what I asked. I asked if you had already talked to Freyja about everything. I'll be more specific, did you seek her consent? Thor asked, frowning. Scotty understood, and after a moment of silence she answered. No, said Scotty. Sai let's go to Asgard I promised my mother I would join in the nightly festivities, said Thor, in a tired tone. Scotty just nodded. But before they left the house Thor had remembered one thing. Whistle. Fenrir. Come here. Said Thor, after he had whistled. 
It was then that something came down the stairs quickly and jumped towards Scotty, who didn't react in time. For a few seconds, Scotty saw her own death. But then Fenrir stopped his by just half an inch away from Scotty's face, but it wasn't because Fenrir wanted he was stopped by Thor, who was holding him. Sigh I already told you. No killing inside my house the smell of blood is unbearable indoors, said Thor, with a reproachful tone. Fenrir just whimpered. Thor knew this was Fenrir's way of apologizing it was then that Thor remembered something else, and that brought a smile to his face. Wait here Scotty, I'll just get something from my forge, said Thor, as he placed Fenrir on his shoulder. As Thor began to walk toward the room of the house that housed the forge Fenrir glanced toward Scotty. Scotty, as she was also the goddess of hunting, knew what an animal was feeling, what was Fenrir feeling about her? Well kill bad female protect new brother kill others new brother no let me kill them. What frightened Scotty was the murderous feeling Fenrir gave off, even after being reprimanded. It was clear to Scotty if she becomes a threat she will not stay alive for long in Fenrir's presence. A short time later Thor returned with a small package. Fenrir was he upstairs all this time? Asked Scotty, giving Fenrir a wary look. Fenrir responded with a murderous look. Yeah he's usually a very heavy sleeper, so I have to whistle loudly when I want to call him, he's pretty lazy, most of the day Thor explained. While Scotty had understood there was something else she was curious about. I'm a little curious for who is this package? Asked Scotty. Thor smiled back. It's a little gift to my old man. I was waiting for his name day but. After today, I've decided it's best to deliver the gift I made specifically to him as soon as possible said Thor. Scotty was still curious but chose not to comment. In fact, Scotty's mind started thinking about the coster again, Thor about the coster have you decided yet? Asked Scotty uncertainly. I will only consider after you or your husband talk to Freja and I must be present, said Thor without missing a beat in his walk. As Thor said this, he was thinking of all the probabilities of this situation, Thor said this just to buy him time to think. Let's go we've wasted too much time. Did you see if Hel was still with the rest of my brothers? Said Thor, opening the door to his house. Ah yes, she was sitting with her brothers, since the morning she has been with them, Baldr seemed to be taking care of her, replied Scotty. Fine at least it's not her mod, said Thor. Among all of Thor's brothers, Baldr was the most responsible and trustworthy, along with Vider. It wasn't that Thor hated his other brothers far from it, he liked his brothers. But sometimes Hermod and Vali were more likely to cause trouble. There was even a time when Hermod courted a woman a married woman needless to say, the woman's husband didn't like it at all. Anyway. At this point, Scotty and Thor left towards Asgard, intending to participate in the rest of the festivities in Valhalla that were taking place today, which was Thor's birthday. Location. Asgard Valhalla. POV. Third person. Early in the morning of that day, Prince Thor's name day celebrations began. But, for unknown reasons, Prince Thor withdrew from the celebration throughout the afternoon and early evening. During this time the Princess Vanner, Freja, entered Valhalla's hall hurriedly and inquired about the location of her mother, Scotty. To the guests, she looked worried, but in reality, Freja was quite upset. Odin said that Scotty was doing something important, and that he would return to the celebrations as soon as it was over. And because the answer was vague, it made some people curious about where Scotty was. It was then that Prince Loki argued that the goddess Scotty had gone to meet Prince Thor. Prince Loki's explanation was still vague. But he opened a Pandora's box, after all, many things could be interpreted from such a statement. Guests who were in the habit of assuming what was possibly going on, began to think that N'Jord's wife was having an affair with Prince Thor. This thought was quickly dismissed as everyone knew how much Scotty loved N'Jord. After a few minutes, Princess Freja found herself at the table of Odin's children sitting beside Free, who was facing Baldr and Hel. Freja then went on to talk about how she got the news from her father that she is being offered marriage in a coster to Prince Thor. I can't believe they did this to me I'm the goddess of love. Obviously, I won't approve of such a vile thing as coster. Said Freja, indignantly. Hermod had a nervous look at this last statement. Ah yes. Definitely whoever thought of negotiating your hand in marriage doesn't deserve you. Said Hermod. Baldr, who was sitting in front of Freja, start to speak. I know it's unfair but I know my brother, he taught me a lot growing up about how to be fair and stay true to your beliefs. So I give you my word Freja, my brother won't let this happen, it may not seem like it, but my brother cherishes peace and freedom, explained Baldr. 
Hell didn't make any comment after all, she had no idea what to say, because she's never been in a similar situation. I understand Balder, but it's still hard to process that my family would do something like that. I wonder if they care about my opinion, Freyja said with a tone of defeat. I care dear sister. Don't worry, I won't let anything happen to you. Otherwise, I will have failed as your big brother. Freeze said with a confident tone. Freyja just looked at her brother and gave a small smile of appreciation, but then she remembered her conversation with her father. About her duty as princess of the Vanner gods. And about the main reason for Coster. Keeping Free safe when he starts to rule the Vanner gods. It was at that moment that Freyja's appreciative smile turned to apologetic. No brother I will have failed you whispered Freyja. It was then that the voice of the guard who stood at the doors of Valhalla's hall, echoed through the hall. All hail Princess Scotty. Freyja looked towards the entrance and saw her mother walking quickly to the table where her father and George sat. During this walk, Scotty caught her daughter's gaze and gave her an apologetic look before continuing to walk towards Njord. Due to Scotty's behavior, Freyja interpreted that Thor had accepted the cost or this had left a bitter taste in her mouth. Some time passed and the guard spoke once more hail Prince Thor said the guard aloud. And there was Thor standing at the gates of Valhalla. Just looking. It was then that Thor's eyes met Freyja's gaze, and the gaze between the two remained for some time, until Thor began to stare at Odin. It was then a waitress approached Thor. The waitresses were responsible for distributing the drink and food to the guests. Usually, the drink was in the standard drinking horns, but the standard for Thor was a barrel. And that was exactly what the waitress was bringing to Thor a barrel full of mead. Here it is my prince more barrels will be delivered I promise you, said the waitress smiling and handing over the barrel. The waitress was nervous because on Thor's shoulder, looking bored, was the god slayer. Thor looked at the barrel and then at the waitress, but he didn't smile in response. I thank you for your consideration but I will only have a ceremonial drinking horn, Thor said. That surprised the occupants Thor cut down on his drink. Why? The waitress just waved and ran to get the barrel and take it back, only then to get the drinking horn. But Thor prevented the action no let the barrel here I'll make use of that barrel, Thor said. The waitress was confused Thor wasn't going to drink the barrel, but he's still going to keep it. The waitress just shrugged and went to get the standard ceremonial meat horn. While the waitress had been fetching the meat horn Thor decided to look at the guests. He flashed a smile at his brother's table, and a polite nod to the other tables, but not a smile. For some who knew well how Thor behaved when he was sober, his mood was quite clear somehow Thor was pissed. When the waitress returned with the drinking horn, Thor then thanked her and began to smile. For some reason, Odin didn't like that smile. I would like to make a statement. Thor said aloud. All the guests rose from the tables and remained silent, awaiting Prince Thor's words. However some didn't have a good feeling. First of all, I would like to thank you for participating in my names day party, I assure you that I am extremely happy for your consideration in coming to celebrate, said Thor, in a sincere tone. This seemed to bring some happy smiles from the audience, but those smiles were erased from the face, and replaced by a puzzled expression after Thor spoke the next words. Now I, as the day's host, declare that the festivities are over you may leave, Thor said with a smile, a fake smile. Nobody understood after all, it was still early in the evening. Also, the party started as soon as the sun rose, so it was supposed to end with the sunrise of the next day. I understand your confusion, people of Asgard, but I need to discuss with my parents something important that can only be decided today. I ask that the people who are sitting at my brother's table remain, said Thor, in an apologetic tone. This caught the public's attention. To the guests, it looked like Thor was going to have a very important conversation. Some speculated it was a family affair, but dismissed it as Free and Freyja were sitting next to the Aesir princes. But the guests obeyed after all Thor had the power of the host of the day as everyone was leaving, just as the leading couple Vanner approached, Thor whispered in their direction. Wait outside the gate said Thor, not looking at the couple. Neither Scotty nor George said anything, but they decided to do as asked. Because it would probably be something about the coster. As soon as all the guests had left, Thor dropped the drinking horn on the floor, picked up the barrel, and began walking toward his brother's table. As soon as Thor got close he started to smile. Thank you guys for coming and Balder, thank you for taking care of Hel, Thor said. Hel looked a little indignant. What do you mean take care? I'm not a child, cousin. Said Hel, a little annoyed. Thor just smiled back. Ha 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 right, of course, it's not sorry for saying you were a kid, said Thor, 
who put one of his hands on Hal's head and ruffled her hair. A.W. You never apologized when you said I behaved like a child said Hermod, with a playful tone. Because I was, and still am, right you still behave like a child, you little shit, Thor said, unmoved. Hermod grimaced indignantly. Ha 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 calm down guys, said Baldur worriedly. It was then that a voice spoke. It was Freja. Thor my mom already talked to you, didn't she? Asked Freja. It was then that Free chose that moment to jump across the table and glared at Thor, wanting to look as intimidating as possible. Free failed to appear intimidating as Thor remained unfazed. While you are my friend I won't let my sister forcefully marry, Free said. It was then that something surprised everyone sitting at the table. Someone stopped Free from speaking. And that someone was Freja. Free, stop it's alright, Freja said, smiling. But for Free, who knew his sister's smiles, knew that the smile Freja was giving him, it was quite false. But sister. He Free started to complain before being interrupted by someone else. So will you fight for your sister's freedom? This caught the attention of the people at the table. Who asked that question? The answer would be simple. Thor. Thor what are you suggesting? Asked Baldur, curious. Thor just smiled. Oh. You know me, brother I'm offering the easy W-A-Y said Thor. Freja had not fully understood what Thor was claiming, it was then that Thor chose to comment. I'd like to say to you guys to stay here, but you'd better leave too. While you technically could participate the fewer people who know what's going to happen in this room, the better it will be, Thor said. Baldur looked disappointed. You don't trust us? Asked Baldur. Not exactly you'll be more likely to stop me if you witness this conversation, so I'm just pulling you out of the conflict, Thor explained. These words caught the attention of the people at the table conflict what conflict? Though Baldur wanted to know more all of Thor's brothers knew that. When Thor sets one thing in his head, he is unlikely to change. So Baldur just nodded as he rose from his chair. All of you let's go, said Baldur, to his brothers. Thor's other brothers understood the situation and quickly rose from their chairs. Hel rose too, albeit reluctantly. Thor you really don't need our help? Asked Hel. Thor just shook his head in denial. It's better to be this way, but by the way, while the celebrations in Valhalla have ended, feel free to come to my house in Midgard, we can continue celebrating there. Hel has another key to my house so you can go with her, if you find Sif and Nana you can call them too, but when you leave ask Scotty and Jord to come in said Thor, to the people who were there. Got up from the table. Thor's brothers and Hel nodded and then headed for the exit. Free and Freja looked like they didn't know whether to accompany the others or remain. Since what Thor will discuss with their parents probably will be about Coster. It was then that Thor looked at the royalty banner. You will stay until the conversation is over. Please follow me, let's have a very fun conversation, said Thor, as he tucked the barrel of meat into his storage necklace, and walked towards the head table. The banner siblings just nodded and followed Thor toward the head table. As they approached the main imperial table Thor grabbed a chair and sat down calmly in front of Odin. After a few minutes, Scotty and Jord appeared. The Vanner gods were all standing, and only the Aesir, consisting of Frigg, Odin, Loki, and Thor himself, remained seated. Thor noticed this quickly. This is getting in the way a little Thor said in reflection, looking at the table. Thor then rose from his chair and lifted the table. He set the table a little away from the small group, and then returned to his seat, while Thor could just throw the table, the mess would be unnecessary. Please sit down, Thor said, to the Vanner gods. The Vanner gods then sought out chairs to sit on. During that moment Fenrir, who had been on Thor's shoulder all this time, jumped into Thor's lap and began glaring at Odin and Loki. Obviously, both Odin and Loki didn't like the looks Fenrir was giving them at all. When the Vanner gods returned with the chairs they, understandably, chose to sit a little apart from Thor, who had Fenrir in his lap. But. Free and Freja sat opposite their parents. The action was noticed by the others, free dot 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 Freja dot 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 what's the meaning began Scotty, until she was interrupted by a voice followed by a loud growl. Sit down it was Thor who had spoken, and as he spoke Fenrir gave a warning growl. Scotty was then pulled by Njord to sit down. With everyone seated, the difference was visible. It looked like a quadratic formation with Thor sitting across from Odin, Frigg, and Loki. And free and Freja sitting across from their parents. No one wanted to start the conversation for a while the tension was palpable. It was then that Thor commented, How are the territories of Asgard doing, father? Any conflict? Thor asked. 
This surprised people because it wasn't exactly what they thought would be asked first. I must say, nephew you know how to break the ice, said Loki, with a smile. Thor did not smile in response. Thor I think you and us know we should talk about the coster said Frigg. There will be no coster. My sister will not forcibly marry. Exclaimed Free. Free don't said Freja, trying to stop Free, but the damage has already been done. Scotty and Jord promptly spoke back. Shut up Free. It's the best way for you to guarantee your power among the Vanner gods. Said Scotty, this is all thanks to the rash decisions you usually make. Who doesn't remember your little adventure in Jotunheim? Thanks to Sif, we know very well about how you acted. And not just us, but other gods too. If Thor hadn't been there, I would have probably received your head as of a sign of war. Shouted Njord. Enough. Shouted a voice. It was Odin who had demanded silence. But Odin was not facing any of the Vanner. He was facing the only person who seemed quite calm at this conversation. You brought us together, aren't you going to say anything? Asked Odin, looking at his son. Thor remained calm, and after some silence he decided to speak. If I were to say all I want we would spend all night in this conversation, but I'll summarize what I think about it all, but I must warn you that what I'm going to say might be a little insensitive. Odin seemed to consider for some time until he made his decision. Very well you may speak honestly, Thor, said Odin. Thor then smiled back. I beg your pardon in advance, Scotty but regarding my opinion about the Kostra I refuse, said Thor. And so, simply, people were surprised and shocked by Thor's response, Scotty promptly rose from her chair in outrage. I beg to you. For to consider Scotty started to say until she was interrupted by Thor himself. And I considered and no matter what scenario goes through my head the Kostra is the last option to solve your problems. It's the last option for a simple reason, it's risky very risky a good example of what can happen? Let's see. Free is murdered and Freyja will be in power and will marry any rebel Vanner god to establish peace in the Vanner race, and if Freyja is married to an Aesir god, she will likely be murdered too, and then the other Vanner gods would choose their leader, and that was one of the scenarios, Thor explained. The group was silent until Scotty chose to speak. When did you think of this scenario? Asked Scotty. As soon as we left my house, on our way to Asgard I was thinking about the pros and cons, and the cons are too much. I didn't lie to you I respected your request and was seriously considering the proposal, but I won't participate in something that could go very wrong, explained Thor, with a tone of sincerity. But then George chose to comment. You talk about murder? My people would never do such a dishonorable thing. If one of us wants to kill a person, there is a duel. There will never be someone who will kill the other in such a dishonorable way," said Njord indignantly. In a way, this was true in Norse culture, it was considered dishonorable to kill a person in a way considered cowardly. The use of poison for murder was considered a cowardly way. However Njord honestly, no one would mind being the dishonorable guy in the story when everyone wants the same thing. And honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if the Vanner rebelled they would kill Free and Freyja with poison without a second thought, said Thor, simply. Thor was sure that the poison would be the main weapon used for the murder of Free and Freyja, in case of a revolt of the Vanner gods. Why? Because it was the best weapon for the situation of the rebels Vanner gods. The Vanner are reduced in numbers, just 50 gods. The Vanner are allies of the Light Elves, who are a force of approximately 1,000 soldiers. But when compared to the rest of the Asgardian army, as well as powerful Aesir like Thor, Baldr, Odin, Vider, and others, the chances of the Vanner losing an open warfare, were certain, so there's only the last option left the tragic death of Free and Freyja. Resulting in a new election for the heir of the Vanner, as neither Free nor Freyja has descendants. No one would suspect that Free and Freyja were poisoned after all, poison was a dishonorable weapon. If anyone suspected? There could always be a scapegoat as for the poisons capable of killing a god. There were a few if it were a very potent poison, it would be that of the white dragon emperor named Albion. But another poison, just a little weaker, and one that wouldn't arouse suspicion because it weakens before killing with just a few drops? Jormungandr's poison. Another possible poison? Thanks to Thor's travels in Africa, he knew there was another creature a very ugly creature. When Thor encountered this creature, it resembled the Groot Slang a mixture of familiar animals. But even though the Groot Slang was a giant, and the fusion of an elephant and a snake, this other creature Thor encountered was a little over 12 inches tall. It seemed this creature looked like the fusion of a chicken and a snake. And its poison was quite potent. Not comparable to Jormungandr, but still quite strong. 
and quite capable of killing a god if administered in large amounts. Unfortunately, Thor had only gotten a small sample of the poison anyway, there were few, but there were poisons capable of killing a god. Were they hard to get? Absolutely. But there would always be a small possibility the people who heard Thor's explanation were processing this information, and frankly those who fought the wars knew very well about one thing. All is fair in a war. Especially when you start on the side that is clearly at disadvantage, so Thor what do you suggest? Asked Freyja, curious. That was the same question everyone had, but Freyja had spoken first Freyja was worried initially, she was upset with Koster, but she was afraid what her parents were saying would come true. So, grudgingly, she would do anything for peace even if it cost her freedom. But Thor's claims had threw the Koster out of the window, because it showed that even if the Koster happened, there would be a probability of rebellion. It may not seem like it but when the situation calls for it, Freyja becomes realistic. And at that moment the rebellion can still happen. Do. You want a pragmatic answer? Thor asked, looking at Freyja. As soon as Freyja nodded, Thor responded somewhat rude. To be honest your brother needs to grow some balls, said Thor, without missing a beat. This seemed to have aroused the wrath of most Vanner. What do you mean by that Thor? Are you calling me a submissive? Asked Free, yelling, getting up from his chair. Free was annoyed. And for good reason. Being called submissive in Norse culture, it was an insult and affront to Free's pride. But then someone stopped Free and pulled him back to his seat. It was Freja. And although she was a little upset at the choice of words, she wanted to know exactly what it meant. Now could you give an explanation not so short? Asked Freja, with a small frown. It was then that Thor smiled back. From what I could understand from the conversation I had with Scotty the Coster would be used, as the main motive, not to solidify our alliance, but to establish fear in the Vanner who want to rebel and free can do that, Thor said. It seemed to make people think but there was one small detail. Thor I don't fight I'm a god of peace remember? Said Free. It was then that Thor grimaced. Yes, I know that that's why in the summary version I said that you need to grow some balls for Odin's sake, Free. During your trip to Jotunheim, although you, probably, would die there you could have killed almost half of the 1000 Jotuns, if you were using your weapons. You may not be the strongest or the mightiest, but you have the best toys that fight for you. Just give the order. Also a god of peace? Okay answer me this then. How can you consider yourself a god of peace if you are unwilling to preserve peace? Said Thor, asking a question at the end of their dialogue. And that question? Free didn't know how to answer without facing his ideals, no one dared to say anything neither the Aesir nor the Vanner. Thor, when he noticed that Free didn't have an answer to his question, continued to speak, calmer this time. Sai you know in a way, Baldr is also a god of peace. But unlike you, he is more than willing to break the skull of the enemies who threaten Asgard with his own fists, if necessary unlike you, he doesn't have weapons that fight for him, and even if he had something like that I guarantee you, that he would still use his fists. Baldr believes that if he wants to be the protector of his people in case of war, he must be on the front lines fighting and bleeding for his people, and that's something I can respect from the little shit, because just a few leaders act like that way said Thor, in a tired tone. Thor I think that's enough, you began Odin, until he was interrupted by the least likely person. No he's right I'm a coward Free said. This was considered a shock to some, as Free was basically accepting that Thor was calling him a coward and blind in the face of conflict. Free you're not a coward to me you just have a good heart, but even I've admitted to you, this is the wrong time for the kind of peace you so determinedly defend. I'm proud of you now, for having recognized that too said Freja placing her hand on her brother's shoulder. Free appreciated the gesture, but he was still depressed after Thor's statements. It was then that Loki chose to speak. Well all this talk is making me sick. But before I start throwing up, I'd still like to hear your brilliant solution, nephew, said Loki, with a smile. Obviously, no one liked the choice of words, but Thor still responded. Oh? Feeling like throwing up from the conversation, uncle? I understand your situation I feel the same thing every time I see your face, Thor said. Loki lost his smile. This is no time for jokes what do you suggest Thor? Asked Frigg. It was then that everyone waited for Thor to respond. Want my solution? First I must know if there is any imminent conflict said Thor, crossing his arms. Odin had no intention of commenting, but he wanted to see what his son had in mind. An imminent conflict? 
Without a doubt the most likely conflict is against the Slav pantheon, the reason is the same old thing territory dispute in Midgard said, Odin. This surprised some, such as Free, Freja, and, to some extent, Thor. But Thor saw this as an opportunity. Out of curiosity what would the territory be? Thor asked, curious. Odin snapped his fingers and used some magic to create an exact copy of the Midgard map. For Thor it was the world map he knew, with a few minor differences. On this map were marked all the territories of influence of each pantheon and faction. It was then that the map approached a particular location that turned out to be Nordic territory, with the pantheons of Celtic and Slavic gods relatively close. It was then that Odin brought the image closer and showed the disputed territory between Nordic and Slavic territory. The disputed territory? Well, the disputed territory of influence is this small group of islands between our territories. I spoke with Perrin before you returned to Asgard this evening for the continued celebration of your name day, and we reached a consensus on a small competition between two representatives from each pantheon pantheon victory will occur when there are no more representatives to compete, explained Odin. Thor stared at the islands shown. He knew the name, due to his previous life, it was an archipelago located at the entrance to the Gulf of Bothnia on the Baltic Sea. The name of the archipelago? Avananme, a land, islands. Well that's great, I'll be one of the two representatives, no need to look for the other, said Thor looking at Free. Everyone seemed to get the message. Now tell me, Free will you fight for your sister's freedom? Here's your chance if you fight using your weapons, it will show the Vanner that you have the balls to be a strong leader, maybe even surpassing your parents, but the point is. Dot dot can you do it? Thor asked, now waiting for Free's answer. And it seemed that Free was seriously considering. Location. Midgard Thor's house. POV. Third person. In the house of the strongest Norse god, Asgardian royalty along with Nana and Sif, found themselves curious about strange architecture and things they had never seen before. What's that for? Asked Hermod, pointing to a large box made of some metal. Hal promptly answered her curious cousin's question. Ah. Thor told me the name once, it was Fridge. Said Hel. While most of the royalty was in the so-called living room, Hermod got bored of doing nothing and just waiting for his brother Thor to return. So he decided to explore the house, with Hel following close behind. Oh and what does it do? Asked Hermod. Well, Thor told me how it worked, but I didn't quite understand I just understood that it preserves the food, Hel said. Hermod was confused. Preserve the food? Asked Hermod. Eh yeah, I didn't understand that part either, said Hel. Hermod then shrugged and proceeded to further investigate the area Hel called the kitchen. Which, for Hermod, was a much smaller space than what might be considered a standard kitchen. It was then that Hermod identified another object. A very strange object. As soon as Hermod raised his hand to catch the target someone held him back. No. Shouted a frightened voice. It was Hel who was holding Hermod's forearm. The other brothers came as soon as they heard Hel scream. With Baldur in the lead. Hel? What happened? Asked Baldur. Hel, realizing she had caused a scene, was embarrassed and let go of Hermod's arm. Ah you see. I don't think Thor will like you touching anything especially that thing, Hal said, pointing to the object that had piqued Hermod's curiosity. Baldur was confused, as was the rest of the group, and looked towards the object. It was then that Nana, who had approached the group along with Sif, declared. Looks like a beverage pitcher? Said Nana, in confusion. Sif seemed to disagree. Pitchers aren't small also, it appears to be made of metal, Sif said. Baldur, as curious as to the group, looked at Hel. Cousin, could you tell us what it is? And what is it for? Asked Baldur. Hel seemed to have grown more nervous about everyone's gaze. Well Thor called it a coffee maker, and I didn't quite understand when Thor explained to me what it's for, he just said he make the precious with that, Hel said. No one understood Hel's explanation. What was the precious? Well, although I'm curious what that precious would be, we'd better stay together in the living room. We are under the law of the guest, but the host, who owns the roof over our heads, is not present said Baldur, looking at Hermod. Hermod seemed to disagree. Come on Baldur, I'm sure Thor won't mind we explore his house a bit, said Hermod. Hel seemed to disagree because she didn't think Thor would like someone going through his things without permission. But before Hel could comment, Baldur replied. No, and this is not a discussion Hermod, we are going to the living room, and we will await the return of our brother and host, Thor, said Baldur, with a serious tone and facing Hermod. 
Hermod knew he couldn't go against Baldur, he wasn't such a fool. Sigh very well then, said Hermod, with a defeated sigh. It was then that the door to the house opened. Thor, accompanied by Free and Freja, had returned. Viter, who was the first to return from the kitchen, was the first to notice. Ah! Brother! You finally arrived. Shall we enjoy the rest of the evening and continue to celebrate your name day? Asked Viter. At that moment, Thor looked at Viter and the others who had come out of the kitchen area to greet Thor. Yes Viter, we can continue, said Thor. Thor then looked at Hel. Hel could you please take them to the deck? I'll cook something said Thor. Hel then lit up. Certainly cousin. This way guys, Hel said, leading the guests to the stairs. Though the vast majority of people followed Hel. Two people didn't follow the queen of the underworld. It was the Vanner siblings, who chose to stay in the kitchen while Thor prepared something to cook. You should have followed them, said Thor, as he removed some ingredients from the fridge and pantry. We would like to speak with you, Freyja said. Well, although I'm cooking, my ears are open for any conversation, Thor said. Freyja then looked at her brother. Do you think that if I show to the rest of the Vanner gods that I'm strong there will be no rebellion? Asked Free uncertainly. Thor then stopped for a moment and turned to look at Free and Freyja, before returning to what he was doing. You don't learn to be strong you are forced to be strong, Thor said. Free hadn't understood what Thor claimed. But Freyja seemed to think about that. What do you mean by that? Who forces me to be strong? Asked Free. But who answered the question was not Thor. Life isn't it? Asked Freyja. Yes, more specifically the position Free is in right now, Thor said. Free then looked at Freyja. Life? Asked Free uncertainly. Freyja looked at her brother. You didn't choose this free, I understand you. You don't want to fight, and you want an era of peace without conflict, but for one of our standing, as the royalty in a warrior society, that kind of peace is not acceptable. In fact, in a way, we are forced to be who we are because of our birth, Freyja said, in a somber tone. This seemed to have affected Free, as did during the end of the conversation about Coster, when Thor asked him how he can be the god of peace, if he refuses to preserve it. Your sister is right free, but that's not the only reason, said Thor. This caught the attention of the Vanner siblings. You, free, were thinking of an ideal world for you. But, you must understand that this ideal world is just a mirage because reality tends to be disappointing, Thor said, looking at free. So, if you think my peace is just a mirage can you tell me what peace is for you, Thor? Asked free, curious. Thor thought for a moment, then went back to cooking as he answered. Peace is. You can lie down in your bed without worrying about the outside for me, peace is more of individual achievement. But enough of that, if you want to show your people that you are their leader, you must understand that you may not get the peace you want to fight for, but you will get the obedience of your people, said Thor. After Thor stated, it was then clear to free. Thor did not want him to fight for the Vanner gods to be at peace during his rule. Thor wanted free to fight for the Vanner gods to obey him. While Free would like to condemn such an action after all these conversations, he knew he needed to fight. Because only by fighting would he establish his dominance as the Vanner heir. By the standards of our society, you weren't weak Free you were incompetent, Thor said. Free remained silent, just accepting the truth of Thor's words. Well, the fight against the Slavic pantheon across the archipelago, it's been scheduled for a week so, do you have any idea who you're facing? Freyja asked, looking at Thor. After some thought, Thor responded. I don't want to jump to conclusions but it is almost certain that the leader of the current Slav pantheon will fight, said Thor. This seemed to shock Free and Freyja. Perrin Perrin may fight? Asked Free. Perrin is the current leader of the pantheon, as well as being one of the heads of the Triglav, as well as being a battle maniac so, in a way, he may fight, Thor said, shrugging. If Perrin fought, it wouldn't be surprising to Thor. The question is, who would be the other Slav representative? Vels? That was out of the question, as Vels had a rivalry with Perrin. A rivalry that claimed to be an endless struggle that changes the seasons throughout the year, so Thor doubted Vels' support for this situation. So Thor had no idea who the other representative would be. Anyway, we won't know until the time comes, Thor said. The Vanner siblings exchanged nervous glances. But they didn't know what else to say about the fight, so they remained silent. It was then that Freyja remembered something. Thor what was that box you gave to your father, Odin? Asked Freyja, curious. When Thor heard the question he stopped cooking for a moment. Until he gave a smile. A very vindictive smile. 
Well, let's just say the King Odin will be quite impressed by the gift, Thor said. Freyja didn't understand, but Frey seemed to notice Thor's smile. It was a smile that caused Gusebem's gift? Asked Freyja. Oh yes, I'm sure it will be a gift you will remember very well said Thor, as he went back to cooking. Location. Asgard Palace Odin's room. Sigh this meeting did not go exactly as I predicted said Odin, with a tired tone. Frigg then sat up in bed. Well, you know Thor. He tends to surprise us with another unique perspective, said Frigg. You're right the brat is not easy to predict said Odin, with a small smile. It was then that Frigg asked a question as she went to the wardrobe to take off her clothes for the night. By the way, what did Thor give you before he left? Asked Frigg. It was then that Odin looked at a small package in his hands. He said it was a gift. But today is his name day, why did he give me something? Asked Odin, curious. Odin thought Thor would be angry after Koster's attempt, but at the end of the conversation, Thor gave him a gift. It was then that Odin saw a small blue button on the box. And, out of curiosity, he pressed the button. Shit! Swore Odin, in a low voice, as he looked at his index finger, which now had some blood forming. It felt like something like a needle pierced his finger. It was at that moment that Thor's voice emerged from the box. Greetings my old man, if you're hearing this then you press the button on the package I handed you. This is a little gift made by me, from the corrupted ice and a few more things, the statue is quite resistant to magic and physical attacks hope you like it, I know I'll like it, said Thor's recording. A statue? Said Odin, confused. But honestly, Odin was more concerned about Thor's latest statement. It was then that the package opened. Inside the package was said statue. It looked like a statue of a dog? The statue was a little strange, the dog was sitting like a guard dog, but it looked like it was holding some sort of sword. It was then that the recording continued. Behold Dago for some reason. Odin didn't like the name one bit. But he dismissed his worries, after all, it was just a mere decorative statue. An odd statue, but still a mere statue. So my love, what was it? Asked Frigg. It was then that Odin saw the state of dress of his lovely wife. In fact, there was no dress. Hee <laughs> hee, maybe we'd better leave it to talk about Thor's gift for later, now I have a duty as of H-U-S-V-A-N-D. The very more important duty said Odin, as he dropped the doggo statue to the ground. Free just smiled and walked towards her husband. What Odin didn't know at the time is that the statue was linked, through the collected blood, to a particular hormone. The hormone? Oxytocin. Commonly referred to as the pleasure hormone. The statue was specifically linked to oxytocin enhancement levels. After a short time, the level of enhancement of oxytocin present in Odin's body was higher than the established standard. Resulting in the activation of the statue. Neither Odin nor Frigg saw that the dog statue's eyes began to glow from a sky blue color to a blood red color within a few seconds. It was then that as soon as Odin was ready to go to the main course. A macabre voice was heard across the room, interrupting Frigg and Odin's amusement. No horny that night, for a few minutes, the king of Asgard and one of the most feared gods in the Norse pantheon, screamed like a little child. Time skip. One week. Location. Archipelago located at the entrance to the Gulf of Botnia Future Islands of Ananma, a land. Baltic Sea. POV Thor. And so, the day of confrontation has finally arrived. Honestly, I wasn't quite willing to fight for a set of islands. After all, I don't have this desire to expand the Nordic territory at least not yet. I won't lie, I don't currently wish to go out on a ridiculous crusade to fight for land influence, because to me it's worthless. However. I will defend the place I call home until my last breath. I didn't intend to get too attached to my new family, but after 200 years? It was hard not to care, after all, I wanted to have an anchor in my new life. For starters, my brothers. My brothers can be a little impulsive, but I can't hate them. Though sometimes they need a good kick in the ass to stay in line especially Hermod. My cousins were other people I came to like. Hal and Fenrir, even though we are only family through the blood oath, became people close to me Sif was my first friend. When I was young, I wasn't that close to my brothers, in fact, I think it was me walking away from the idiocies they were doing at the time, that was one of the few reasons I wanted to learn how to forge. Basically, when I was 10 years old, I would rather be alone and learn something that would be useful for me in the future, than just playing soldier. But only a short time later I met Sif, and I couldn't exactly avoid her as she was my teacher at Yuna's daughter. Was she different? 
not exactly. In a short version, she had a good head on her shoulders unlike my brothers, and therefore it was easier to talk to her. Sif's friend, Nana was unique? I didn't interact with her much. Although it felt like she and Baldr were getting closer over the years. In fact, Baldr acted strange whenever Nana was brought into the conversation whom they are not. I must be imagining things. Free and Freyju are also people I came to care about, Free being my second friend. My friendship with Free was complicated. In short he was and still is, an idiot. A good-hearted idiot, I admit but still an idiot. After all, he would like to solve all conflicts like Naruto with his talk no jutsu. I learned just a few years after being born into this world, something that was a fact. Nordics only respect strength. You will only be heard if you are strong. There was something Loki had once said to me when I decided to live in Midgard. The words? Well why do you want to walk among the dirt ones? It is quite easy to discern that the so-called dirt ones was the mortals. Loki's thoughts about the Norse divine race were very clear to me after all, currently, mortals were just cattle to most gods. Mortals were considered the weakest in the chain of power, for the simple fact that they cannot strike back. Basically, Loki believed that gods shouldn't mix with dirt. For him, it was like he wanted to crawl through the mud just to socialize with the so-called lesser beings. In short he was and still is, a big pain in the ass. Maybe he'll change his mind when the first Longinus appears. It will be quite easy to find the first sacred gear of Longinus classification, after all, just find the Roman soldier who will kill the savior during the crucifixion, the irony was the name of the soldier. The soldier's name? Longinus. It was kind of obvious that the Longinus rank descended from somewhere, or more specifically from someone, unfortunately, I had to wait until the time came, which could be after a few centuries, or even millennia, as I didn't have a clue what date exactly I was. My thoughts were interrupted by a voice. Thor? Thor? Are you listening to me? Asked a voice. It was Baldur, along with Nana and Sif, who was keeping me company while I waited for my turn to fight. Ah say it again? I asked. Baldur looked a little uncertain, then Sif spoke. Sai your brother wants to fight in your place, Sif said. Well somehow, I expected him to ask that question sooner or later. No way, I said. Baldr seemed a little disappointed by my answer. Thor are you sure Baldr can compete? He keeps saying that he wants to fight for the Asgardian people, said Nana. Oh, I was fully aware of my brother's desire to fight. And yet there can only be two representatives, and in this specific situation, Free is the key player in this confrontation. He must fight, only then to bring the Vanner in line. I am the guarantee of victory, besides that, I promise to fight I said. Sigh I understand brother, it's just I'd like to prove myself to my people, said Baldr. What Baldr was going through was completely normal. The Heart of Gold Prince wishes to fight and show his people what kind of ruler he is. However, this was unnecessary right now. I then placed my hand on Baldr's shoulder. There will be other fights, little shit. Your duty as a prince right now is to show support for your fighters, so go join the old man and mother Frigg in the main room, and watch the show, remember brother, just smile and wave I said, with a little smile. I did not lie. It was likely that there will be more fights for territory more often in the future. As much as the gods don't need the faith of mortals to live, for them it was always nice to be worshipped by lesser beings shit god superiority complex. I really don't like it but that's okay. I wish you, good luck brother, said Baldr. Thanks, little shit, I said. Then Baldr looked at Nana and Sif. If you wish, feel free to accompany me to the royal area, said Baldr. Nana looked like she wanted to go, however, Sif declined the invitation. I appreciate Prince Baldr's invitation, but I'll be in the Asgardian crowd along with my mum and dad, Sif said, with a little bow. I see, in this case shall we go miss Nana? Asked Baldr, with a shy smile, extending his arm. Nana just smiled and grabbed Baldr's arm in a hug. Yes Baldr, let's go, said Nana. Nana's answer seemed to have Baldr grinning even wider. In the waiting room it was just me and Sif. You know it's quite rare to see Baldr behave like that I commented. Baldr is courteous to everyone but with Nana, he seems to be especially careful. Well I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up sharing a bed one day, Sif said. For some reason I imagined Baldr marrying Nana. Hmm if that happened, I would definitely play the cool uncle role. It wouldn't be so bad, I said. Sif then looked at me. Serious? Do you think that wouldn't be a problem? Asked Sif. Technically, Nana was a Jodan, as she is the daughter of a leader named Nap. 
but as the Aesir had already made some Kostra over the years, another marriage between Aesir and Jodan would be frowned upon by some. But honestly I don't think it would be a problem. If Baldr wants to marry Nana, he will have my support, I said with a shrug. Before Sif and I could talk again, the other Asgardian representative had arrived. POV. Third person. Well here we are, Free said, a little nervous. Thor, sensing Free's nervousness, assumed that Free was probably nervous, because it would be the first time he would fight for real, and it would be the first time he would fight using his weapons. Plus there are thousands of people watching the confrontation. Relax Free, it's not like it's a fight to the death, said Thor, shrugging. Actually, it's a fight to the death, Frey just said. Thor just scoffed. No, it's not. The Valhalla Arena was made by Buri for us to fight to the death in the Mirror Dimension. Whoever dies in the Mirror Dimension will be taken back to the real world knocked out, but very alive, said Thor. Buri made the Valhalla Arena for a simple reason. Buri's reign was the reign with the fewest Nordic supernatural beings. Buri had many children, but the population was very small, and there was still conflict it was then that, in order to resolve the conflict without a bloody war, Buri had the idea of creating the Valhalla Arena. A place where combatants would be taken to the mirror dimension of the entire planet Earth. There was no sign of life in that place other than the combatants. In the mirror dimension, combatants would fight to the death. When the combatant died, their body returned from the mirror dimension completely healthy and knocked out, but very alive. There was just a mental strain, which depending on the situation, could put the combatant into a coma for a few years. But these cases were rare, and there were still no fatalities. In short, Buri created the arena to resolve conflicts without having to lose his people. However, neither Bor nor Odin used the arena after Buri's death, the reason? Because they wanted there to be casualties on their enemies during the wars. The Valhalla arena will be used to prevent someone from dying. While this is true, the pain will be very real, Frages said in rebuke. That would be true, the pain would be so real that it will be a more violent version of the ghost pain, so it resulted in the knockout. You know, hearing all this makes me rethink my decision to fight, Free said, with a nervous smile. Thor walked over and slapped Free on the shoulder. Too late to run your people in the Lasgard, as well as some pantheons and factions of the supernatural, will be watching you, said Thor. Free just went pale. That doesn't help. Free said. It was at that moment that Sif decided to speak. I think I'd better go now I still have to meet my dad and mom in the audience, Sif said. Sif then looked at Thor. Well good luck big guy, Sif said smiling at Thor. Thor smiled back. Thanks, Sif, I'm sure Free and I can handle it, Thor said. Sif just waved and looked like she wanted to do something else, but she just chose to leave the waiting room. Thor then felt a hand on his forearm and looked toward the owner of the hand. It was Freja. But although at first, it looked like Freja wanted to say something, she just stared. Freja just stared at Thor with her eyes, with no sign of replying. This seemed to confuse Thor. Freja? Did you want to say something? Thor asked, confused. Free, who knew his sister well, knew that at that moment his sister was using one of her abilities. The skill? With just a brief touch, Freja will know the individual's deepest desires. However Freja had never been like this after knowing the person's deepest desire, usually, Freja used this ability unconsciously. So, she learned to ignore the most hidden primitive desires of the person, the main motivator was because she is the goddess of beauty, and that's why, when a man or even a woman looked towards her, it aroused her most primitive desires, like lust. Call her a narcissist, but Freja was fully aware of her charm and her worth as a goddess of beauty. Freja used this ability to distance herself from wedding suitors who only thought of her as a trophy. Because Freja knew very well what the person felt the moment she touched the individual, she had learned to ignore such thoughts of the person this time, for some reason, the same thing didn't happen. Freja didn't ignore the person's thoughts, as usual, she had just stood there. In shock. Free then shook his sister's shoulder, waking her up about her situation. Ah. I I wish you all the best of luck, see you later. I'm going to join dad and mom. I'll be rooting for your victory," said Freja, as she walked quickly towards the exit of the waiting room. This action left Thor a little surprised and Free quite confused. What happened? Thor asked, looking at Free. Not even Free was sure. I have no idea but for some reason I don't like it at all, said Free, with a little frown. This seemed to confuse Thor. How do you not like it if you don't even know what happened? Thor asked uncertainly. Free responded with a frown. 
It's just a feeling call it a disturbance, Freeze said. Thor looked at Free as if he were crazy. Before Thor could speak, the sound of a trumpet rang throughout the Valhalla arena. It was time for the clash between the gods. Location. Future Islands of Ananma, a land, Arena Valhalla. POV. Third person. The Valhalla arena was very similar to a football stadium, but with a grandstand capable of holding up to 100,000 fans, in addition to the VIP area. In addition to being a floating arena the arena was mobile, so that the confrontation could be held outside Asgardian territory. Through runes, the confrontation between the combatants in the mirror dimension was transmitted to the crowd. The VIP area is occupied by the most important figures from the pantheons or factions that have chosen to see the fight. The reason for such an invitation to other factions and pantheons was quite simple to show others who has the biggest weapon. One of these figures, who had accepted the invitation, belonged to the Aztec Pantheon, and was well known for being one of the current Dragon Kings. Or in this case, another Dragon Queen beside Tiamat. Baldr, who was heading to the VIP area of the Nordic Pantheon, stopped when he saw the figure, and then greeted her with respect. Ah! Lady Quetzalcoatl. I see you took an interest in this little battle, said Baldr, with a welcoming smile. The figure, now identified as Quetzalcoatl, only chuckled. Ha 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 it's always fun to see a good fight. I'm also a little surprised to finally meet you, son of Odin, said Quetzalcoatl. Another well-known thing about Quetzalcoatl? Although she was known to be quite benevolent to humans she was addicted to confrontations, especially when she's the one fighting and when it's unarmed combat. I hear you prefer to fight unarmed hmm, maybe we can have a little friendly battle in the future. Quetzalcoatl asked, with a smile. Baldr knew that this dragon queen was quite hyperactive when it came to fighting, perhaps Mrs. Quetzalcoatl, who knows later, said Baldr. Nana, who was with Baldr, was nervous when Quetzalcoatl laid eyes on her. It felt like someone was stepping on her throat and holding her breath. Oh and who is this young woman? Quetzalcoatl asked with an innocent smile. It was then that Nana realized something, Quetzalcoatl wasn't trying to intimidate her, it was Quetzalcoatl's own presence that was making it difficult to maintain her composure. The mere presence of a dragon, one of the dragon kings and one of the main figures in the Aztec pantheon, would make any existence far weaker to be afraid. It was then that Nana felt Baldr pull her closer, and a new sensation came over Nana. A sensation of security. She's a special friend, I invited her to be with me watching Prince Free and my brother Thor, along with my parents, said Baldr. As soon as Quetzalcoatl took her eyes off Nana and turned to look at Baldr when he answered, Nana, seemed to have calmed down more. Quetzalcoatl nodded her head then, but she still seemed to want to talk more. A.H. Thor whom I heard about your brother. Kind of hard not to know who is he, especially after he's won the title of the strongest Norse god. His stories are pretty well known I'd like to meet him soon if it's possible, Quetzalcoatl said with a smile. Baldur remained unchanged. Of course, I'll be sure to tell my brother after the fight is over now if you'll excuse us, we're off, said Baldur, with a polite smile. Quetzalcoatl, whether she sensed Baldur's haste or not, did not show it. F-C-O-U-R-S-E I'm sorry if I'm in the way, I'll withdraw I'll watch the confrontation said Quetzalcoatl, as she started to walk away. But before Quetzalcoatl was far away, Baldr heard her last comment. I have high expectations of your brother, I hope I'm not B-D-I-S-A-P-P-O-I-N-T-E-D, said Quetzalcoatl. When Quetzalcoatl was out of sight, Baldr immediately looked at Nana. Are you alright? Is anything hurt? I'm sorry, I had to congratulate her, I'm the future leader of the Pantheon, and she is the daughter of the leader of the current Aztec Pantheon Mixquitl, as well as being the future ruler, Baldr said hastily. Nana quickly responded to Baldr with a smile. I'm fine Baldr, really come on, the fight will start soon, said Nana. But inside Nana had never been so scared in the presence of someone she'd met for the first time. A short time later the fans of the Valhalla Arena were screaming for their competitors, the fans of the Nordic Pantheon, and the Slavic Pantheon had only one thing in common at that time, they wanted to see their Pantheon win. In the center of the arena, a figure stood out with a trumpet in hand. It was Heimdallr. Although it's not his main task, he has volunteered to be the announcer of the fight. Heimdallr then used his trusty artifact, the Jallerhorn, so that the entire arena could hear him. Heads up! Gods and goddesses and other supernatural beings. Said Heimler once Heimler had caught the audience's attention, the arena fell silent so Heimler could be heard. 
to resolve a dispute over disputed territory, which would at the moment be the archipelago below the Valhalla Arena, between the Slav Pantheon and the Nordic Pantheon. It has been decided that there will be a match between two representatives from each Pantheon in the Valhalla Arena," said Heimdall, in a loud voice. Yaya's shouts of affirmation roared in the arena. Nothing settles a dispute between two Pantheons more than a good fight. Now. I will introduce the fighters," said Heimdaller. Heimdaller then pointed with his left hand towards the gate on his left. The first fighter, representing the Slavic pantheon. As Heimdaller introduced the Slav fighter, a figure could be seen exiting the gate. He is without a doubt one of the strongest gods in the Slavic pantheon. The figure was taking the form of a man carrying a battle axe. He is revered by mortals as the patron of warriors, and the reigning lord of the sky as the god of the storm. The man approached slowly to a small spot, near a rune that was marked on the ground. He is also known for his explosive temper, where his birth was heralded by an earthquake. It was then that the man stopped next to the rune. It's him. The only. The man then looked at the audience that was on the side of the gate from which he emerged, the side that contained the Slav Pantheon crowd, and then raised the axe. Perrin. Yeah. Roared the Slav fans. When the crowd had calmed down, Heimbler then pointed to the gate on his right. And now. Introducing the first representative of the Norse. From the gate on the right side of Heimbler, a figure began to emerge. He is known as the one god of peace of the Norse pantheon. The figure turned out to be free. Adored by mortals for being the deity who represents prosperity, good harvests, and agriculture. In addition to marriages and fertility. Free then stopped next to the rune that was written on the ground. The prince and heir of the Vanner gods. Free then extended his right hand, and in it, a glow began to form when the glow disappeared, there was something in Free's hand. A sword. Free. Yeah. Roared the Nordic crowd. Heimdall remained calm as he bowed briefly to Prince Vanner. Sometime later, Heimdall spoke again. And now. The second representative of the Slavic pantheon. Another man appeared at the same gate that Perrin appeared. Revered as a solar deity. The man walked towards Perrin slowly, and it seemed that the crowd adored him. This is, without doubt, the most beloved god among the entire Slavic pantheon, and by the mortals of Slav territory. The man then stopped beside Perrin. Doesn't matter your opponent. Even if it's winter. This man will burn it without mercy. The man next to Perrin looked bored as if he didn't want to be there. His name is D.A. Bog. Yeah. Roared the Slav fans again. The Slav fans clamored for their representatives. But then, after the Slav crowd had calmed down, Heimler proceeded to present the second and final representative of the Nordic Pantheon. And now the last fighter. Said Heimler, pointing to the gate on his right. The gate was on the same side as the Norse crowd. He is known by many titles. A figure could be seen exiting the gate. Doesn't matter your opponent. This man remains undefeated with his insane strength. The figure was easily the tallest of the combatants, about eight feet. Every step this man took seemed to shake the arena. He is known to be the god of thunder. But make no mistake. The figure turned out to be a man well known to the Norse pantheon. He's called the god of thunder because every time he strikes his target, the roar of thunder will resonate across the sky and beyond. The man was still walking towards free. The one with the title of the strongest Norse god. The man then stopped walking when he reached free's side. The Nordic fans started screaming and clamoring as loudly as possible for the last Nordic representative, as soon as Heimdall routed his name, Thor. Location. Archipelago located at the entrance to the Gulf of Botnia Future Avananma Islands, a land Baltic Sea Valhalla Arena. POV. Third person. After Heimdall finished introducing the representatives of each pantheon, and after the crowd from each pantheon had calmed down, Heimdall immediately proceeded to explain what the battle will be like. All right then regarding the battle, will be very simple. A showdown to the death in the mirror dimension. Death will not be real. But the pain will be so real that it will knock out the defeated one, as soon as he leaves the mirror dimension. Being knocked out for hours, days, weeks or even years. Regarding the weapons that can be used there is no limitation. Regarding the order of the fights, it will be quite simple. Two people will face each other until someone is defeated and expelled from the mirror dimension. The winner of the fight will remain in the mirror dimension until he is defeated, then it means there will be no exchanges of fighters. Explained Heimdall. What Heimdall explained are the most basic and traditional rules of the Valhalla Arena. Basically, the Pantheon's victory will only occur when there are no representatives left. 
During the match, if the winner of the first fight is injured, he will still fight in the next fight, even if he is injured. While Heimbel explained how the confrontation will happen, Free chose that moment to speak with Thor. So who do you think goes first from the Slavs? Asked Free. Thor seemed to think for a moment before answering. Honestly I have no idea. Both are well known as excellent fighters and enjoy a good fight. But, Dabog seems to be a bit lazier, but he's also the most unpredictable according to my father, Dabog has never fought seriously. While Perrin fights Vels every year, mortals have even associated their confrontation with the seasons of the year, Thor said. Thor's answer seemed to discourage Free because he would be fighting experienced fighters, but Free had never fought before. How am I going to be able to beat one of them when I've never fought before? Do you do you have any hints? Asked Free. Thor then looked at Free. A hint? Let's see if you're going to fight Dabog, try to take him down as fast as possible as he doesn't usually fight seriously when he doesn't know the opponent, so you can take advantage of that, but if you fight Perrin? Be more creative said Thor. This seemed to confuse Free a little, what do you mean by creative? Asked Free. Simply put. Don't be so predictable when you're attacking with your weapons, said Thor. It was then, at that moment, Heimbler chose to speak. Very well representatives, choose your first fighter. With the first fighter decided, stand on the rune next to you said Heimdler. It was then that Dabog began to walk towards the Slavic team rune. Meaning the Slavic sun god would be the first fighter. Free then began to speak. So who's going to, Free said, before being interrupted. Thor had pushed Free toward the rune. Good luck my friend, make me proud. Everyone's watching you so no pressure, Thor said with a thumbs up and a small smile. The fighters have been chosen looks like the fighters have been chosen. A piece of advice for fighters. Defeat will only happen when your opponent dies, so be careful. At the sound of my trumpet, you may begin. Said Heimdler. It was then that the runes that Dabog and Free were standing on began to glow until moments later the two fighters were gone. It was then that giant screens began to appear and began broadcasting images from the mirror dimension, so that all people could see the combat. Location. Mirror dimension. POV. Third person. In a clearing, Free could be seen looking for his opponent, although the mirror dimension transported the combatants, they never transported them close to each other. The reason was simple, it would give the person some time to plan to carry out an attack, set traps, or do other things. But in Free's case, it would be to summon their weapons. Very well come on Gullen Bursty, it's time for you to stretch your legs, said Free. It was then that a golden aura manifested from Free's body and took the form of a boar, a boar made of pure energy. The boar, identified as Gullen Bursty, left Free's body and began to solidify itself. A golden-colored boar the size of a rhino was now at Free's side. It was then that a sound resounded throughout the mirror world. A sound of a trumpet. The sound of Jallerhorn. Free, taking the signal, mounted the golden boar. Let's go Gullen Bursty. Said Free. Gullen Bursty roared in response and began to gallop. Free didn't know his opponent's location, so he could only rely on Gullen Bursty's sense of smell, and keep an eye out for anything that gave away his Slavic opponent's location. However someone didn't have the patience to search his opponent in the traditional way. A figure could be seen walking through a forest. The figure was Dabog, who walked slowly through the forest, waiting for something to happen, after the sound of the trumpet announced the start of the confrontation. Sigh apparently, I ended up further away from him than expected well, I'll make it easy for him, then said Dabog. It was then that Dabog began to float and began to fly until he was at the height of the clouds. I just hope he survives this I'd like to stretch myself a bit since I haven't had a decent fight in a while, said Dabog, who then raised his right hand. It was at this moment that a red aura began to emerge from his body, and a small sphere of pure energy, the size of a golf ball, appeared in Dabog's right hand. Meanwhile, Free, who had felt the surge of energy, looked towards the sky. Gullen Bursty. Said Free quickly. Gullen Bursty, who seemed to have understood his master's signal, glowed yellow, before quickly turning into energy, Free then stayed inside Gullen Bursty's ethereal form. Dabog, who was still in the sky, released the small sphere of energy. The sphere appeared to be insignificant to some who were watching from the arena. But all that changed when the sphere hit the ground. An explosion that could be described as catastrophic, appeared at the spot where the sphere fell, painted the sky in red, and caused the earth to shake, and the fire from the explosion spread across the surface of the earth, burning anything in front of it. Reducing the creation to ashes. 
the planet of the mirror dimension, considered a perfect copy of the current Earth with trees and water, had turned into just empty earth things like trees had become mere ashes in the wind, and any source of water had ceased to exist. Da Bog had changed the very landscape of the world. After the explosion happened, Da Bog descended from the sky, and headed towards the yellow dot, that could now be seen from the sky. The yellow dot was Gullen Bursty, who had successfully shielded free from the overwhelming blast. Da Bog as he approached, gave a small smile. Ah! At least you didn't die can we start fighting now? Prince Free? Asked Dabog. Free's answer to Dabog? It was a sword flying towards the Slavic god. Dabog wisely dodged the blade that was aimed at his neck. However, it was not just the sword that Dabog should pay attention to. Bam the Golden Boar, now in solid form, had charged at Dabog and hit him, sending the Slav god flying away, thus opening a gap between the Norse god and the Slavic god. However, when Gullenbursty hits the target, the victim usually ends up with at least a few broken bones. But Dabog looked perfectly fine. There was a red aura around the Slavic god, while his eyes glowed with a crimson color. Want to try again? Asked Dabog, with a mocking smile. Dabog then heard the sound of the wind cutting behind him, causing him to turn around and do something that surprised not only Free, but the arena audience as well. Dabog was holding Sumarbrinder's blade. Now Sumarbrand was known to duel without needing to be wielded by anyone, and its blade was hotter than the surface of the sun. Free, not understanding how Dabog was doing this, spoke in shock. How? Asked Free. Dabog replied while holding Sumarbrander. I'm a solar deity, Prince Free do you really think I can get burned easily? Asked Dabog, with a sarcastic tone. It was then that Dabog noticed Gullen Bursty running towards him. Dabog simply smiled and covered his free hand with a red aura, but he didn't hit Gullenbursty Dabog hit Sumarbrinder. Sumarbrinder was then flung away by the force of the blow, and now Dabog focused on the golden boar. Gullenbursty, while it was the strongest defense free had for being resistant to physical blows as well as immune to magic, had a small problem. The speed. As soon as Gullenbursty got close enough, Dabog just jumped up and ran towards free, with his fist enveloped in a red aura. Free, sensing the onslaught of the Slavic god, stood up and crossed his arms in defense, however bam crack ugh. Squeaked Free. Dabog's fist ended up breaking Free's arms on contact, and sent Free flying towards the nearest mountain, with Free's body showing no signs of stopping until it hit the mountainside. Shit swore Free, cursing as he looked down at his arms, which showed bruises. Don't stare at your wounds until the fight is over. Said Dabog, who had quickly approached Free. As soon as Free heard Dabog's voice, he looked towards the Slavic god, only to realize that Dabog was already in front of him with his fist raised. Sumarbrinder! shouted Free. The sword, Sumarbrinder, shot towards its master and came between the Slavic god's blow and its master in a way to protect him from the blow. You're not going to stop me with this, Free! said Dabog, with a smile. Dabog didn't stop his blow, and when he hit the blade, he slammed his sword into Free's chest. Bam. The force behind the blow was great enough that in addition to creating cracks in the mountain, it made Free spit blood due to some broken ribs. Dabog, who still had his fist outstretched and applying pressure so that the Sumarbrinder was stuck, extended his free hand, which began to emit a red aura, and a sphere of energy soon began to form. You know I hear you also represent daylight. Tell me then, are you fireproof? Asked Dabog, with a sarcastic tone. Dabog intended to shoot the energy sphere at point-blank range. Cough no. But Gullen Bursty is, Free said with a smile while coughing up some blood. It was then that Dabog felt movement behind him, causing him to turn and face Free's other weapon. The magic immune golden boar, the Gullen Bursty. A red aura permeated Dabog's body, as the Slavic god stretched out his hands to stop the boar's onslaught. Where are you looking at? Asked Free. Dabog made a mistake, he had turned his back to his opponent. His opponent had a sword. However, Dabog was not worried about being injured by the sword, as he believed that with his body imbued with the sun's divine energy, the blade could not pierce him. However, that is not what happened. Slash Dabog looked at his chest and saw Sumarbrinder's blade glowing golden. Sumarbrinder had somehow managed to pierce Dabog's body. The Slavic god looked back and saw that Free had one hand extended to the hilt of his sword. Free had imbued Sumarbrinder with his divine power, and empowered the slashing power of the Sumarbrinder sword. The sound of Gullenbursty approaching alerted Dabog, who looked ahead again. 
only for Gullen Bursty to become a structure of pure energy and pass through Da Bog's body smoothly and merge with Free's body again. It was then that Free kicked Sumarbrindra into Da Bog's back, forcing the Slavic god further and sending him flying away from Free. Free then left the mountainside and gave a weary sigh before drawing his sword. Sumarbrindra, said Free. The sword then left Da Bog's inert body and flew towards him and hovered beside him. Pantwell, I guess it's over I guess I should get ready for free started to speak until he was interrupted by a voice. Cough I have to say you have my full attention now, said the voice. Free then looked at Da Bog, who was getting up from the ground. The wound made by Sumarbrindra didn't even seem to bother the Slavic god, who now possessed an intimidating crimson aura, Da Bog wore a smile, in addition to his eyes glowing crimson. Da Bog's smile promised pain. Da Bog then looked at his wound and the state of his clothes, which had been reduced to mere rags after Sumarbrinder's blade had stabbed him and incinerated the much part of his coat, and frowned. The Slavic god then reached out with his right hand and ripped the remaining rags from his coat, showing off his physique and a few tattoos. Da Bog then covered his hand with a red aura that resembled fire, and pressed the wound made by Sumarbrinder, intending to cauterize the wound. The solar deity's flames were strong, but due to Dabog's resistance, it took a while to cauterize the wound. At no time did Dabog show discomfort. When he finished cauterizing the wound, Dabog looked towards Free and flashed a smile again. It's been a while since I've had this much fun. Spit shall we continue? Asked Dabog after he spat out some blood. Dabog didn't give Free time to respond and ran towards the god banner. Go and bursty. Said Free. An aura surged from Free's body, and it took the ethereal form of the boar, Gullenbursti, which then solidified and charged Da Bog. Da Bog didn't even seem bothered when he attacked Gullenbursti. Bam the shockwave was comparable to an earthquake. Da Bog, still grinning, raised another arm ready to strike Gullenbursti again. But then Da Bog noticed movement to his left. Clang Da Bog had blocked Sumarbrinder with his left forearm imbued with divine energy, while he had his right fist pushing Gullenbursti. It was then that Gullenbursti began to slowly push Da Bog. Da Bog applied pressure to his left arm and pushed Sumarbrinder for a while, so he had the opportunity to punch Gullenbursti. I will break your toys, free. So then you can fight most respectfully. With your fists. Shouted Da Bog as he punched Gullenbursti. Bam Gullenbursti stopped pushing Da Bog due to the shock wave. Da Bog then noticed that Sumarbrinder was turning towards him. Then Dabog applied pressure to his arms and pushed Gullenbursti, creating some space to now be able to deal against Sumarbrinder. Dabog imbued his arms with his divine energy and began to block Sumarbrinder's frantic attacks with his forearms and fists. As Dabog defended against Sumarbrinder's attacks, Free looked down at his arms and then said in a low tone. Skibladner, said Free. Meanwhile, Gullenbursti charged again at Dabog, who continued kept defending from Sumarbrinder. Da Bog, who noticed the Gullenbursti attack, looked at Sumarbrinder and smiled with an idea. While Sumarbrinder furiously attacked the Slavic god, Da Bog found an opportunity to grab the blade again. When Gullenbursti got close enough, Da Bog dodged at the last second and forced Sumarbrinder's blade to stab Gullenbursti's right eye, who roared in pain in response. Da Bog just smiled at his achievement and then looked around for Free. However, Free was gone. Are you going to hide now, Banner? You let your weapons fight for you, and now you hide, you are more cowardly than I thought. Shouted Da Bog, while taunting Free to make him report his location. I'm not hiding. Said a voice from above. It was then that Da Bog looked up to the sky and saw a Drakkar. The Drakkar was Free's last weapon, the Skibladner. The Slavic god noticed something different about Free. How did you heal your arms? Asked Da Bog, confused. Free just smiled and flexed his fully healed arms a little. Well, the Skibladner has many functions and things, one of those things would be an internal healing chamber, Free replied. This seemed to outrage Da Bog. This is cheating. Roared Da Bog. Yet Free responded calmly. No, it's not. Don't you remember what they said? Let me remind you then regarding weapons, there is no limitation, and the Skibladner is my weapon, said Free. This seemed to have angered Da Bog even more because his eyes gleamed with fury. Free then continued to speak. But I won't deny it I ran from the fight against you, you only faced my weapons. Well, not anymore said Free. Free then jumped off the dracker towards the ground. Gullenbursti. Assault mode. Said Free. 
Gullenbursty understood his master's command and then ran towards Free, even with a Sumarbrand in his eye. As he approached Free, Gullenbursty then transformed into pure energy, but this time he didn't merge with Free Gullenbursty in his ethereal form, began to envelop the body of the god Vanner. It was then that Free emitted a golden glow that blinded the Da Bog and the arena audience who were watching the fight. When the glow dimmed, Da Bog was the first to look at Free. Free now had tattoos on his body. You said you would make me fight in a more respectful way, which was with my fists, right? Well, you got what you wanted Free said, raising his fists. Location. Archipelago located at the entrance to the Gulf of Bothnia Future Avananma Islands, a land Baltic Sea Valhalla Arena. POV. Third person. During the first fight between the gods of each pantheon, the audience cheered for everything that happened. However, Slavic fans mostly questioned whether it was a fair match, as they felt Prince Free's weapons capabilities gave him a ridiculous advantage, and viewed Prince Vanner's behavior of letting his weapons fight for him as dishonorable. While the arena audience cheered for their respective champion, the Norse god's VIP area was utterly silent. The reason was simple. Free's fusion with Gullenbursty. Njord I didn't know your son could do that who knew he would have that power said Loki, commenting on the turn of events in the match. At the start of the match, the Nordic pantheon agreed on only one thing. Free's performance in the match was mediocre. Everyone thought that Free would, without a doubt, lose the match. Well. At least until Free merged with Gullenbursty. Any comments, Njord? Or are you going to say you didn't know about that? Asked Loki, more insistently. The one who answered the question was not Njord, but Scotty. We knew about that, but we never thought Free would use it, Scotty replied. It was then that Njord spoke. We, the Vanner gods, are associated with nature, and we don't have much raw power difference between us, however that doesn't work with Free because of his weapons. When Free uses his weapons to the fullest, especially the Gullenbursty, he becomes without a doubt the strongest Vanner god, Njord explained. That seemed to have interested Loki. Oh. I don't see anything else besides some new tattoos on your son could you explain further? Asked Loki. It was then that Njord spoke. The tattoos are Gullenbursty basically, Free now has the same abilities and capabilities as Gullenbursty, but Njord trailed off. But what? Asked Loki. The one who answered was Njord's wife. But the price is an insane pain on his body. If the fight goes on too long, Free will have his body so destroyed that he won't be able to lift his arm, said Scotty. During this conversation, Auden remained absolutely silent, but in his mind, he was cursing fate. Auden still remembers a part of a prophecy that haunted his dreams the part? And Beely's bright bane against Surtur. Beely was a young Jodin that Free accidentally killed when he was trying to tame Gullenbursty in Midgard, this, of course, was one of many events that added more firewood to the fire, resulting in Utgard's attempt to rebel the Jodin, Beely, was just four years old when he was killed by an angry Gullenbursty. He was young he was too young. Jimmer, Beely's father, was very angry. And this accident was never forgiven by the Jodin tribe of Jimmer. When Auden saw Free's new tattoo, he only thought of one word bright. The tattoo glowed like it was alive, it was bright like the sun. Auden, as paranoid as he was, believed that Free would use that form to fight against Surtur and die during the fight. Meanwhile, Nana chose that moment to ask Balder. Do you think Thor knew about this, and that's why he sent Free against Dabog? After all, Dabog does not possess any divine weapons. If Free merged with Gullenbursty and got his abilities, then Dabog can only use his fists said Nana. However, Balder didn't even need to think long to answer Nana's question. The way I know my brother so no, he probably didn't know Free can do that. But maybe there's a reason he sent Free first, said Balder. When Balder answered the question, he was looking at the Asgardian crowd, or more specifically, the group of Vanner gods who were cheering more vigorously than the others meanwhile, back in the mirror dimension the fighters, Dabog and Free, remained silent as they faced each other, even Free darted towards Dabog. The Slavic god, surprised by the Norse god's sudden increase in speed, stood up and crossed his arms intending to block Free's punch. But then he noticed that there was a glint in Free's right hand, and his instincts were screaming for him to dodge rather than block, so Dabog chose to dodge, however Dabog had taken too long. Slash Dabog pulled away in time to save most of himself, and looked at the object being held in Free's right hand, shining like the summer sun. It was Sumarbrinder. It was then that Dabog remembered that when Gullenbursty was merging with Free, the sword was still stabbed into the boar's eye. 
Davod Ben looked at his left arm and grimaced. There was no more left arm. All that remained was a stump. Davod then covered his right hand with magic to cauterize the wound, but Free did not allow Davod to stanch the blood. After all he didn't have much time. As soon as Davod noticed Free's sudden movement, he put his wound aside and concentrated on the fight. The next few minutes consisted of Free swinging his sword, Sumarbrindr, while Davod did his best to dodge. It was then that Davod kicked Free in the stomach at the first opportunity, so that there was a distance between the gods. Dabog was tired. The Slavic god was recognized by his people in combat for his strength and power, as well as his high pain tolerance. However, in this specific situation, Dabog had been injured earlier by stupidity. He's been stabbed in the chest by Sumarbrinder before because he made the mistake of not fighting seriously. Dabog may have cauterized the wound, but that didn't mean there would be no consequences. Dabog knew it wouldn't last long, mainly because he was still fighting, his physical condition was slowly dropping. However he noticed that Free's strength and speed were also decreasing. I think this fight lasted long enough, don't you think Prince Free? Asked Dabog, with a smile. Free didn't answer and ran towards Dabog. However, Dabog chose to summon his divine power and created a storm of flames. A tornado made of giant scarlet flames, made the sky red once more. However slash the tornado had been stopped as it was cut by Free Sword, the Sumarbrinder. However, it was never Dabog's intention to harm Free with magic, as he knew it would be useless. Bam Dabog had conjured the tornado to distract Prince Vanner, then took the opportunity to punch Free in the back of the neck. But, while Free was sent flying away due to the force of the blow, Free seemed to be perfectly fine. Free then darted towards Dabog and hurled Sumarbrinder. Dabog, realizing that the Sumarbrinder had lost its luster, coated his body to prevent the blade from piercing him once more. But Sumarbrinder wasn't looking to stab Dabog. What the said Dabog, surprised. Sumarbrinder was blocking Dabog's view with its blade. And Free took advantage of Dabog's lack of vision, and punched the Slavic god in the chest. Bam, ak, said Dabog. As soon as Dabog received the blow, he was sent away, but Free's attack didn't stop there. While Dabog was flying away, Sumarbrand had dashed towards the Slavic god's chest area, where his heart was. But when the blade struck, it failed to stab Dabog, who had conjured up his divine aura to protect himself from the sword. However, as soon as Dabog reached the mountain, Free appeared in front of Dabog, with his right hand extended towards Sumarbrinder. Slash as Free grabbed the sword's hilt, Sumarbrinder glowed once more and pierced the Slavic god's heart. Cough well you don't seem very talkative now cough it was a good fight Vanner, maybe I'll ask for a rematch in the future cough. And I won't make the same mistake of not fighting against you seriously, said Dabog, with a small smile. Free didn't respond and just turned and shoved the Sumarbrinder deeper into Dabog's chest. Pant it's over arg, said Free. As soon as Free said these words, his right arm, which was holding the Sumarbrinder sword, began to leak blood in places. The reason was clear, some veins in Free's right arm had burst from the pressure Free's body was feeling at the moment. The combination of Free and his boar, the Gullen Bursty, gave the god Vanner a new power, but the pressure it put on his body, in the long run, was insane. Making a comparison, it would be like a crocodile's bite on every part of a mortal's body. Basically, what Free's body was going through was simple, his bones were cracking and his muscles were tearing. Free knew he couldn't delay, he then looked at Dabog, and noticed that the Slavic god's body began to glow, it only meant one thing Free had won. But it was not the time to celebrate. Skudbladner, said Free. Free's flying ship appeared in the sky again, and began to descend towards the god Vanner. But once Free takes the first step crack arg, Free cursed falling to the floor. Free then looked at the cause of his fall, which turned out to be his left leg, which was now leaking blood, as well as being broken, just like his right arm. Free then got up and started to limp towards the Skibladner. I don't have time for this I need to get in the healing chamber before said Free, until he was interrupted by a sound. A sound Free knew all too well, it was the sound of Jallerhorn. The new game had begun. It was then that Free heard something else just after the sound of Heimbler's trumpet. Boom it was a shock wave. Free then looked up to the sky and saw something he would never forget. It looked like a small meteor and it was heading towards Skibladner. Bam when the meteor hit Skibladner, it pushed the flying ship downwards, making Skibladner fall from the sky by the force of the hit. 
As soon as the Skidbladner hit the ground, there was an explosion that pushed Free and made him fall to the ground. When Free tried to get up, he only saw a figure emerging from the wreckage of Skidbladner. It was Perrin. Well, I have to congratulate you Vanner after all, just a few beings can make Dabog fight seriously, besides beating him. But I wonder if the result would have been different if Dabog hadn't been injured by your sword, before starting to take the fight more seriously hmm I suppose we'll never know, at least not now. By the way, I'm different from Dabog when I fight, I fight to kill, said Perrin. It was then that Perrin charged at Free who had not yet left the ground. Sumar Brinder. Shouted Free. The Summer Sword then lunged at Perrin, who just smiled and raised his battle axe. Perrin then proceeded to defend against Sumarbrinder with his battle axe. The Slavic god, one of the three members of the Triglav, knew that, unlike Dabog, Sumarbrinder's blade could burn him much more easily, so he couldn't just grab Sumarbrinder's blade, just like Dabog did, without suffering burns. However, Perrin also knew that Sumarbrinder was one of Free's main weapons, and with the Skibladner destroyed, Free was now reduced to just two powerful weapons. For someone who is very reliant on his weapons, this is a huge detriment to Free. If Free loses Sumarbrinder, then only the Golden Boar, the Golden Bursty, remains. Perrin just smiled as he blocked Sumarbrinder's blade a few more times, until he applied pressure and pushed the Summer Sword away, and then the Slavic God did something that surprised both Free and the Norse audience. The battle axe glowed yellow and began to change. When the glow stopped, Perrin was no longer wielding an axe, Perrin was now wielding a bow. This confused some of the Norse audience because the Slavic god didn't have any arrow quivers or anything like that. It was then that Perrin pulled the string of the bow, and then an arrow made of a golden colored lightning bolt appeared. When Perrin released the arrow, he did not aim it free, but it sumarbur into the arrow made of pure lightning, then began to split in midair. Now, instead of one arrow, at least a hundred arrows were heading towards Sumarbrinder. However, the arrows did not hit the Sumarbrinder, in fact, the arrows began to form a kind of cage, which trapped Sumarbrinder. Perrin, seeing the result, smiled. I knew your sword would be a bit of a nuisance, but it seems it can't cut magic easily without your help. Now, where were we? Oh yeah, said Perrin, after thinking for a while. Perrin then started walking towards Free who was on the ground still struggling to get up. Free couldn't get up anymore, because now not only was his left leg broken, his right leg was broken right after the impact that Skidbladner caused when he fell to the ground. When Perrin got close enough to Prince Vanner, he then placed his left foot on Free's chest, and began to apply pressure. Arg! Call Fug! said Free, cursing his bruised body. Perrin, seeing Prince Vanner's plight, smiled in response. Oh! I didn't apply much force maybe your body wants to give up? Well, if that's the case, just say you give up, free. I won't judge you, after all, Dabog is one of the strongest beings in my pantheon, but then again, if you don't say you give up I will apply pressure to your chest until your ribs puncture your lung, and you start breathing blood said Perrin. When Perrin didn't get an answer from free, he just shrugged. Well, if that's what you want, so be it, said Perrin. It was then that Perrin started stomping harder on Free's chest, who didn't say anything until a sound resounded in the air. Crack, arg. Free cursed. Free's ribsage, already crippled from his fight with Dabog, finished giving in due to Perrin's strength. Some ribs had punctured the lungs of the god Vanner, who began coughing up blood in response. Oh. I see you're already at your limit. Do you want to give up now? Asked Perrin, unchanged. For Perrin, what Free was doing was something the Slavic god could respect, a god's pride can be easily hurt, so a strong god should never ask for mercy. It was then that Perrin realized that Free had responded weakly, it was then that Perrin stopped applying pressure. What did you say? Perrin asked, with a look of disappointment. Free then coughed up some blood, and he smiled. I said you talk too much. Said Free. Free then used his left hand to grab Perrin's foot. Gullen Bursty shouted Free. Free's tattoos responded to Free's call and began to transform into pure energy, and then left Free's body, settling at some distance from the two gods, but there was something different about the boar. He was brighter than usual. Just a few seconds later, Free's boar charged Perrin with unprecedented speed. Well that was a stupid decision on your part, said Perrin. Perrin then applied even more pressure to his foot, and stomped harder on Free's chest. The noises of bones breaking could be heard. But Free didn't flinch and kept his smile as he held Perrin's foot as best he could. 
What Free was doing was simple he knew he couldn't go up against Perrin in a fight, so his weapons were more important at this time. The Golenbursti, however slow it was, had the highest attack power at the moment. It was then that Free made a decision he must hold Perrin in order for Golenbursti to succeed in his attack. Free didn't know if Perrin was physically stronger than Dabog, but Free didn't think he had many attack options with his body practically destroying itself with the slightest movement, and Sumarbranid were trapped in a cage made of lightning, Free felt that Golenbursti's blow would be his best chance to, somehow, hurt the Slavic god. So Free used most of his godly power and transferred it to Golenbursti, so that not only did he increase his attack power, but his speed as well. Don't get wrong, Free knew he couldn't win against Perrin what Free was doing at the moment was harming his opponent as much as he could, so that Thor would get the upper hand in their fight. But then something happened. The bow that Perrin was wielding began to glow again and turned into a golden shield with some silver accents. Perrin then raised his shield just as Golenbursti was about to hit him. The collision looked like a new earthquake that caused a giant dust cloud and shook the earth, creating cracks in the ground and nearby mountains. Several minutes passed before the dust settled, so that the arena audience could see the result. The result was a heavy hit to the Norse pantheon. Perrin remained unperturbed in his position as he stomped on Free's chest, and his shield effortlessly blocked Gullenbursti. All this time Perrin was looking at Free's eyes. As I said before, it was a stupid decision. You failed, Perrin said with a smile as he lifted his foot from Free's chest. But as soon as Perrin lifted his foot, yellow lightning flashed across his raised leg. Golenbursti, realizing what the Slavic god was about to do to his master, roared in response as he tried to push harder in an attempt to stop or at least get Perrin's attention. But Golenbursti's attempt was unsuccessful. Perrin just ignored the boar. Perrin seemed to find Golenbursti just a nuisance. Free, who had let go of Perrin's foot due to the loss of his strength, only said one thing. My bad Thor said, Free. Perrin then stomped on Free again, but the Slavic god didn't aim at his chest. The Slavic god aimed for the head of the god Vanner. As soon as Perrin's foot collided with Free's head, the ground shook once more with an earthquake shortly after, Free's body began to glow. Free was defeated. Golenbursti, Sumarbrindr, and the rest of the Skibladner wreckage began to glow as well. And so, it was the Asgardian defeat. Perrin then looked towards the sky and waited. The sound of Heimdall's trumpet once again resounded through the mirror dimension. Meaning the start of the third and final fight. Perrin was excited to fight. The Slavic god then shouted towards the sky, his voice roaring like thunder. Come to me son of Odin. May our battle resound through the sky. Ha 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 ha. Laughed Perrin. Perrin's shield then glowed and turned into his battle axe. The representative god of the Slavic pantheon then raised his axe and shot a lightning bolt imbued with spellcasting magic towards the sky. What was Perrin conjuring up? A storm. A storm that was slowly covering the world. Due to Perrin's spellcasting magic, charged clouds began to form in the sky, and lightning struck the land, as well as creating tornadoes across the planet. But then another voice that, like Perrin, resounded like thunder, was heard by Perrin and the arena audience. Your axe may even create storms in the sky, but mine Jolner is the sky devourer. Roared the voice. It was then that Perrin, as well as the audience in the arena, was surprised by something. Whoosh some force had split the sky in half. It was then that a figure, wielding a hammer in its right hand, could be seen slowly approaching Perrin. Who was the figure? It was Thor. Weren't you laughing a little while ago? Why are you looking so serious now? Asked Thor, as he looked into Perrin's face. Perrin wasn't laughing or smiling anymore he was shaking. The Slavic god at that moment, after this display of the son of Odin, knew that he must put forth effort in his fight against this man. If Perrin was shaking so he was scared? Not exactly. Perrin wasn't feeling afraid quite the opposite. His instinct screamed at that moment. Perrin had found a new worthy opponent in addition to his rival Vels. Perrin's body was shaking, not with fear but with joy. May our battle be considered legendary even by the deities roared Perrin. As soon as Perrin finished that sentence he charged at Thor with a new smile plastered on his face. A smile of happiness. Location. Archipelago located at the entrance to the Gulf of Bothnia future Avananma Islands, a land Baltic Sea Valhalla Arena mirror dimension. POV. Third person. When Perrin got close to Thor, he raised his axe and swung it in a single motion that sliced through the air, aiming his powerful blow at the Norse god's neck, with the intent of decapitating him. 
However, just as the Slavic god's axe was ready to strike Thor, the Norse god raised his Mjolnir to block Perrin's blow. When Mjolnir blocked Perrin's axe blow, a shockwave followed, cracking the ground in the process and causing an earthquake. During this entire moment, Perrin had a happy smile on his face. Why was Perrin happy? He believed he had found another opponent worthy to fight besides Vals. However, Thor was not smiling. Right after Thor blocked Perrin's attack, the Norse god applied pressure and pushed the Slavic god with his Mjolnir. Perrin was surprised by the force exerted by the Norse god, and he just grinned even bigger. Finally. Someone besides Vals who can be my rival. Said Perrin, with an excited smile. Thor, hearing what Perrin had said was confused. Rival? Asked Thor. Thor didn't understand Perrin's statement for a simple reason, Thor didn't see Perrin as a rival. For the Norse god, his training served to put him on a different level of power from other gods, the main reason for this was because, over the years, Thor acquired knowledge about gods that were much more powerful than other gods. A good example? The Hindu pantheon. Only three gods from this pantheon caught Thor's attention, these three gods made up the Trimurti, the famous Hindu trinity. But these three gods were on a completely different level from the rest of their pantheon. When Thor discovered such gods and some of their capabilities, he became more increasingly focused on his training. However, Thor hadn't fought any god seriously until now. The reason was very simple no god that Thor had ever encountered, had been able to get Thor's attention. Thor's biggest challenge so far was his fight in Utgard's castle. And even during the confrontation at the castle of Utgard, Thor had not, at any time, removed his restraints. His gauntlets, called Jarngreeper, absorbed most of the weight of his blow. And his belt, called Majingjurd, served as an enhanced gravity belt, where only Thor would feel the weight difference, and nothing but Thor's body would be affected by the weight change. Basically, Thor could feel to weigh the same as a mountain, and sit in a wooden chair, and the chair wouldn't break because the chair would only be supporting Thor's weight without his belt. Also, Mjolnir had not awakened during their fight in Utgard's castle, in fact, Mjolnir has been sleeping since Thor started to wield it. Mjolnir was a sleepyhead. Thor's confusion was that Perrin called him a rival, but Perrin hadn't made Thor remove his restraints. Basically, Perrin claimed to be Thor's rival, unaware of the Norse god's power. Well, at least Thor couldn't question Perrin's self-confidence in his power. However, Thor was also somewhat annoyed by Perrin's fight against Free. Perrin had made Free suffer and only then submitted him. It was time for retribution. Thor then activated his lightning armor and ran towards Perrin. The Slavic god's instinct screamed as the son of Odin disappeared from his side in a burst of speed, Perrin then turned his axe into a shield, and raised it to protect him. Perrin's battle instincts had saved him. Boom a shockwave resounded through the skies and cracked the earth. As Thor's hammer hit Perrin's shield, the earth shook with a blow. Thor, impressed by the shield's strength, couldn't help but comment. Interesting weapon but if that's all you've got, it won't do you much good, said Thor. Thor had in mind that his lightning nature divine power wouldn't be very effective, because he was facing another deity with his lightning association. The most efficient attack turned out to be the more traditional form. Pure brute force. Thor then distanced himself from the Slavic god, and then did something that surprised the Slavic god, as well as the Valhalla Arena audience. Thor placed the Mjolnir on the ground. The Norse god didn't drop his weapon, he carefully placed it on the ground, as if Mjolnir was made of a fragile material. The truth was the opposite. It wasn't Mjolnir that was fragile. But the ground. It was then that Thor chose to comment. Well, what are you waiting for? Come on, said Thor. Perrin was irritated. You drop your weapon and want to keep fighting, do you dishonor me in such a way son of Odin? Asked Perrin, shouting. Perrin was angry because his opponent had willingly given up using his weapon, and wanted to fight unarmed against him, who was wielding his weapon. That was an insult. Because now it looked like Thor didn't need a weapon to fight Perrin. Well, make me regret my decision then, said Thor, shrugging. This seemed to hit the nerve of Perrin, because the Slavic god turned his shield into his axe again, and hurled it at the Norse god. Thor remained unaffected as he dodged the axe, letting it pass harmlessly. Perrin just watched the Norse god with a knowing gaze. Only a few seconds passed, and then Thor heard a sound coming towards his back, it sounded like something approaching at high speed. As soon as the sound got louder Thor extended his hand, and Mjolnir flew off the ground and went towards his hand. Thor then swung Mjolnir as he turned towards the approaching thing. The thing was Perrin's axe. 
it was then that Thor slammed Jolner into the axe, creating a new shock wave. Vampiren's axe hit the ground and raised a giant dust cloud that blocked the view of the Slavic god and the Valhalla Arena audience. It was then that Perrin reached out his hand and tried to call his weapon back into his hands. But nothing happened. Perrin felt that his weapon was somehow not responding. It was then that the cloud of dust dissipated and Perrin saw what had happened. His axe was on the ground, and on top of it was Mjolnir. Mjolnir was preventing his weapon from returning to his hands. Well, now that we're unarmed do you still consider it an insult? Asked Thor, who was beside Mjolnir. Perrin saw Ed. Whether or not Thor noticed Perrin's rising anger, he didn't show it, and just placed his hands on his hips with his elbows bent and remained standing in place. As if inviting Perrin to attack. With a war cry, the Slavic god then ran towards Thor. Bam 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 dot. Perrin had landed a string of consecutive blows on Thor, with each blow that struck the Norse god an earthquake was created. The Slavic god continued punching Thor with a speed and power well known to many pantheons. Each blow from Perrin seemed to create an earthquake. This was the result of the fearsome rage of the Slavic god. Perrin continued to punch even as Thor's coat was turned into mere rags. After several minutes Perrin stopped punching as his anger wore off, and then he realized the Norse god state. Thor had blood all over his face and chest, his white coat had turned to rags. The Norse god now had a smile on his face. Oh. Why did you stop? Did you finally notice the state of your hands? Asked Thor. Perrin, who had calmed down, noticed a pain in his hands, and when he looked he was startled by the result. Perrin's hands they were badly injured. Some of his fingers were broken and there were cuts along his wrists. Well I guess it's my turn now, said Thor. As soon as Perrin heard Thor, he took his attention from his hands and looked toward the Norse god. Thor had both of his arms raised to his sides, his hands open. It was then that Thor simultaneously attacked Perrin's ears with a quick powerful slap. Bam the force of the blow was so great that it cracked the ground around Thor and Perrin, causing the earth to shake. As soon as Thor hit Perrin, the Slavic god's ears spurted blood, and Perrin's eyes seemed to have lost focus. Perrin's body then fell backward, as if the Slavic god had lost his sense of balance. When the Slavic god fell to the ground Thor waited for an answer. For a long time, Thor remained looking at the body of the Slavic god, until the son of Odin finally commented. Sai hey. Heimdallr. The match is over. He won't get up. Said Thor looking at the sky. It was then that a voice came from the heavens. While I understand your claim, Prince Thor I'm afraid it's not possible because the Valhalla Arena will only recognize victory with the death of the fighter, said the voice. The voice was Heimdallr, who had used his trumpet, the Jallerhorn, to transmit his voice into the mirror dimension. Thor could only frown. How troublesome, said Thor. The Norse god then walked towards Perrin, who was still lying on the ground and looked into the Slavic god's eyes. Thor, realizing that the Slavic god was conscious only commented. Well, I won't deny it, you're a tough guy, it's a shame you can't fight properly at the moment. I think I overdid it again, you probably can't lift any fingers right now in fact, I don't think you can even hear me now Sai said Thor. Thor then lifted his foot. Thor will finish Perrin the same way the Slavic god finished Prince Free. I'd like to say it was an exciting fight but I'd be lying, said Thor. Thor then lowered his foot and stomped on Perrin's head. As soon as Thor's foot hit the Slavic god the earth shook one last time. It was then that the sound of Jallerhorn resounded across the sky once more. But this time, Heimler's magical artifact wasn't heralding the start of another match, Jallerhorn announced the end of the combat, and the victory of the Pantheon, that still had some living representative. The victory went to the Nordic Pantheon, and the prize was the Archipelago. At that moment Thor, as much as he won, didn't seem to be satisfied with the result. Thor looked disappointed. Sigh well, it's time to go home said Thor, when he noticed that him, as well as Perrin's body, began to glow. When Thor returned to the Valhalla Arena rune, Free's body lay beside him lying on the floor unconscious, the pair of Norse's gods was greeted by vigorous cheers from the Nordic crowd, and respectful applause from the Slavic crowd. But when Thor looked toward the audience, he noticed that most of the applause was accompanied by fearful looks in his direction. There were only a few in the audience who didn't show fear when they looked at Thor, who were some of these people? Well woohoo did you see that, shitheads that guy was my student. Shouted Iguna, the half-dwarf who taught Thor how to forge, to the rest of the Norse crowd. Iguna. Be more honorable, besides that, Prince Free also deserves credit for his performance and determination in battle. Said Ragnar, 
husband of Idhuna. Idhuna seemed to have the decency to be a little embarrassed, but then she replied. Yes, yes, the Vanner did a good job too, but it was my student who asserted dominance. Ha 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 ha! Shouted Idhuna, raising her arms and laughing in victory. Sigh I can only be glad that our daughter is not a copy of you Ragnar said, sighing in defeat. I always knew you got this, big guy. Woohoo! Screamed Sif. Idhuna then looked at her husband with a knowing smile. What were you saying? Asked Idhuna in an innocent tone. At least she's not always like you, Ragnar said. This seemed to have angered Idhuna. Want to sleep on the floor today? Asked Idhuna. Ragnar looked unperturbed. If you kick me out I'll get rid of our bed so you can sleep with me on the cold floor, maybe we even have to warm up to sleep since the floor is cold. How does that sound to you? Ragnar said with a small smile to his wife. Idhuna looked irritated but had a small smile. Sounds. Good, said Idhuna, her face a little flushed. Sif, who had overheard her parents' shameless flirtation, looked at the couple a little enviously. Sif, deep down, wants to have a happy marriage, just like her parents' marriage. Sif then looked at her parents, and then looked at Thor again in the arena, who could be seen carrying free on his shoulder towards the gate on the Nordic side. Maybe. Maybe someday? Asked Sif, in a hopeful tone, to herself. Six months had passed after the confrontation with the Slavic pantheon, Thor was currently in his home in Midgard, reflecting on what he could do. Don't get me wrong, Thor liked a little peace, but the more years passed, the more the boredom was noticeable. Thor only had a few things that kept him busy training and forging. The commemorative dates, as well as his Christmas, were also good distractions, however, they didn't take up much of his time, as they were just a few dates throughout the year. Sigh what to do? Asked Thor. It was then that someone caught Thor's attention. Cousin. The thing you call jacuzzi is amazing. I never knew that, ah? Uh? Something wrong? Asked Hel. The Queen of the Norse Underworld came to visit her favorite cousin today, and was invited to be the first person to enjoy a new object that Thor built in his spare time. A jacuzzi. Thor seeing the concern in Hel's eyes, just smiled. It's nothing cousin, I'm just thinking about a few things it's nothing major, so don't worry, said Thor. Hel didn't seem to truly believe her cousin, so she decided to do her best to distract Thor. Let's go then. You built it, so you should use that jacuzzi too. Maybe we can play that game you taught me while we chill, what was the name again? Ma. Chess. Let's go cousin. Said Hel, as she grabbed Thor's hand and pulled him to the place where the jacuzzi was. Thor seemed to be amused by his cousin's insistence, but inside his mind, the question still lingered. What to do now to assuage your boredom? At the moment Thor didn't know, but he had a feeling he would soon find his answer. Location. Asgard Healing Chamber. Within one wing of the main Asgardian castle, there was an area reserved for healing and recovery from injuries. The beds appeared to be made of iron, and had runes that glowed a steady green, as long as someone was lying on them. This was the case with Prince Free. Prince Vanner had been lying in the healing chamber for six months with no sign of awakening. The person who stood by Prince Vanner's side was his sister Freja. Princess Freja hadn't stopped visiting her brother since he was hospitalized after fighting the Slavic pantheon. Other people also visited, and one of them was Thor, who at least once every three days visited his knocked-out friend. While Thor would have liked to help, he knew what Free was going through was just mental stress after the fight. In short, Free just needed a long rest to mentally recover, and only then wake up. And after six months, the day finally arrived. Freja was sitting reading a parchment in particular in extreme concentration when something caught her eye. Ugh, said a voice. Freja looked towards the voice and noticed its source. Free had awakened. Brother. Said Freja, in a happy tone. Freja then immediately dropped the parchment on the floor and hugged her brother who was getting up from the bed. The parchment Freja was reading could only be readable by the title. What was the title? Well he didn't look at me with lust? How? Written by Inanna, Sumerian goddess of love, eroticism, fecundity, and fertility. It was then that Free, noticing his sister's hug, returned the hug with a tired smile. Oh. If I am receiving a warm hug from my beloved sister, then I have done something extraordinary. Said Free with a smile. Freja then separated from Free, with a smile on her face. And you made Free our people now trust you. You show them your determination and strength to win, I know you went into this fight just to preserve my freedom over love, I thank you for that, but during the fight, I know you were fighting not just for me. Dot said Freja, looking at her brother. 
Free looked embarrassed. I think Thor opened my eyes. I think I needed to hear what my friend had to say, Free said. As soon as Free made that comment, he noticed a change in his sister's face. Yes Thor by the way, how long have you been friends with Thor? Are you very close? Freja asked, her tone carefree. These two questions rang like warning bells in Free's mind. Freja did something go wrong between you and Thor while I was knocked out? Asked Free suspiciously. Freja looked away from Free and then spoke. No, nothing wrong happened, I'm just interested? Freja replied uncertainly. However, one word Freja spoke, turned the warning bells in Free's mind into warning alarms, that sounded like Jallerhorn again. The word that made Free alert? Interested. Interested. It was then that Free spoke. Freja could. You tell me exactly what you want to know about Thor? Ask Free. Location. Asgard Valhalla. Year. 3750 BC Thor age. 250 years. POV. Third person. The leader of the Norse pantheon, Odin, was in the Hall of Valhalla, welcoming the new Einar Jar who had just emerged from the turbulent river of reincarnation, the Joel, and had been chosen by Valgrind, Valhalla's main outer gate, to the souls become the army of one, known as Einar Jar. Odin was seated along with his wife Frigg, and the presence of some gods in the hall, watching the small group of men and women who looked around confused. Greetings, noble warriors, said Odin extending his arms. As soon as Odin spoke, he caught the attention of the small group. I am Odin, your host, and the person in charge of this ballroom you are in, explained Odin. When Odin said his name, all of the small group of newly named Einar Jar knelt before the Norse god. Even though there wasn't much interaction between gods and mortals, legends perpetuated among mortals about some gods, Odin was one of those gods. One of the most famous legends? Legends said that Odin was the god who, with the help of his two brothers, created the human race. And of course. There was another legend about Odin and his brothers. The murder of the primordial Jodan Emer, by the young Odin and his two brothers, Vili and V, resulted in the greatest flood the world has ever seen told in the stories by their parents. And that during that fight, Odin's brothers ended up dying in battle. Rise, noble warriors, you've earned your rightful place here. But I'm afraid I have to warn you, said Odin, with a serious tone. As soon as the group stopped kneeling, Odin proceeded to speak while summoning an illusion rune, which in modern times would be comparable to the hologram. What the rune showed startled most of the newly Einar Jar group. Creatures, made of fire and magma roared in fury. There were thousands of these creatures. It was then that the rune's image shifted focus, and showed something worse. A being. A monster. Sitting on a throne and wielding a sword that appeared to be a mixture of black steel and magma, was a creature that could be described as imposing. The creature looked more like a statue. But just by looking at it, the newly Einar Jar began to get the feeling that was always present in humans, since the beginning of their creation. Fear. The feeling that made humans survive due to instilling their self-preserving instinct. It was then that Odin dissipated the image that the rune showed. I know you are afraid, and many of you must be wondering what that was. But don't worry, I will explain said Odin. The newly Einar Jar then awaits the Norse god's explanation. That thing it's called Surtur, and it has only one purpose to burn all existence to the point of no more life, the creatures you saw at the beginning before you saw Surtur, are the children of that thing, and share similar thoughts to their father. Valhalla chose you, those who fought to the death, because you are the most worthy and promising to help us stop this monster, said Odin. It was then that a newly Einar Jar raised his hand as if he wanted permission to ask a question. Odin nodded and motioned for the newly Einar Jar to ask his question. I don't mean to be disrespectful Lord Odin. But how are we who are only mortals even able to help against such monsters? Even the children of that thing are the greatest things I've ever seen. They're even bigger than the biggest moose I've ever hunted. Said the new Einar Jar. This made the group of newly Einar Jar doubtful. How could they help? The way the runes showed the situation, they would just be sacrificed during battle. I understand your growing doubt, but I wouldn't ask for your weapons if I didn't see the need, and as soon as you set foot in this hall, your bodies are at their physical peak, you're stronger now than you are alive, and some of you have a hidden talent for things like rune magic, the same magic I did just now. So I tell you not to underestimate yourself because now you are given the power to fight once more, the question is do you wish to fight one last time? Asked Odin seriously. Some newly Einar Jar still had their doubts. What happens if we refuse? Asked a newly Einar Jar woman, after raising her hand. Odin looked at her and sighed. Sigh I won't make you fight one more time. 
Whoever refuses my request will be sent out of Valhalla through the main gate, the Valgrind, and will be back in the River Gjol, so that he ends up reincarnated to live a mortal life again, or end up a slave to his own honor, who will fight until wither against anything that moves, explained Aden. The woman, who had asked the question, didn't like the answer at all. Because the answer basically said, either you fight for me or you can either be immortal again and die again or, in the worst case scenario, you will transform into something else that appeared to be an eternal warrior without any thinking ability. The newly Einarjar then looked at each other and nodded. It was then that the newly Einarjar knelt once more and proclaimed to Aden. Our weapons are yours. A short time later, after the newly Einarjar had left to feel in, Frigg began talking to Aden. I never like it when you do that Frigg said, looking toward the group of newly Einarjar. Frigg was referring to the choices or, to be more specific, the lack of choices that mortals had. Sai I know you don't like it said, my love. When I returned from my encounter with the Norns, I was warned that Surdra and his children will kill many of us in the last confrontation, and our best chance of survival for not only our race, but of all nine kingdoms subordinate to us, it is if we have beings and soldiers capable of fighting, so that only then we can survive Ragnarok, after all. The number of Surdra's children are growing every year, we can't turn down potential soldiers, said Aden. Aden, after hearing the prophecy of the Norns, who were the agents of fate, was never the same. The Ragnarok. The fate of the gods. It will be the biggest showdown your pantheon will have. But, Aden didn't have all the prophecy, because the Norns knew that if Aden had all the prophecy, the Norse god would do anything to prevent such a fate. That's why the Norns only spoke what was necessary, so that Aden would never change Ragnarok. A good example of what the Norns said to Aden? He would fight and fall against the wolf of the end, which will tear the sky. This led Aden to paranoia against Loki's children. Aden then chose to isolate each of Loki's children in one location, with Fenrir being chained. However what Aden didn't know was that he ended up doing exactly what fate wanted for the Ragnarok happen. For fate, Ragnarok must happen. Location. Land of the Dead Third Root of Yggdrasil near the well of Virgelmer home of the Agents of Fate. The Norns. Beings that were responsible for dictating the destiny of each living being within their territory of influence. Beings that served an existence so ancient that it was said to be the creation of the dream. Destiny itself. The Norns, as agents of destiny, had the function of weaving the destiny of gods and men, and watching over the fulfillment and conservation of the laws that govern the realities of the people they were responsible for. Generally, Norns have full knowledge of the fate of every being in the Nordic pantheon, because everyone's fate was woven and therefore immutable. Or at least. That's what they thought. What is happening? This thread is getting in the way of all the tapestry. It's all messed up. See sisters. The future has been changed again. Said a woman. That woman was Verdandi, the watcher of the present. And she had noticed a problem in the tapestry. The thread was changing what was going to happen for some time, the thread was young about 250 years to be precise. It was then that Erdur, the guardian of the past began to say. This is terrible this thread has altered the present, and now the future is all messed up or altered, said Erdur, surveying the tapestry. Verdandi then looked at her other sister, who looked like a scared little girl in trance, the little girl was the guardian of the future, Skuld. There was something that was standard knowledge about fate if one changes the future, Fate will unconsciously do everything to bring it into balance. Destiny is like a balance between good and evil, there will always be a balance. Somehow. The thread that changed the fate of other threads ended up changing everything. Including the power of a being that was represented by a particular thread. Sister is it so bad? Asked for Dandy, looking worriedly at her sister. Skuld seemed to have woken up from her trance. Surtur will awaken later than scheduled to be more exact. 4286 years from now, but he will be stronger. Much stronger easily one of ten existences, probably in fifth place, Skuld said. This seemed to frighten the other two Norns. The top ten of the strongest existence is a classification completely reserved for only a few beings. Although the name is the ten strongest existences a single position was shared by beings of same level. A good example was the first position. The only position that hadn't changed since the creation of the universe. The position was shared by only two beings. The infinite. And the dream. The two oldest beings as well as the most powerful. The top ten of the strongest stocks was truly a ranking of another level. Even several gods and some primordials were not in that classification. But. 4286 years from now, there will be a new being that will share the fifth position of the top ten of the strongest existences. 
Surtur, the twilight of the gods. What will we do? Asked Erdur. The Norns looked disconcerted, after all, fate had never changed so much. I think that we should remake the tapestry according to this new thread, Skuld said. This seemed to have irritated the Watcher of the present. What? What do you mean by according to this new thread? We are agents of fate, we do not have a thread as a guide, we weave the past, present, and future of each thread impartially, we cannot have a favorite thread to guide us, said Verdandi. Verdandi strictly followed the first rule of the agents of fate. Be impartial. Sister, if we don't do this, the thread will just mess everything up again. Said Skuld. Skuld, on the other hand, defended another rule of the agents of fate. Preserving the future in the best way possible. Enough of you too. Shouted Urdur to the guardian of the past. The guardian of the past defended another rule of the agents of fate. Follow the rules of reality. We will first see what this thread will do, and we will weave according to it. Let me finish talking Verdandi. Said Urdur looking at Verdandi, who looked outraged and ready to complain. But Verdandi remained silent after Urdur stopped her. As I was saying. We will weave according to the thread, but it will not be favoritism, we will leave the path of the thread free, and we will correct the rest by making the necessary changes so fate can adapt again, does anyone want to complain now? Said Erdur. This seemed to have calmed the other two Norns. Do you think Erdur will be enough? Asked Verdandi. Erdur thought for a moment before answering. No I don't think it's enough to fix it. If I'm right, then I don't see any other option we'll have to summon this rebel threat here, so we can use Skuld's ability to see all the probabilities of each future more accurately," said Erdur. The Norns then looked at each other, and seemed to have reached a consensus as they nodded to each other. Location. Asgard Valhalla. The party in the Hall of Valhalla was eternal. Food and drink were never lacking. After all, it was all to feed the army of warriors until the time for the last battle to take place. However, the new Einarjar noticed when the gate guard spoke aloud. All hail Prince Thor, son of Odin, said the guard. If the new Einarjar were, to sum up, the son of Odin in one word, it would be big. Odin's son was a giant when compared to the other gods, however, some of the more newly formed Einarjar recognized Thor for something else. During the winter solstice, this god could be seen in the sky in his chariot pulled by two goats. And during this period, Thor delivered blessings in the form of food and objects. So Minor Jar, who had seen the god in their last moments of life, before dying in combat, made a point of talking to their sons and daughters, about the day that was the winter solstice. Thor was loved by mortals. While the Einar Jar admired Thor, the red-haired Norse god only gave a nod of acknowledgement, as he headed towards the head table, where Odin sat. Old man I will travel, said Thor. This seemed to have taken the head table by surprise. What do you mean by travel, my son? Asked Odin suspiciously. Thor just raised an eyebrow. I mean what I say, I'm going to travel I'm tired of staying alone in our territory in Midgard, when there's a world I've never seen before, said Thor. That seemed to have alerted Loki. I'm sorry to dash your hope nephew, but it is not advisable for you to leave Asgardian territory to other pantheons around the world, and you are a prince, even if you are a bastard, your actions have consequences, said Loki. Oh. You don't understand uncle I clearly said I will travel, I'm not asking your permission or anyone else's, said Thor. Thor's intent was clear. The god of thunder was going to travel, and no one will stop him. Very well but if you don't want our permission, what are you doing here? Asked Odin. Odin wouldn't question his son even it wouldn't help. Also Odin would like to know how to get rid of the damn Dago statue that Thor gifted him years ago. The statue had been preventing him from pleasing his wife for years. I came here just to let you know, and I won't necessarily be gone for years, I'll be home some days, the trip is just to see some things in the territories of other pantheons. I know what you're thinking, so relax, I won't cause any problems, and I'll strictly respect the guest law said Thor, looking at his parents. Will you go alone? Frigg asked worriedly. Now, Frigg knew her son's reputation, and she knew she wasn't Thor's real mother, but she still considered him her precious son. And, like a good mother, Frigg worried about her son. No I'm taking hell, she said she wants to see the world too, Sif is also interested in going with us, said Thor. As Thor spoke, he was interrupted. The reason was simple, although most of the people didn't mind Sif's company, the same couldn't be said for hell. No. Hell is responsible for the souls in the world of the dead, she cannot let go of her responsibilities. Said Odin. Loki and Frigg seemed to agree. Thor, however, had other plans. 
She won't let go of any responsibility she'll always be in the land of the dead for most of the day, I'll just use the rune to summon hell whenever she wants. Also, some of my brothers want to go by the way, Fenrir will be at my house, so I suggest no one comes to my house while I'm gone, said Thor. Odin, Frigg, and Loki still seemed to want to disagree with Thor's journey. But they knew they couldn't do much. Sigh very well but can you do me a favor Thor? Asked Frigg, accepting her son's decision. Thor, who considered Frigg his mother in his new life, saw no need to deny her request. Well, why not what's your request, mom? Asked Thor curiously. Frigg looked at Thor, then said. Take one of the Valkyries on your journey. I don't mean to offend you or your brothers, but the Valkyries are more aware of politics among the pantheons than you are, Frigg said pleadingly. Thor didn't see a good reason to deny that request. It wasn't like the Valkyrie was in any, and what Frigg had said was correct. Among Thor's brothers, only Baldr and Hodr were trained in politics. This was due to one simple reason. These two were the next heirs to the throne of Asgard. So it was an obligation for Baldr and Hodr to know about politics. The Valkyries knew about politics because they accompanied the leaders and heirs of the Norse pantheon. It was then that Loki chose to comment. Well, since you're going to go on this trip of yours anyway, with my daughter, by the way, could you, at least, tell us your first destination? Asked Loki. Thor flashed a smile. You know our territory in Midgard is a little too snowy so I was thinking about a change of scenery, said Thor. Odin, understanding the meaning of Thor's comment, asked. You mean the land of Horus? Asked Odin. Thor didn't lose his smile. Yes, replied Thor. POV Thor. Our trip to the pantheon that would become Egyptian land was without much trouble. As soon as I notified the others of my absence I visited Free one last time when I learned he had woken up. When I visited Free it was weird? For some reason, he didn't seem to like my visit. How do I know this? Basically, when I walked into the room I could see that he looked at the door with a smile, but when he noticed it was me the smile turned into a grimace. He was still yelling nonsensical things like, I will never accept you. Or, my favorite, I thought you were my best friend. How can you betray me like that? It was kind of obvious that my longtime friend was angry, and when I asked him why he just said, Don't make a fool of yourself. Do you do this to me and now you pretend to be ignorant? As Free refused to answer me, I just shrugged. I wouldn't waste my time with meaningless conversations. So I just gave Free the reason I was visiting him. The Skibladner. After Free's fight against Perrin, the Skibladner was destroyed, and as I felt a little responsible for that, after all, I was the one who dragged Free to fight, so I decided to fix it. It took six months, in theory, it should be at least a few decades to fix it, but with the lightning armor the time was greatly reduced. As soon as I gave Free the Skibladner he was silent before looking at me and saying. I'm still angry but thank you. He seemed a lot calmer, so I told him about my trip. Prince Vanner just nodded and said he would like to go, but it was time for him to establish some dominance among the Vanner gods, so that no one would contest his right as heir. I was proud. After all the god of peace had finally grown some balls. With this change in Free, in addition to his performance against the Slavs, I knew that now the Vanner gods would think twice about trying to usurp Free. Of course, there would be some bad apples, but over time they would be discarded. I said goodbye to Free and left his room, then returned to my house in Midgard, only to find Hel waiting at the door. With a big backpack on her back. This obviously wasn't the smartest move by the Loki kids. Sigh Hel why are you carrying a backpack? I asked. Hel seemed to get more nervous as I could see that her face was turning red, and sweat was starting to collect on her forehead. There it's my basic needs, Hel said. It is a fact that Hel, the queen of the Norse underworld and the personification of death, does not know how to lie. Hel you know I've seen you pack and pull things out of the shadows, right? I asked, with a raised eyebrow. Hel looked like a deer looking into a car's headlights. This this is ah who do I want to fool. Hel muttered as she put the backpack on the floor. I just looked at the backpack and said. Fenrir can go out I said. It was then that Fenrir jumped out of his backpack and took a sitting position in front of me. He looked like a kid who'd been caught doing what he shouldn't have. Sai you know damn well why Fenrir won't be able to go, I said looking at Hel. At least she had the decency to look embarrassed. Sorry I just don't want him to be alone again, explained Hel. I can't blame her, I didn't want to leave Fenrir alone either. But also taking the untrust-prone god killer to a land of gods he's never seen before would be a mistake. 
Fenrir, as much as he doesn't show it, doesn't trust others very much. Being deceived by his own father contributed a lot to this behavior. Now, if Fenrir were to interact with a god from a different culture, it is very likely that he would end up hurting someone, but that wasn't the only reason. The Egyptians were known for their true forms. The true form of an Egyptian god was most often related to animals. I don't even want to think what Fenrir would do if he saw a cat-headed god or goddess. I'm pretty sure Fenrir would go for the kill. I understand hell, I don't want to leave him either, but it's necessary because of what might happen on our trip, we can't bring trouble to our pantheon I said. While Hell knew it was for the best, she didn't seem to like it at all. Right murmured Hell. I then put my hand on Hell's head and ruffled her hair, which ended up making her smile. Don't be like that, you can visit him every day I remember? Do you have the transport rune here, I explained. This seemed to cheer Hell up. You're right, by the way, cousin who else is going with us on our journey? Asked Hell curiously. Well, besides you and me. Sif has shown interest in going too, as well as Hermod and Vali, and due to my mother's request, a Valkyrie will accompany us, I replied. This seemed to get Hell's attention. A Valkyrie? I didn't know they could leave Asgard Hell said. And actually, Valkyries don't usually leave Asgard. There are only 13 Valkyries, with Brunholder being the leader. It was unlikely that Brunholder would accompany us, after all, she has the responsibilities as the leader of the Valkyries, and the personal guard of Frigg. You're right, they usually don't leave Asgard. But I think I agree with my mother about the need for a Valkyrie to accompany us, after all, they have more knowledge about current supernatural politics, but enough of that, we're on our way out, we'll meet the rest of the people in the Rune of Asbur I said. Hell nodded in response and then looked at Fenrir. Goodbye, brother. I promise to stop by tomorrow to see how you are doing, Hell said, with a sad tone. I then looked at Fenrir. Well, remember what I taught you if someone tries to break into our house, and it's not mere hell aim for the throat, I said. Fenrir seemed to understand what I had said, for he barked an affirmation in response. Cousin. This is rude. Said Hell. If there was one thing Hell cared about, it was being a good host. That, however, could be something stupid when it comes to this world I'm living in. Come on Hell, the people must have arrived already, I said. And so, we set off towards the Rune of Asbru, located in the archipelago north of Midgard. The archipelago was called the Cold Edge. Using my carriage, we ended up arriving at the site in no time, and that's when I realized we were the last to arrive. Finally. I don't know how much longer I should wait, said Hermod. I immediately grimaced. No one is forcing you to go, I said. Hermod soon replied. Oh, I want to go, the problem was that I had to keep watching this, said Hermod pointing towards Vali. Was Vali talking to the Valkyrie? I already told you Rist, I'm sorry. Can't you forgive me so we can start over again? Asked Vali. Shit you flirted with a waitress in front of me. Rist replied. I was drunk. I didn't know what I was doing. Said Val. Don't blame the drink. This does not improve your situation, because it shows that you have no control when it comes for drink, I don't deserve this. Said Rist. It was just what I needed, a trip with an ex-couple. Cousin what's going on? This is normal? Ask Hell whispering to me. Believe me Hell, you better not get involved so you won't get a headache, I said. And so our journey began. Wrist opened a quick teleport circle to a location that no pantheon held. Coincidentally, the site was what would come to be called the Richard Structure in my time. According to Wrist, it was recognized as a no-man's land, and a great spot for quick trips. POV. Third person. A group of six people walked through the scorching desert. Sand, sand, oh. Look. More sand. Said Hermod. For the love of our father, stop complaining. Said Vali. Hermod then looked at Vali. I have every right to complain. We are walking to the land of Horus when we might as well teleport closer. But knew your girlfriend said it wasn't advisable said Hermod, mocking. Vali seemed to have gotten angrier. Wrist explained very well why we can't teleport closer. What do you think Horus would do with strangers who appeared out of nowhere on his land? Invite for a drink? Asked Vali, irritated. It was then that Wrist even commented after hearing the sibling argument. Besides I'm not his girlfriend, Wrist said, pointing at Vali. Vali looked embarrassed, but Hermod saw a opportunity. I'm curious Wrist, as one of the most beautiful Valkyries I've ever seen, are you seeing anyone? If you give me a chance, I guarantee that Hermod said until he was interrupted by the Valkyrie. 
while I appreciate the compliment, I know of your reputation for lusting after married women Prince Hermod, said Rist. Hermod was upset. It was just one time. Also, I didn't know she was married. Said Hermod indignantly. While these three argued, Thor could be seen walking calmly as he was followed by Sif and Hel. The reason Sif and Hel are following Thor closely? Well, you see, could you let me go? Asked Thor, looking at Hel and Sif who were grabbing his clothes. The reason Sif and Hel were so close was simple, given Thor's height, his shadow was quite inviting to protect themselves from the sun. And as Thor was taller, consequently he walked faster than the others, which was why Sif and Hel grabbed Thor's clothes, to make him walk at the same pace as them. Sorry big guy, but given our current situation your shadow is too seductive, Sif said with an apologetic smile. I agree, said Hel walking slowly. Thor could only sign defeat. It was then that a loud noise was heard, and the noise was coming from sky? Boom this noise was the shockwave that occurred just as something fell from the sky near the Nordic group. The impact caused a cloud of dust that blocked everyone's view. But the dust cloud didn't last long before it was dispersed by the cause. The first thing the Nordic group saw was two wings that were outstretched due to dispersing the dust cloud. The noble-looking creature wore gold carvings on almost every part of its being. And it was tall, about seven feet tall, it didn't seem to have a lot of muscle but, due to the creature having wings and a hawk's head, it was a little obvious who it was, I am Horus, the sun god of the skies, and protector of these lands until the day I find myself in Ra's boat, fighting alongside him. As the protector, I wonder what you Nordics are doing so far from home, said the creature, now identified as Horus, as he crossed his arms. It was then that Valkyrie Wrist proceeded to start talking or at least she tried. Greetings noble god Horus. The one who had spoken was Hermod, who approached the Egyptian god as if he were an old friend. We are on an adventure. Our group intended to visit your vast kingdom which is famous for the unique culture of your people. I'm, personally, quite curious about the stories that revolve around you Lord Horus. Your battle with your uncle is famous even in said Hermod, before being interrupted. Spare me the ridiculous flattery and go straight to the point, Nordic, said Horus, in an irritated tone. Truth be told, Horus was feared for many reasons. His fight against his own uncle, Seth, was well known to other pantheons. A story of betrayal and revenge. A fight that lasted a millennium. However, it may be strange that the other pantheons didn't dare interfere or even take advantage of the discord of the conflict, the other pantheons didn't have the courage for one simple reason. Ra. The strongest solar deity. Although Ra was, without a doubt, the strongest of the Egyptian pantheon, there was also the existence of beings of absurd power. A good example was Seth and Horus. Seth, after being defeated by his nephew, instead of being killed, Ra spared him and instructed him to stay on his ship forever, helping Ra hunt down the sun god's nemesis, the Eclipse Dragon. Ra saw Seth as someone useful to be used for something more productive. Horus, on the other hand, was well known for his temper a good example, during the confrontation between Seth and Horus, Seth challenged the Hawkhead God to a simple contest of strength. However, Horus, tired after centuries of fighting over something that should have been his by right, tried to get his own mother, Isis, to hurt Seth during the competition, so that Horus could deliver the final blow. However, Isis didn't have the courage to hurt her own brother Horus, in turn, saw this as a betrayal. And a betrayal from his own mother. When Horus realized that his mother would not hurt Seth, blinded by rage, Horus ended up ripping his own mother's head off. Fortunately, Thoth, the wisest god, ended up saving Isis by healing her. Thor came to Egypt for a single purpose, to learn such a healing technique from the god of wisdom. Lord Horus, it is an honor, I am Rist, and my purpose for coming here was due to someone who seems to have an interest in the magic of your people, said Rist. This seemed to have interested Horus. We're not exactly allies so why should I let you learn my people's magic? Asked Horus. That was a reasonable question. How about an exchange? Asked Thor. Horus, while wanting to answer the question, stopped for a moment and stared at Thor. Tall red-colored hair you must be the bastard son of Odin, your name is Thor, isn't it? Asked Horus. Vali and Hermod looked insulted, after all, they were also sons of Odin, but it seemed that Horus didn't care much about their presence. It seemed that all of Horus's attention at the moment was on Thor. I don't think we introduce ourselves properly, I'm Thor, and these are my brothers Vali and Hermod, we are children of Odin, this is our cousin Hel, my close friend Sif, and the Valkyrie is called Rist. We came here to see your land, but I particularly want to meet Thoth if possible, 
and I'm willing to make a small exchange for our stay in your land, said Thor, as he introduced each of his group. This seemed to have interested the Egyptian god. And what do you have that you suppose I want? Asked Horus. It was then that Thor removed another necklace from his storage necklace. But a very different necklace. I hear that you like one particular goddess who has two different faces said Thor, with a smile. It was no secret that Horus was in love with the goddess Hathor. Hathor, however, suffered from the same thing her father Ra had. In the ancient world, it did not have a certain name, but in modern times the name was well known. Personality Disorder. Hathor was the goddess of the sky, she also represented dance, music, love, joy, motherhood, and sexuality, as well as aiding the journey of mortal souls to the afterlife. Her other personality, however, could be described as bloodthirsty. Segment. Goddess of war, disease, and healing, a symbol of pure and intense emotions such as passion and anger. It is said that during Ra's rule on Earth, he created Sekhmet to punish mortals who disobeyed him, however it was not a pretty sight. Sekhmet did not differentiate guilty from innocent. When the goddess stepped onto the Earth went on a rampant killing spree, crying out for blood. Ra, after seeing the result of his creation, was regretful, and had ordered Sekhmet to stop the killing, as he saw that his daughter was killing innocent people. But the goddess was so clouded by the lust of war that she kept killing. Although Ra could kill her, he refused to kill his daughter, and so came up with a plan. Ra had the idea of getting her drunk with a red drink, and only then creating the other personality Hather. Sekhmet drank Ra's mixed drink without batting an eye for one simple reason, it was red, just like the blood of her victims. As soon as Sekhmet passed out from drinking, Ra appeared and then created another personality for Sekhmet. Hather would be Sekhmet's opposite personality. While Hather was the symbol of love and happiness, Sekhmet was the symbol of hate and war. Two personalities share the same body. So what, son of Aden? Can you do something? Asked Horus. It was then that Thor's smile grew. This necklace in my hands will separate the wearer's personalities into two bodies, although the divine power will be split in half, there will be two separate people, to bring them back together, just channel the divine power of both into the necklace, and the two personalities will return to share the same body, said Thor. That had definitely got Horus interested. Hmm. Are you sure it will work? Asked Horus. The Norse god just replied. You have my word, said Thor. Thor then tossed the necklace to Horus who as soon as he picked it up, began sizing it up for any treacherous function. After a while, Horus looked towards the group. You are welcome in my lands, by my word, and by the law of the guest you will not be harmed, I will report your stay in my lands to the rest of the gods, so feel free to explore my lands, but I recommend that you stay out of trouble. Now that the situation has been resolved, I will leave now said Horus, as he spread his wings and flew towards the sky. When the Egyptian god came out, Hermod was the first to comment. Thor how did you made that necklace? Asked Hermod. Not only was Hermod curious, but most of the group except for two people. One was Thor, and the other was the one who helped Thor regarding the necklace's function. Well, I had a little help from our cousin, who has a weapon with a very interesting function, right Hel? Asked Thor, looking at Hel. Hel just smiled sheepishly. It's no big deal, starvation did all the work. Hal said, with a weak tone. Hal's knife. A pretty underrated weapon. Thor asked for Hal's help during these six months to prepare the perfect necklace for Hather, using one of the powers of the knife of the Queen of the Norse Underworld, which was to divide, or in this case separate, souls. Once Thor was able to transfer the knife's power through the corrupted ice, he forged the amulet. The result was nothing but satisfying. Basically, while repairing Free's ship, Thor successfully managed to forge some items that could be useful on his journey. Why did Thor do that? Well, most gods never give things away for free. It was always good to bargain. Let's go. Our little journey is just beginning. Said Thor, as he resumed walking. POV Thor. Our stay in the land of Horus could be described as welcoming. The gods remained in the land of men, but in specific locations, scattered across the lands and never next to each other. In a way, it was as if each god had his own territory that he could call home. We ended up staying in the house of Horus. And when I say house I mean obelisk. It was weird, each god's house looked like a mixture of a temple and a standard house, with a kitchen, bedrooms, and so on, but with the structure of an obelisk. According to Rist, the structure of the obelisks was enchanted with Egyptian magic, which was intended to hide it from the eyes of mortals. 
and it seemed that even among the Egyptian gods, no god can enter without the permission of the god in charge of the obelisk. Initially, I found it a little confusing. After all, the period was peace, and there was no longer a civil war between Horus and Seth. When I asked Rist about it, she just said not to worry because they always have been and always will be. Excluding special occasions, there are only two places that the Egyptian gods meet. The Divine Court. Located on the solar ship, the strongest Egyptian solar deity ship. The Divine Court was presided over by Ra. And this court was only held when there were things that were extremely important and related to the Divine, such as the dispute between Seth and Horus. The problem is that, according to Rist, the court began the moment Horus claimed the throne from his murdered father. If Horus and Seth's fight lasted approximately a millennium yes, the gods don't usually agree with each other. Nothing new. The other court was the court of men. Or, the court of mortals. And it was currently presided over by Osiris in the land of the dead, called Duet. Anyway, I think it was time to look for the god scribe. Rist, do you know where Thoth is located? I asked. The Valkyrie seemed to think for a few moments before speaking. If I remember correctly, he must be living in the obelisk right after the first waterfall in the river, he is one of the few gods who live there, if I remember him correctly, he likes the silence said Rist. What Rist said interested me but it also caught my brother's attention. Do you know him? Asked Vali. Apparently, my brother is worried about the current situation idiot. I'm not you. I went there because I was accompanying Aden at the time, Rist replied with a furious grimace. Following Aden? It is rare for my old man to leave Asgard and encounter another supernatural deity, let alone another pantheon. It must be important for the old man to seek out the scribe god. Very well, I'll be going if anything happens let me know by the runes I said. Hal and Sif then looked at me. Can I go with you? Both asked the same question. Truth be told, I think it would be advantageous for not only me to learn from Thoth. But, I didn't know if the scribe god would be willing to teach anyone. Furthermore I don't think it's a good idea, I said with finality. This seemed to have made Sif and Hell unhappy. Don't look at me like that, I'll just ask if I can have a little meeting with Thoth to learn something. I don't even know if you'll agree to my request, I just don't want you to go on a wasted trip I explained. That seemed to have calmed them both down a bit. You come back for dinner, right? Asked Sif. Yeah. Please, cousin. I saw that you brought that thing you call pasta and stuff, so will we have that for dinner? Ask Hell. Just like her older brother. Hell seemed to have acquired a taste for Italian food. That is called Pizza Hell, and yes I'll make it for dinner just please, while I'm gone, don't cause any trouble, I said. Sif and Hell nodded, but Sif still commented. You should be making this request to Hermod, said Sif. She wasn't wrong. Hermod. I said. My brother then looked towards me. What's up brother? Asked Hermod, confused. What to say, ma? While we're here, please be less this, I said, gesturing to him. The gesture? Well, you see Thor you're pointing out to my whole body, said Hermod. Exactly, I said. Hermod then grimaced. I'm not that bad, said Hermod. This I disagree with. Who thought it was a good idea to steal Sleipner at 10 years old? I asked. This seemed to have activated a neuron in my troubled brother. In my defense, I was young, said Hermod. That wasn't a good excuse for one simple reason. Hermod Vider told me he tried to stop you, but you went anyway, and he's only a year older than you, I said. That seemed to have embarrassed him. Ah oh well, so what? Do you think Vider was more responsible? Asked Hermod. Back then? Definitely not. The problem is that of all my brothers Hermod was the troublemaker. He only gets on the line if there are some specific people around. I am one of them. I don't care if Vider was more responsible. You know as well as I do that you're the one who usually causes trouble, I said. That seemed to have silenced Hermod. I then turned to the group. I'll go, if something happens that ends up in politics, let Rist sort it out, and if something happens that ends up in direct conflict let me know, I said. I then left. As soon as I got out of the obelisk, I summoned my chariot and bolted to Thoth's house. As soon as I reached the obelisk in just a few seconds thanks to my chariot, I wanted to summon some of my divine power, just to alert Thought that I was here. However I ended up not needing it. I'm busy. I heard a voice and looked towards the origin. It was a bird. A bird that glowed a ghostly blue color. It was kind of obvious that the bird was made of pure divine power. So this is one of this god's capabilities? But what good is this thing other than the second pair of eyes? 
I assume you're thought I'd like to have a meeting with you when you're available, I said. The birds seemed to consider. In that case, you can come in, unforeseen meetings can arise from the need of one of the parties, I don't need anything at the moment, which only leaves you, said the bird. So that means he's already assuming I need his help, it was then that a door emerged from the obelisk, inviting me in. The bird then left the branch on which it was perched. Follow me, said the bird. I couldn't deny the request, after all, if I went inside the obelisk, I was pretty sure it would take time to find Thoth with the traditional search method. POV. Third person. The bird, of the ibis race, guided the god Thor through the obelisk. What a Thor noticed most along the way? Papyri. Papyrus stacked on shelves, on the floor, furniture they were scattered all over the place. And Thor had a feeling that probably the entire obelisk was like that. You're not very organized, are you? Asked Thor, looking toward the rolled up scrolls on the floor. The bird that flew a little ahead of Thor then replied. With every second that passes, the past tends to grow, if I were to organize everything? Would I lose the preciousness that is history, said the bird. From the bird's response, Thor could already have an idea about the kind of person Thoth was. For Thor, the scribe god Thoth could be described as someone obsessed with recording events. But Thor didn't understand that kind of ambition. A few minutes passed and Thor realized he was now in something resembling a library. And at the center of that library, a man was talking to himself as a quill jotted down a papyrus. Considering the adaptability of these beings, the future of such a species is very indeterminate, their reasoning ability is slow, but it's changing no, correct that part it's evolving in a matter of a few years, and it seems that this achievement is transferable to their descendants. Violent capacity still prevails, but there is considerable improvement in social behavior than it was millennia ago, however, further observational studies must be done, lest it ends up as a failure sigh again, said the man, with a tone of defeat. As the man spoke, the quill was writing rapidly on the papyrus at the same pace. When the man finished speaking, the quill stopped. It was then that the bird that was guiding Thor flew towards the man. And merged with him. Oh. A visitor? I see asked the man. It was then that the unknown man turned towards Thor. Greetings visitor, Horus has informed me of your group stay, my name is Thoth. If possible, could you introduce yourself and tell your purpose for coming here? Asked the man, now identified as Thoth. Thor then took a step forward. My name is Thor, son of Odin, and about my purpose? I would like to learn said Thor. This seemed to get Thoth's attention. Learn? What? Or rather, saying, why? Asked Thoth. Thor then responded without hesitation. I would like to learn magic, due to possible future need, said Thor. Thoth seemed to consider. Need, ha how do you define it? Asked Thoth. Thor thought for a moment before answering. It would be something indispensable for me, Thor replied. Thoth looked at Thor as he analyzed the answer. You say indispensable, but you didn't say the reason a need is something indispensable, I agree with that, but there is always a reason. An example is a need for mortals for water, the reason why water is something indispensable for them, is that without it mortals will die so, what is the reason for your need, son of Odin? No half answers please, asked Thoth. Thor seemed to think for a moment. You are quite curious, has anyone ever said that? Asked Thor. Thoth just shrugged. I'm referred to as the god of wisdom, many think it's because I have the answer to everything, but it's a misconception. I'm curious and I'm hungry for knowledge, and I love it when accumulated knowledge is put to use. A wise one does not squander how much he knows about things. But he knows things and remains silent because it is in silence that you begin to reflect on the things you know, said Thoth. The god Thoth was known for many things the scribe. The lonely. The impartial. The title of impartial is best known among the gods for one simple reason. Thoth condemns choosing a side when it comes to battles. Because if chose sides well, history will be written by the winners. The god scribe prefers only to observe a bloody battle that is taking place in front of him, and only then to record the events most faithfully. However there were times when he was not impartial. And Thor knew about that. It is a strange concept of wisdom that you speak. After all, you were not silent when the last court of the gods took place between Seth and Horus, besides having shown clear support for Horus, and you saved Hather with your magic, said Thor. Thoth didn't look shaken. True, but keep in mind that these were specific situations that I had to intervene in, because if I didn't do what I did, I would risk the future of my pantheon, said Thoth. Thor was a little confused. Risk the future of the pantheon? What do you mean by that? Asked Thor. 
Thoth then looked at the Norse god and spoke with a smile. The age of the gods will end, said Thoth. This surprised Thor a little, after all, it was a statement made with a tone of affirmation so strong that it seemed immutable. And do you know how? Asked Thor. Thoth then snapped his fingers, and a papyrus flew towards the scribe god's hands. First we have to go back a little in history a few millennia ago, that structure that you and your group used, was much more than it looks said Thoth, with a mysterious smile. The piece of papyrus then opened and then an aura formed, and then a kind of hologram appeared. The hologram showed an image that Thor immediately recognized. The rigid structure. Known as the Eye of the Sahara. It was then that the hologram changed, and then the image seemed to show vegetation and water in the place, and, it now looked like a place inhabited by mortals. This place was a joint experiment between some pantheons. Nereus, son of Pontos and Gaia, built a utopia for mortals, who grew so much that their population exceeded one million people, we, gods, were authorized by Nereus, to see this city that humans lived in. At the time I went, it was absolutely splendid, gods and mortals living side by side, said Thoth. Thor could think of only a few things as he looked at the image of the city. Concentric circles. In the middle of a kind of lake. Thor could only associate this kind of geometric structure with a particular legendary city. Atlantis. But Nereus? In legend it was Poseidon. But Thor came from that place, and at first glance, he only saw mountains and valleys, it didn't look like it was ever a big city. How did it end up the way it is today? Asked Thor. Arrogance, said Thoth. Thor looked at the Egyptian god, and he could see the expression on his face as he looked at the picture disappointment. The city was to be perfect, it was founded by a mortal created by Nereus called Atlas, a new culture was established in that city, the mortals called themselves a Masion, and in that place they remained coexisting with gods, the city had as its main objective to cohabitation between gods and men. Until after a few generations, the humble people of the Amazion began to deny the gods, and this displeased some of us. Pontus then declared his son Nereus's project of the perfect city a failure, and we gods erased the city from the map over 5850 years ago, explained Thoth. For Thor, the story was surprising, but why are you telling me this? Asked Thor. Thoth then looked at Thor before replying. Humans have disowned us because we lived among them before if we do the same thing now as we did in the past. How long will it take until the same thing happens today or a thousand years from now? Asked Thoth. It was then that Thor realized something. Something Horus had talked about during his first encounter with the Norse group. Protector of these lands. Protector. Not ruler. Who is the ruling god of these lands? Asked Thor. Thoth then smiled in response. No one the land is in the hands of mortal tribes, replied Thoth, with a smile. Thor, however, saw nothing funny. Why did you do this? Asked Thor. Thor ended up discovering something about the Egyptian pantheon. Horus renounced the government. But not the protection. Why? The answer is quite simple, don't you think? The human said Thoth. I know you mean humans, I want to know, why now? Asked Thor, insisting. Thoth then sighed. We gods control mortals too much it was because of this control that the perfect city project was a failure in the end, said Thoth. The argument was that humans had resented the gods before because they didn't have something that defined them the free will. I convinced Horus to give power to mortals after some time of reign, and in return, he would leave one of his lineages among mortals, said Thoth. One of his lineage among mortals it only meant one thing in Thor's mind. Demigods. Who is the lineage of Horus? Asked Thor. Thoth then denied it. Not yet we are waiting for the right moment and, by my calculations, it will be a few centuries from now, how do I know that? Mortals reek of conflict at the moment, what is missing now is one mortal with the desire of conquest and resources, said Thoth. That's what was missing. A mortal with a desire for conquest and who has the resources to support that desire. When this power-hungry mortal is born with the right conditions, he will remove any obstacle in front of him, if it meant power concentrated in his hands. Hundreds of mortals will die. Thanks to what Thoth revealed to Thor, the reincarnated Norse god could finally have a brief idea of what year he was likely in. Before the first Egyptian dynasty. And if Thoth's calculations were correct Thor was probably in the pre-dynastic Egyptian period. The period that only ended with the accession to power of a figure considered legendary. The first pharaoh. Narmer. With Thoth commenting on the lineage of Horus among mortals, Thor was sure the first pharaoh would be part of that lineage. Narmer unified Egypt through war and bloodshed. 
The dynasties that followed were not a bed of roses either, but that wasn't what Thor had in mind at the moment. So you're just going to watch mortals kill each other for power? Ask Thor. Typical divine action but again, when didn't humans fight for supremacy? When you talk like that, it's very biased. My argument is that humans are changing, and therefore the best course of action would be to let them solve their problems. We, gods, will return to what we were before figures admired by mortals, replied Thoth. Thoth's argument was clear. The gods have tried to guide humans in the past in a more direct way, and this has resulted in humans' resentment towards the gods. Thoth then asked a question that roused Thor from his thoughts. While I enjoy talking about the fascinating species that is humanity, you have yet to answer my question, said Thoth, looking up at the Norse god. That's when Odin's son remembered why he was here. I would like to learn, if possible, the same technique you used to heal Hather, said Thor. Thoth stared at the Norse god. And? The reason? Asked Thoth. Thor then looked Thoth in the eye and said without missing a beat. Be stronger, said Thor. This seemed to amuse the Egyptian. Is that your answer? Be stronger? I suppose that's a very predictable response for a Norse god, said Thoth. The Norse god then commented. I don't care if it's predictable, it's my answer for a good reason. I need it if I want to get prepared for a sticky situation, said Thor. Thor was aware of beings that could kill him if they had the right things. Like a powerful poison. Not to mention the future weapons that will exist in this world like Longinus. The reincarnated Norse god knew he needed something that could cover up this flaw he had regarding immunity. It was then that Thor found out about the technique that Thoth possessed. A technique that revived a goddess shortly after being decapitated and, of course, killed. Even Isis, the supposed goddess of magic, was not shown performing such a feat. Who contested this feat was Thoth. A scribe god. That must have been a severe blow to the goddess Isis. Needs to get prepared hmm. Sure, why not, said Thoth, shrugging his shoulders. This action surprised Thor a bit. Just like that? Asked Thor suspiciously. Thoth then replied with a smile. I already said I am the god of wisdom, son of Odin while I enjoy accumulating knowledge, it is even more refreshing to put that acquired knowledge into practice and share it, said Thoth. For some reason. Thor thought Thoth would make a good teacher in modern times. But there's still something Thor was curious about during the conversation, by the way you said that the age of the gods will end because of humans, but what's stopping the gods from eliminating humans again? Asked Thor. After all, the gods have already made humans start over by destroying an entire city. What would stop the gods from doing the same thing? Thoth's answer was given with a smile. Your question is valid, gods may have killed many human settlements throughout history. But I'm sure that eventually we will find formidable humans, that will represent the pinnacle of their race, but when? I don't know, said Thoth. Humans reacting. That statement held Thor's attention for good reason. Because Thor knew the story of a human, even with divine blood in his veins, considered legendary through an ancient epic known in his previous life. A legendary king, who disrespected the gods, and defies them. Gilgamesh. Well, what are we waiting for? Your lessons start now. Let's go my student. Said Thoth. This seemed to have awakened Thor, who then remembered his group. As Thoth liked to share knowledge, Thor saw an opportunity for his group to also learn from the scribe god. Wait, I'll call my said Thor, before being interrupted. Thoth was not happy. No, I only accept to teach one student at a time, after all, if knowledge is dispersed at the same time to other parts, it is unlikely that they will fully understand, and so it is very likely that each student will develop a selective memory, that will only remind him of some things, but not everything, said Thoth, as he walked quickly out of the library. Thor then caught up with the scribe god. What about the talk of enjoying sharing knowledge? Asked Thor. Thoth then looked at Thor. But I'm sharing knowledge with you, if you want your group to learn too, you will be responsible for their teachings, after all, I dropped my chores to teach you, and already made me lose minutes of unrecorded history by the way, said Thoth. The god scribe then snapped his fingers, and then a piece of papyrus, along with a quill, appeared beside the god scribe. It was then that a light blue aura emerged from Thoth's body and came out. The aura had the form of the scribe god. Ugh I never like to do that, it's always weird very well, you know what to do said Thoth, looking at his clone. The clone of the scribe god looked at Thoth and did not respond, but snatched the quill and papyrus from the air, and began to walk towards the center of the library from before. This ability caught Thor's attention. Intriguing skill what do you call it? Asked Thor. 
Thoth looked at the Norse god. I don't have a specific name for it, but basically it's a stable construction made of divine power, so things like breathing, eating, sleeping, talking, or anything like that, are impossible actions for it to perform. However you can write, the problem is that it's too fragile, so it's not very useful in battle if that's what you have in mind. Let's go to your first class in body recombination magic before we evolve into muscle rewound magic, said Thoth. Thor could only sigh. After all, the Norse god knew that he would be visiting these lands for quite some time, if he wanted to learn the resurrection technique perfectly. But if everything is right, the result would be worth it. But if there was anything else Thor was interested in, it was building a utopia. A city where gods cohabited among mortals Thor could only imagine such a city. Time skip. 740 years, current era. 3010 BCE Thor. 990 years, POV Thor. Learning a technique that basically revives a god is easy. That's what I wanted to say, but the reality is quite different I failed. I failed spectacularly, for centuries. The theory was already complex, but it was the practice of magic that was on another level. Thoth, knowing my lack of experience in healing magic, recommended that I learn the theory along with the practice. According to the scribe god, it would be easier to assimilate theoretical and practical content at the same time. According to the god with the head of an ibis, if I only concentrated on the theoretical part, when I got to the practical part I would be more lost than blind in a forest. According to the historian Bird, I learn best when I put what I've learned into practice, whether I fail or not. For Thoth, when it comes to learning something new, there is no such thing as failure, there are only lessons of learning. But obviously, frustration prevailed every time I missed. The first lesson was the simplest part. Reconnect the separate parts. The object of practice? A decapitated snake. Basically, I would reconnect the snake's head with the rest of the body, and then Thoth would do the rest of the reanimation process. But for decades I was not successful. I was stuck on the first step of the process for longer than expected. Fortunately, I've managed to live in Egypt and Asgard easily over the years. My group that accompanied me was always welcome to Egypt again, as long as it didn't interfere with politics. Why do the Egyptians welcome us at any time? Hather. The necklace I made it work perfectly. Of course, Hather now only had half of her original god power, but that definitely was not a bad thing in the eyes of many Egyptian gods. Obviously, this meant that Sekhmet also had half the power. Horus could now much more easily subdue the bloodthirsty goddess. Sekhmet was now locked in an obelisk made especially for her by a god named Ptah, who visited the bloodthirsty goddess when he could. In short Sekhmet was under house arrest. But back to what really matters Thoth's healing magic. Definitely one of the most complex healing spells I've ever seen. The magic that at full capacity could revive a god that was slain in battle. But like any spell, it has certain weaknesses for starters, it was not possible to perform the maximum capacity of this spell, if the corpse is more than an hour old, the excuse was that the soul had already left the whole body. Of course, this spell could heal simple wounds, such as broken bones or cut wounds. But I really wanted to have the full capacity to utilize this magic to the fullest. I didn't want to let anyone die. Call me weak but I was very attached to my family and friends. No way would I let someone superpowered take them away from me. And since I don't have the power of friendship, I can only do one thing, learn the most ridiculous techniques the world has to offer to strengthen me. Another interesting thing was that over the decades, while it wasn't class time, Thoth was a good friend. So, what do you call this game again? Asked Thoth, as he moved a piece on the board. Chess, I replied. When I introduced the Egyptian god of knowledge about such a game, he was excited to play it. I only had to explain the rules once the bastard already played better than an amateur of my time. Talk about fast learning. Yes, that's right, chess but what a fascinating instrument of entertainment. Where did you get such an idea from? Asked Thoth, puzzled. I then moved the next piece calmly, while answering. It wasn't as splendid as you think, I was just bored by the way, check I said. Thoth remained calm as he moved a piece to a more defensive strategy. Don't act like it's no big deal, it's a good idea it could be an excellent alternative to pass the time, it's much more my style to fight that way than physically said Thoth. This bastard was a quick learner, and we've been playing for over three hours now. Either I'm terrible at chess or he was very good at learning from mistakes in a matter of seconds, as well as predicting possible moves. It was probably the second option the reason? This was only his third game after I explained the rules. 
In the first game, he played more aggressively with the pieces, I took advantage of that and won quickly. In the second game, he played much more defensively. He was already making one of the defensive moves in my time, the French defense, therefore, it took me longer to win, about an hour. In that third game? It was as if Thoth were already a professional. By the way. We have a visitor today, someone wants to meet you if you don't mind said Thoth. I moved to my next piece while reflecting on what Thoth had said. Does anyone want to meet me? That was interesting. Not many Egyptian gods visit other Egyptian gods. The gods I saw most often were the most social. One of them was the couple in love, Horus and Hather. Which by the way, they were quite active at night, because of that, everyone in my group had to sleep in my room, as it was the room furthest from the main bedroom. Another god was my current teacher, Thoth. He may prefer to live alone, but that doesn't mean he doesn't like to socialize a little it's more like. Thoth will only join a conversation when something catches his eye or he sees a need to socialize. In short, Thoth was more of a introvert? May I know who wants to meet me? I asked, curiously. I didn't wait long for an answer, but it was not Thoth who answered me. It would be me, son of Aden, said a voice. As I looked towards the voice I saw a man I knew this man was a mighty god. And not just any powerful god. The pressure he was putting on the room with just his presence made me a little vigilant. And it looks like it wasn't just me who was nervous. I, I see you're a little early, said Thoth, looking at the man. Thoth was one of the calmest gods I've ever seen, but I realized, at that moment Thoth was afraid. I was a little curious about the Norse god who helped my daughter, so I chose to come to visit him a few centuries later, when the Norse were more comfortable with our pantheon, so that I can have a friendly chat, the man said. The man seemed open to reasonable conversation. And by the words only confirmed who it was. I assume you're Ra, I said. The man just smiled in response. Certainly. But I think a polite introduction is more ideal. Allow me to introduce myself I'm Ra, and I don't really care about titles, it's a pleasure to meet you son of Aden, said the man, now identified as Ra, approaching me. Although I was nervous I was also curious. It's not every day that the strongest solar deity wants to meet you. Whether that was good or bad, I still didn't know. Thoth snapped his fingers, and then a chair floated towards where we were sitting. Ra then sat in the chair and was silent. So could you teach me how to play this game too? Asked Ra, with a smile. And here I was a short time later, sitting in a chair playing chess against Ra himself. Thoth had retired saying it was time to record the day's events. But I knew Thoth well enough for me to know he was lying. So I don't think you came all this way just to play chess what does someone important like you want with me? I asked. I had to be careful. If a fight broke out I wasn't completely confident that I would beat Ra. Perhaps if my limiters were removed, in addition to the awakened Jolner, but I still wasn't sure of victory. And it seemed Ra had a brief idea of what was going through my mind. No need to be so nervous I came here to thank you, you did me a big favor, said Ra, while playing. A mighty god, thanking you? What comes next? Will pigs fly too? I don't care about thanks, I did what I did to have a passage and stay in the lands of Horus, since I'm sure the sky god would not accept my group willingly I said. Ra didn't look insulted. Ah yes, my temperamental great-great-grandson who loves a goddess he's barely seen in his long life of war, it's disappointing what we become when we don't focus, don't you think? Asked Ra. I moved a piece and then responded. Your great-great-grandson was focused on leadership before, he guided the people of this land into a golden age at least until he handed power to mortals and left it at that, I said. Horus was complicated to understand. He fought Seth for revenge and power. And, when victorious, he led Egypt into a prosperous new era. That's why I didn't understand something after having bled, lost an eye, killed his mother, fought for a thousand years, and ruled these lands Horus only surrendered his power to humanity after a few centuries of rule. Why? Horus was in the best position to rule. Why did he just give up? What Thoth had told me when we first met still troubled me the age of the gods will end? Perhaps Thoth is not referring to the existence of the gods, but if so what was Thoth referring to? Certainly, it was a choice that confused many of us, but I supported it, after all, this is also my land, and I trusted Thoth, said Ra. This it was something I didn't expect. For one simple reason. Do you trust the brother of your greatest enemy? I asked. Thoth was the son of Neith, goddess of war and hunting, and little sister of Ra. But Neith had other children besides Thoth. Who were they? 
Well, you see Circuit, goddess of scorpions. Sabek, god of crocodiles. And last but not least Apophis. Ra seemed to have understood the implication of my question, we do not choose our kin, son of Aden. A good example is my great-great-grandson, I respect him, and I don't hate him his mother on the other hand, I would kill her if she didn't bring consequences for me said Ra, with a dark tone. Well, I won't deny that Isis, the goddess of magic, didn't think very well when she blackmailed Ra, the goddess nearly killed Ra, while blackmailing the sun god to find out Ra's secret name. It was kind of obvious that Ra was angry at his own great-granddaughter's actions. Ra then moved a piece. Besides, don't say that Apophis is my greatest enemy, I just keep him away from here, so he doesn't threaten these lands, I'm not a kin killer for no reason, Ra said. So Ra does not wish to kill his nephew Apophis? This surprised me a little. I then moved my piece. If you just wanted to thank me, know that while I accept your thanks, there's no need for any of that, I said. If this god came here to give thanks I didn't see the need to have this conversation. After all I didn't help Aether, or Sekhmet, willingly. I helped so I could stay and learn one of the most powerful healing techniques I've ever discovered. Ra just smiled. I see but as a father, I felt the need to thank you anyway by the way, check, Ra said, as he moved a piece. As a father. I wonder what it was like to be a father. I then moved a piece. I suppose you knew about the son of Horus I said, with a disinterested tone. During this last century, Horus had a child with a mortal. The mortal was called Shesh, and she was special, for her ancestor was the son of Circuit, goddess of scorpions. Horus and Thoth decided it was time, so they chose this woman from among all mortal women, to carry Horus's lineage, and carry out the plan to unite Egypt once more, but this time, Egypt would be unified by the hands of a mortal. The child was known to his tribe by a title. Scorpio King 2. Dot, it had been a few years since the child was born. When he reached adulthood, he organized resources and set out on a campaign of conquest to unite Egypt. And he was supported by Horus and Thoth in the shadows. Hather, obviously, was a little displeased with her lover's betrayal. The goddess left the obelisk of Horus and went to live in her own obelisk. I suppose this couple's fight won't last long, after all, Hather was in love with Horus, and the feeling was reciprocal anyway, the demigod child was promising. A good warrior and leader. And because of the child's real name I knew he would succeed in uniting Egypt. After all, Scorpion King II was the original title of the mortal named Narmer. Ra then moved a piece before starting to speak. Ah yes, the son of Horus I suppose Horus and Thoth want to let the divine blood between humans, so it has some form of control, I wasn't much in favor of such an action, said Ra. So Ra doesn't like Narmer Narmer, as much as he has divine blood in his veins, and as a demigod he's no big deal. He hasn't developed any power or anything that I know of, other than his combat prowess. I suppose being a demigod at the moment was more about status than power itself at least, until some demigod is born who breaks this paradigm, but then, you taught thought this fascinating game before you leave, right? Asked Ra. I moved a piece. Yes it's time to get on with my journey, I said. After centuries. I had successfully learned the ultimate healing technique from the god of knowledge, Thoth. As a gift, I chose to give Thoth the game of chess as a thank you. Thoth seemed to have enjoyed the gift. Learning such a technique took a great deal of my time. I was worried that my group was getting upset while we were staying in these lands because of me, but I ended up fooling myself. Everyone seemed to have fun in this land. Hell had made a new friend named Bastet. Sif and Rist were interested in the Egyptian afterlife and how it was different from Valhalla. Vali and Hermod had fun among mortals when they could, but they never caused trouble. I think everyone enjoyed the trip I would wait a few centuries before leaving for my next destination. Mesopotamia. The reason was simple my old man would like me to check on Enlil, who hadn't appeared at any meeting between the major gods of each pantheon for half a millennium. According to Rist, it was just a passing mission, as my mother and most of the Valkyries were suspicious about what had happened to the leader of the Sumerian pantheon, Enlil probably was sleeping. Our mission was basically to wake him up. It would take a while for me to get out of Egypt, as I was organizing some resources acquired over the centuries. Oh, another thing I'd like to ask, would you be willing to be a witness to the union between my daughter and Ta? Asked Ra, as he moved a piece on the board. Oh? Is Zekmet getting married? Since when did your daughter decide to get married? I asked. Also Ta? It's a little hard to imagine a bloodthirsty goddess like Sekhmet married to the god of builders. Ha 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 ha. 
I was also a little surprised, but it seems that Ta makes my daughter happy, and for me, that's more than enough. She would like to thank you for helping her, so she wants you to be a witness to their union, said Ra. It seems that the strongest sun god is a very reasonable father-in-law, however, if Ta breaks my daughter's heart, I will void the union in the next second, and I will rip out that worm soul with my bare hands, Ra said with a smile. Well, no father is so reasonable when it comes to his daughter's marriage. Anyway sure, why not, I said, shrugging my shoulders. Excellent, thanks for agreeing, Ra said. Witnessing a divine marriage should be something important. Also, it can be good between Egyptian and Nordic relations. Strengthening ties between pantheons has always been good, after all, pantheons at the moment must remain united for the future conflict to come the conflict. It looks like the Morning Star was gearing up for open warfare. He was low on numbers, but the Ba was just waiting for his race to grow in numbers before declaring war. I knew there was going to be a big war between the factions sooner or later. But when? I had no idea. All I know is that when war breaks out the pantheons will likely choose to support one side of the biblical factions. I should do everything I can to keep the Nordic pantheon neutral. I then moved a piece. Check I said. Ra thought for a while, before moving a piece. There's. Another thing said Ra. I looked at Ra and gestured for him to continue Ra looked unsure. My other daughter, Bastet would like your cousin, Hal, to witness her union with Anubis, said Ra. Anubis and Bastet. Dog and cat. Getting married. Bastet was a somewhat lonely goddess that was until she met Hal. Hal became Bastet's best friend in just a few years. I was a little afraid of this friendship after all, Bastet was known as the goddess of fertility. I was afraid that Hell would be corrupted. But when I met Bastet, she was a reasonable person. I know this because Hermod still tried to flirt with Bastet and ended up being rejected. That was a relief for me. After all, I wouldn't want Hell to interact with some female version of Inanna. Inanna was praised as one of the most beautiful goddesses, and had a reputation as a collector of men. As soon as Inanna laid eyes on a man she would seduce him to satisfy her and then discard the man when she got bored if he weren't a god. And when I say discard, I mean kill. When her advances didn't work. She killed the same way. Basically, with Inanna the saying it's just your turn prevailed. I looked at Ra before answering. It's not exactly me you should ask such a question, but I will notify Hell of her friend's request, I said while moving a piece. Ra then quickly moved another piece. Oh. But I know how uncomfortable you would be if I approached your group without you knowing it wouldn't make a good impression, would it? Asked Ra, with a smile. That guy. Let's be clear Ra, I may have befriended some members of your pantheon, but just as you care about your family, I care about mine just like you, I would kill to defend the people I care about I said. Ra's smile was gone. Even if it is me, son of Aden? Would you face me? Asked Ra. I looked at Ra, maybe it wasn't my best idea, but fuck it. POV. Third person. If you threaten the people I hold dear? Yes, I would stand up to you without hesitation, said Thor. As soon as Thor answered, a suffocating pressure fell on the Norse god's shoulders. Thoth's obelisk began to shake. An aura with a mixture of golden, red, and white colors, began to emerge from Ra, as he stared at Thor with a serious gaze. Bathed in his divine power, Ra's eyes shone like two suns. Cracks began to appear in the obelisk. Thor didn't look away and then responded to the sun god by evoking his own divine power, which was a blue color with lightning flashing periodically on his body. Thor would not falter at that moment. Even if the being in front of him is considered powerful, no considered another level. The god who was stronger than the primordials of the Egyptian pantheon itself, Nun and Mehitwarit, as well as other primordials from other pantheons. The strongest solar god who shared his position with other primordials such as the Void, Chaos, in the top ten of the strongest existences. Occupying the fourth position. Ra. When Ra saw how Thor responded, he did something that surprised the Norse god. Ra stopped trying to intimidate the Norse god with his divine power ha 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 and started to laugh. Thor did not see any funny, but the Norse god was confused by Ra's intentions. The Egyptian god stopped laughing and then looked at the Norse god. I must say, son of Aden, I am pleased with your response to my actions, you maintained your composure, maintaining your composure is a trait reserved only for the strong. So I'm glad you have a strong conviction, I apologize for my previous actions, Ra said. It was then that Thor realized something. Ra was just asking him. Why did you do that? Asked Thor. 
Ross smiled in response. Call me crazy, but I wanted to see firsthand if your title of strongest Norse god was deserved or was just a misconception. I'm glad you didn't disappoint me son of Odin said Ra. If there was anything uncertain about the pantheons it was the balance of power itself. The Hindu pantheon is, without a doubt, the strongest pantheon in terms of raw power. The reason? The second position in the top 10 of the strongest existences was officially made up of five beings. However, three beings were from the Hindu pantheon. The Trimurti Brahma, the creator. Vishnu, the preserver. Shiva, the destroyer. In short, the top 10 list was complex. A single position could be occupied by more than one entity. Most pantheons had beings that were present in the top 10, only a few pantheons didn't. Unfortunately the Nordic pantheon had no one in the top 10. And that, many times, made some beings look at the Norse as weaker or useless a good example? The Hindu sky god, Indra. Ra, however, wanted a harmony in the balance of power. The sun god wanted the northern pantheons to have someone powerful around. The northern pantheons were three the Nordic pantheon, the Slavic pantheon, and the Celtic pantheon. But none of these three possessed someone very powerful who had caught Ra's attention until now. When Ra heard about the stories of Thor and his battles, as well as the Norse god's desire to learn about spells from another pantheon, Ra saw potential in Thor. However only through achievements will the Norse god be in the top 10. What Ra wanted was to see if the Norse god would fight with all his might if he was face to face with someone, who at the moment, was more powerful. Ra wanted Thor to see the difference in power between them at the moment for one simple reason Ra wanted Thor to grow stronger. For Ra, all pantheons should strengthen. After all, the leader of the angels was another being that occupied the second position of the top 10, and Ra knew that this god would make some move in the future. Especially after his army split because of rebellions and spawned two more races. The fallen angels and the devils. Ra was not a fool. Anyone who knew of the current situation knew one thing a war was approaching. A war that would possibly change the supernatural world. And, consequently, the balance of power. For Ra, the pantheons needed to be strong by all means to resist this possible war. Anyway, now you know my position I will witness the union between Sekhmet and Ptah, and I will warn Hell about her friend's request by the way, checkmate said Thor. Ra looks like I lost well, what do you think of a rematch? Asked Ra, with a smile. Thor didn't smile back. I pass I have other things to do, said Thor. Thor would soon be returning with his group to the north for good reason. It was almost time to leave. Thor knew he was in Egypt longer than anticipated, and he has a new mission in Mesopotamia. The Norse god thought it was time for his group to organize and travel. Although there is a mission in Mesopotamia, Thor's next destination was a little further away. China. From conversations with Thoth, Thor knew of a strange power that some Chinese beings had. Tauki. A technique that Sinjutsu users could use by controlling their life base, in other words, the user's own life force. Why did Thor want to learn such a technique? The reason was simple Thor believed that Tauki could be perfected, having the possibility of becoming a technique that Thor knew from an anime from his previous life. Hockey. But Thor knew that to perfect such a technique he would have to learn other things. To learn about the spiritual side, Thor would have to go to a place right after learning about Tauki India, the cradle of spiritual traditions. POV Thor. Sekhmet's marriage to Ptah was normal? I mean, by the standards of the gods there was a lot of food and drink and a lot of music. My group was the only foreign group invited. This could be considered a great honor, after all, who was getting married was Ra's daughter. There was only one thing I didn't agree with the witness. A curiosity. A witness of an old marriage, had to validate the marriage bond in a single way, and no, it wasn't through a subscription. I was dumb. I should have known better, but I had accepted it because I was never called to such a thing. There was a good reason the witnesses were mostly women. Rarely was a man called to be a witness, so I thought it was an honor. I honestly didn't know what the task of witnessing a marriage between two deities was. In a way, I'm guilty of not paying attention to Frigg's lectures on this subject. What can I say? Few things catch my eye, and unfortunately, getting married was not one of them. But back to me being a witness part let's just say it was weird? Yes, definitely weird. After all, I, along with three other goddesses, stayed outside Sekhmet and Ta's room on the wedding night. And for an hour I only heard moans. It was not a pleasant experience. I, of course, told Hell to politely decline Bastet's request. Hell didn't understand, but she did as I asked. 
My innocent cousin wouldn't be corrupted any time soon. Even if she is a millennium old. Also, to forget about this weird experience I had, I ended up drinking a little too much the next morning, I woke up in my bed. With Sif in my arms again. I knew I would have to talk to Sif sooner or later to define our type of relationship. Because it felt like our current relationship was one of friends with benefits. It's been a while actually, but we never had a more in-depth conversation about it, because what we were doing seemed natural but, easily enough, Sif would be a good candidate for a wife. The reason is quite simple actually. As much as in this world, power dictates how things are, there was something else that seemed to be always present politics. In simple terms, I am officially considered one of Auden's bastard children. Keyword. Bastard. Not surprisingly, my pedigree affected my romantic relationships and potential suitors. I can be considered a prince, but, by blood, I don't have many options for getting married. Was it possible for me to marry someone with a better pedigree than mine? The answer is maybe. Did I care about this? The answer is not really. To be honest, it would be a little difficult, but I could possibly do it if I made the effort to pay for the bride at Coster. Keywords. If and effort. To be honest, I didn't want to have a headache just to marry someone. No thanks, I'd rather get someone who's easier to accept my offer on Coster, so it's not too expensive for me. Also, I found Sif an easy person to get along with. Why do I say that? She's not problematic that is, she didn't give me headaches. I would soon be completing my first millennium, consequently, I would have to return to Asgard to eat one of the apples of Iden, the goddess of youth, to stay young, in addition to holding my celebrations on the night of the winter solstice. I hope that when I mastered the Tauki technique, I would get around this problem and live without having to eat one of the apples of the goddess of youth once every thousand years. As I was in a hurry, I told my group that we would be leaving shortly after Bastet and Anubis's wedding. Also, I met Isis. I did not like her. That simple. Stories reflect her as a good goddess or merciful goddess, because she failed to harm her brother Seth, during Horus' clash for the throne, out of pity. But she had a side I didn't like manipulator. Greedy. A person who would threaten someone's life if it meant she got what she wanted part of the family or not. Unfortunately, Isis laid eyes on the famous knife of hell when she learned what the necklace I gave Horus could do. How she found out that it was Hell's knife that gave the necklace this ability I have no idea anyway, she cornered Hell during Bastet's wedding celebrations, and asked to show her the starvation knife. Hell, following my advice never to speak to strangers unless I'm around, declined the request. Isis didn't take it very well, the Egyptian goddess demanded and tried to deceive Hell by abusing the guest's right, it was at this point that I found the two goddesses arguing, and told Isis to back off. The Egyptian goddess seemed to consider before accepting my request. I didn't let hell out of my sight after that the rest was history. I thanked Thoth once again for teaching me the healing technique. I said goodbye to the other couple Horus and Hather, who had reconnected. I said goodbye to Ra and apologized for any trouble I caused during the party he laughed and said that if I ripped Isis's head off he wouldn't mind. It was pretty clear that Ra would no longer protect his great-granddaughter. After the celebrations, my group left for Mesopotamia. I was a little apprehensive. Enlil's temper was legendary. This god sent several floods in the place. The reason? According to Enlil, humans made a lot of noise I didn't want my attempt to wake him up to end in a deluge. However, after a few decades and after the Horus lineage had established itself as rulers, I finally knew what period I was currently in. The current ruler of the lands of Egypt was called Ka known as the last pharaoh of the first dynasty. I knew from here on out I should be very careful not to throw human history out the window. I didn't want Enlil to end up sending a deluge that had nearly wiped out Mesopotamia's humanity again. So in short, the danger of changing history is a serious one. After all, imagine me killing someone who could be the ancestor of someone important like Albert Einstein, or I could end up making things worse. Messing with human history was like playing Russian roulette. The problem is that the gun is pointed at the humans. Have we arrived yet? Asked a voice. It was Hermod, and he had been asking that same question ever since we left the lands of Horus. No. And I already said, I'll let you know when we get close to Nibru, so you don't have to ask every second. Said Rist, annoyed. It seemed that Hermod was just annoying others out of boredom. I understood my brother, after all I was bored too. I know, I know, but I don't understand why we're walking, said Hermod, grumbling. Sif then replied. 
It is not advisable to appear out of nowhere by teleportation in a territory that does not belong to us, there may be misunderstandings, said Sif. That was one of the problems of the trip. We had to walk most of the time. We were approaching the city of Nipper, due to it being the city that most worshipped Enlil. But mostly, the only city that could know Enlil's location that was our problem the exact location of Enlil. The Anunnaki lived on another place called Nibiru, which was a planet, and they teleported to an island on planet Earth that served as a meeting place for the Anunnaki. The island was called Dilmum, the abode of the gods or land of the living. The problem was that Enlil was expelled from there. The reason? Enlil tried to violate Ninlal. The strange thing was that Ninlal loved Enlil and was betrothed to him. The confusion was why Enlil did it before the wedding. So yes Enlil was thrown out of the house for being unable to hold his pants. It was then that Enlil ended up living in Kerr, home of Ereshkigal, for some time. Until Ninlal went to Kerr in search of Enlil who, for some reason, found it amusing to disguise himself as Nurgil, the guardian of the gates of the realm of Ereshkigal, and demand sexual favors in exchange for passages through the gate. Yes, I suppose Enlil had a very strange fetish that could be accused of being a pervert. But again, Enlil's brother did worse Enki. I don't know how this bastard can look at himself in the mirror. The reason for my displeasure was simple Enki was the god of wisdom, water, fecundity, and creation, but he was known as a somewhat promiscuous god. Once Enki had intercourse with Ninhursag. His own sister. But it was not just that. After some time, Ninhursag ended up leaving Enki due to her brother-husband's constant betrayals. However, Enki still missed his sister lover, it was then that sometime later Enki noticed a young goddess who looked very similar to his lover. Enki then slept with this goddess. Plot twist. Turns out the goddess was his daughter with Ninhursag. But it wasn't just that it gets worse. It turns out that this goddess, daughter of Enki with Ninhursag, left Enki alone too. Problem is, she was pregnant too. And yes, this goddess had a daughter. And that daughter also ended up sleeping with Enki, her own grandfather. It turns out that the great niece daughter also left Enki. But by some luck, Ninhursag found out what was going on and ended up stopping this thing before it went any further, and Enki ended up fucking a daughter niece great granddaughter, too. In short, Enki slept with his sister, his daughter niece, his daughter niece granddaughter. Ugh I have to keep Sif, wrist, and hell away from this guy. It was then that I saw a small town in the distance. I think we had finally reached the city of Nipper. POV. Third person. As the group approached the city, Thor removed a small amulet from his storage necklace. It was Utgard's shrinking amulet. The same amulet was used to shrink the Jodans during the Utgard challenges years ago. Thor had taken it for himself. Basic rule spoils of war. Why would Thor wear the shrink amulet? Well, to mortals an 8 feet man walking around was definitely no ordinary human. So what's the plan? Asked Sif. Thor then looked at the group. We will separate, it will be faster get information from priests and merchants, said Thor. Vali, however, could not understand why. I can understand the priests but why merchants? Asked Vali. Thor then replied. Enlil is known as the god of the sky, and current leader of the Anunnaki, he is also the god of the wind according to my father, when Enlil sleeps, it is possible to hear his snoring according to the wind. As merchants are the ones who travel the most, we will ask them if they heard any voices in the wind during their travels from one city to another, said Thor. Although the priests could inform the holy sites, there were many places to investigate. With the legends of the merchants, Thor believed it would be possible to delimit the search area of Enlil's resting place. The group then nodded. How long will we have to get this information? Ask Hel. Thor then looked toward the horizon and saw that he had a few minutes until the sun went down. Our meeting point will be downtown, as far as time goes until sunset, said Thor. It was then that at that moment Rist spoke. This is a city full of mortals, so please be discreet. We don't want to draw attention, especially since no Anunnaki know of our existence on their territory, and we weren't even welcomed by the guests right so be careful, Rist said. The Valkyrie was worried for a reason. Unlike the lands of Horus no one came to welcome them and offer accommodation for the guests rights. At the moment the Nordic group could be considered a hostile group in foreign lands, and that was never a good thing. The Norse group then split up and began information with the local mortals. Even individually, some of the group stood out. Like Thor, even at 6-5 feet due to the shrink amulet, he still drew attention with his red-colored hair. A rather unusual color in that location. 
As Thor walked he ended up catching the attention of some people it was then that a child, who was running and looking back, bumped into Thor's leg and fell to the ground. Thor looked at the child and then heard a voice. Stop the thief. Said a voice, shouting. It was easy for Thor to understand the language of mortals, after all, gods or supernatural beings don't have this problem. Thor then looked towards the voice, and I saw a man, looking furious, running towards him with a kind of club in his hand. It was then that Thor noticed what he had in the child's hands a fruit. A single fruit. Thor then looked at the child's state and realized that she was a little malnourished, it looked like she hadn't eaten in a while. The man then drew closer and closer to the child and raised his club. Enough. It's the second time you've done this in my store, the first time I let it go because your mother knew how to please me, but she's not here to calm me down anymore, I'll teach you about what happens to people who try to steal from me. Shouted the man, as he raised his club ready to hit the child. It was then that a hand grabbed the club before it hit the child. The man glared at the owner of the hand. Only to pale as two amber eyes dipped in two black pools stared at him. The man, obviously scared, just thought of one thing as he looked into those eyes. Monster. Thor then applied some pressure and caused the club to be crushed by the grip. The Norse god then looked at the child who was on the ground, still frightened by the situation. Give back what you stole said Thor. The child appeared to have awakened from its trance as it looked at Thor and then towards the fruit. It looked like she was considering Thor, knowing the child must be desperate for food, spoke once more. Give it back, and I'll give you something better take my word for it, Thor said as he held out his hand to the child. The child had no reason to trust Thor. The only person the child trusted was the mother. But Thor's words were tempting. Okay grumbled the child. The child then handed the fruit to Thor, who nodded and then looked at the man who was still scared. Thor then grabbed the man's arm and handed the fruit into his palm. The man then looked towards the fruit and then towards Thor, and only then towards the child. It seemed that the man wanted to say something more towards the child, but he didn't have a chance to speak, as he was soon interrupted. You better go or the next thing I'm going to crush is your arm, said Thor. Needless. To say, the man believed every word Thor said as he ran in the direction he came from. Thor, seeing that the man had left, looked around and saw that he had caught the public's attention. The Norse god then looked at the girl and then knelt down, so that he was closer to the child's height and didn't look so intimidating. You have someone? I heard from the man that you had a mother, could you take me to her? Asked Thor softly. Truth be told Thor didn't exactly know how to handle this situation, after all, he acted more on instinct. It was then that the girl looked sad. Mother is not here anymore she is in curse said the child. Through those words, Thor knew that the girl's mother had died and was now in the realm of Ereshkigal. So, what about dad? Do you know where he is? Asked Thor. The girl looked confused. Mother said that father traveled, but that he will come back someday to get me, said the child. Thor looked at the child it was then that he noticed the strange looking eyes she had. Then Thor noticed something solar divine energy. There were no doubts the child was a demigod. Well, could you follow me? I'll give you some food maybe we could talk a little while you eat? Asked Thor. Hearing the word food the child immediately waved. Thor then walked along with the child towards the group's meeting place. So, what's your name? Asked Thor. The child then looked at Thor. I am Abana, I have eight summers. And you? Asked the child. Call me Thor, how old am I? Let's just say I'm a little old, said Thor with a small smile. The child looked a little confused but kept walking. It was then that Thor spent the rest of the afternoon talking and feeding little Abana Thor? Asked a voice. Thor then looked towards the voice and saw Sif, along with the rest of their group, approaching. Oh. Who is the brat? Are you a nanny now? Asked Hermod. Abana looked irritated as it looked like Hermod was insulting her. The brat is a little friend I made, her name is Abana as for if I'm her nanny? She's too smart for that, said Thor. Vali didn't seem satisfied with the answer. I thought you'd get information too said Vali. Thor looked unconcerned. Hey Abana, could you tell them, what you had told me about the conversation between two traders, while you were at the market, buying fruit, asked Thor, with a smile. Abana, due to being a petty thief from a young age, was very attentive to her surroundings and paid attention to everything. Including the conversation between two traders on the market today. A trader who came from Shurupak was delirious when he arrived here, he said he heard a voice during his journey here, on a goat trail that runs from the Euphrates to Isin, Abana said. When the child said this information, Rist soon spoke. 
I got information from a priest about a small lake in that place. It says it's sacred because it was where Tiamat was defeated by Enlil, said Drist. Thor then nodded. Well, we've got somewhere to go, let's find a place to spend the night and head out in the morning, said Thor. And while the child? Asked Sif, looking at Abana. Abana looked unchanged. The young child was forced to grow up amid the current situation. No father since birth. And now with the mother dead, she had been living on the streets of Nipper for a few months now. Learn to steal to survive. But as a child it was unlikely that she would survive long in a world that was violent and, above all cruel. The Nordic group knew it would be a death sentence, maybe could she come with us? Asked Hell uncertainly. The group was silent. For good reason. They were supernatural beings. Worst. Some of them were gods. The child, as much as she had divine blood in her veins, was part of the society of the men of the Anunnaki gods, and did not know the supernatural beyond praising the gods. It was then that the group looked to the unofficial leader. Thor. Abana, do you have someone you can trust completely? Asked Thor. Thor hoped that Abana had someone a relative or even a friend of her mother's. The child seemed to consider before responding innocently. Yes Abana trusts Abana. Said Abana. Thor softened his gaze. Want to come with us until you get someone else? Asked Thor. It was at this moment that Rist seemed to want to interrupt, but Sif put a hand on the Valkyrie's shoulder and stopped Rist from complaining about the Asgardian prince's actions. Meanwhile, Abana seemed to consider. The trust established by Abana and Thor was something simple and fragile food. Abana was hungry and would trust Thor as he still delivered food to her. But the food was finite, could Abana trust Thor after the food ran out? The rational answer would be no. In fact, the answer would be no when a stranger offered free food. Abana had learned long ago that nothing was really for free. The young woman suspected that the food was poisoned or, at the very least, drugged with something. The young woman knew of stories about people who offered temptations like free house and food, and ended up attracting young people, only to be raped and or made slaves to be sold later in another foreign city. But extreme hunger was what guided the young woman's actions. It was hard to think when your stomach was empty. For Abana, the moment Thor offered free food, her survival instincts prevailed with the following options. Or you refuse free food and you have a chance of not waking up tomorrow to see the sun, just like mom. Or you accept the food, which may be poisoned or drugged, and you have a chance to survive one more day, but you risk being kidnapped. At that moment, Abana had chosen the second option. And as Thor talked to Abana for a while a line of trust as thin as a hair's breadth was established between the two. Abana wants to go with bloody hair. Said Abana, pointing at Thor. The child believed that if she went with Thor, she would survive longer ironically, for what was to come, it was the right decision. Very good. Let's go Abana, let's sleep outside the city, if you have anything you want to take you better go get it now said Thor. The child, however, refused. Abana doesn't have anything, so Abana don't need to take anything, said Abana. Thor looked at the child. And then the Norse god of thunder grabbed her and placed her on his shoulder, where the child sat. For Abana, who has never seen anything from above, she felt like a giant. Well, let's change that with time, said Thor, as he started to walk. The group then followed Thor towards the exit of the city. But Rist was still afraid. Everyone felt that the child was a demigod. The Valkyrie was worried that this would cause trouble between the Anunnaki and the Asgardians. Sai I just hope you know what Prince Thor is doing, muttered Rist, before following the group. And so days passed and now the group was on the lake, next to the Euphrates River, and a goat trail used by shepherds. Thor thought it best for Hel and Hermod to stay at the camp with Abana. After all, she would be meeting an important god, and the girl might not understand the situation. To Abana, the group seemed to be just on a treasure hunt. It was then that the group heard something one voice. No a noise. Zzz, 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 whispered the wind. Yes, Enlil was definitely sleeping. Very well, look for some cave protected with a barrier, follow the sound of the noise, the louder the sound, the closer you will be said Thor. The group then waved and scattered around the place. But it looked like the search area was going in only one direction to the north. A short time later, Sif had found a cave that seemed to be where the snoring noise was coming from. So and now? Asked Sif. Thor replied. Let's go into the cave if we find Enlil still sleeping, we'll have to be a little careful, said Thor. Most of the group understood, but Vali still asked. Why do we have to be careful when we wake up Enlil? Asked Vali. 
It was then that Rist answered, as the group entered the cave. Because most of the time Zenlil was forced to wake up, he caused many floods in these lands, and, he is in the top 10 strongest existences for good reason, said Rist. As the group went deeper and deeper into the cave, the snoring noise seemed more and more noticeable, until they reached the deepest part of the cave, and saw a man lying on a kind of bed. Undoubtedly it was Enlil. So how do we do this? Did we just pour water on his face? Asked Sif. Most of the group looked uncertain except for one. Hey! Enlil! Wake up you lazy bones! Shouted Vali. Thor then placed his hand over Vali's mouth and stopped him from speaking further. Amazingly, Enlil slept on even after Vali's shouting. However Enlil's face showed discomfort, and then, at the same time, the earth began to shake. Thor looked at Vali. When this is over, I'll consider whether I need to sew your mouth together, said Thor. The earth shook even more, and the group looked more and more worried. All right, let's go with Sif's idea, said Thor. The Norse god of thunder then took a small water canteen from the necklace's storage and ran towards Enlil. Thor then poured water on Enlil's face. It was effective. As soon as the water spurted on Enlil's face, the leader of the Sumerian pantheon opened his eyes. Ah! Shouted Enlil, getting up quickly. The god Enyanaki, as soon as he calmed down, looked around and noticed the Norse group. Who are you? Asked Enlil, confused. It was then that in the next few minutes the group went on to explain who they were and why they were there. Enlil listened attentively to the group in the explanation, but during this conversation, a figure appeared at the entrance of the cave. It was Hermod. Hey! What the hell did you do? You need to see what happened out there, said Hermod quickly. Everyone inside the cave then ran outside to see what Hermod was talking about. When the group left the cave, which was located on a mountain and saw on the horizon a deluge. A deluge that had already hit some cities. Everyone then looked at Enlil, who had a hand on his face. Sigh not again grumbled Enlil. It was then that Thor noticed that the Sumerian god didn't exactly care about mortals who had possibly died. The Sumerian god regretted that he ended up causing a flood unintentionally. Thor then looked at the group. Find Helen tell her to put some sleep spell on Abana, make the child forget this moment I will search the area for survivors, said Thor. The thunder god then activated the lightning armor and shot towards the devastated cities. For Thor, what happened was a disaster, and now the Norse god believes he has affected the history of mankind however, for fate, this deluge was supposed to happen. POV Thor. Finding survivors were rare. Floods already wreaked havoc in my time apart from a few deaths. But floods in antiquity? It was a death sentence. Cities were destroyed, houses demolished, and buried in mud. Scattered around the place were piles of bodies of young, or old. It wasn't a pretty sight but I still found survivors, they looked at me, and seemed to cry out for help I obviously helped them and left them in safe and high places where they could rest. They called me a dad. I didn't know if they were mistaking me for someone else, or was the name they gave me. I didn't care what they called me. I had more important things to think about a good example. I knew there was going to be a flood in ancient Mesopotamia. After all, after the flood, it would be marked by the reign of Gilgamesh. But what bothered me was that it was my group that indirectly caused the flood. This would obviously make no sense, for the simple fact that my group in theory, would never have left north in the common timeline. I could only think of one thing fate was playing with me. It was kind of common knowledge that fate held a high position in the top 10 strongest existences, not because of raw power. But rather because of its ability to shape the history of most existences according to its will. Unfortunately, at the moment I couldn't do much about it, but when I have the opportunity I would meet with the agents of fate to settle the score. If fate changed events so that the flood happened due to my group's interference, what else changed? And if this change was due to my existence as well as interference, why wasn't I contacted by any of the agents of fate? After all, I will soon be a thousand years old I thought about possible answers as I rescued the survivors and buried the dead. But even after I finished my actions I didn't find an exact answer, just possibilities. At the time I was sitting near the camp, Abana was sleeping due to simple magic, and the rest of my group was asleep. Except for two. One was me, obviously, who had been on guard duty. But the other? It's really a shame I let my power slip a little, it's always frustrating not having control over something that's yours don't you agree Asgardian? Asked the person in front of me. Enlal. The current leader of the Anunnaki. I can't say the same thing, I've always kept my power under control as best I could I replied. This seemed to amuse Enlil. 
Oh, strange that seal on your back tells a different story said Enlil. Well, that surprised me a little. How do you know? I asked. I knew what my seal was, but at the time, I hadn't met anyone who realized that my back tattoo was actually a seal. Enlil hummed before answering. Many gods think that my little brother and I are mighty gods, however, if there is one thing my brother and I know it is about seals. After all, Enki was the one who sealed the Abzu millennia ago as he couldn't kill him, said Enlil. Oh yeah. The Enuma Elis. One of the first rebellions between generations of gods from the same pantheon. But there was something I was curious about this event. I learned that it was you who defeated Tiamat when she rose to avenge the defeat of her consort Abzu. I'm not questioning your strength, but there were legends about a kind of weapon, a sword to be exact, I said. When I stopped talking, he knew what I meant. Divine weapons are powerful things. A good example of this? The Hindus had their own divine weapons the Astras. They were the first divine weapons to be forged in addition to being known as the most powerful. But not all were tangible weapons when I go to India I would go alone, I had already told my group despite the complaints. Never would I let my group around beings with those kinds of weapons. Honestly, from thought stories, Astras were pretty powerful things if used correctly. Some beings are capable of destroying planet Earth just with the manifestation of the weapon. Of course, the weapons of the Hindu pantheon were frightening. But there was one that stood out Pashupatastra. This weapon was the main reason I was afraid to go to India with my group, I didn't want to risk anyone's life. But back to the question although the Hindus were the first to manufacture these weapons of mass destruction. Other pantheons have tried. The Anunnaki were one of them. You are quite discerning, Prince Thor. This is information that should not be told layman, said Enlil with a small smile. Just by Enlil's smile, it was clear that he was not happy. How did I realize this? Suddenly the wind stopped there was just absolute silence. It's not really secret information, but there are still few people who know about this weapon, and that it's used by you and your brother, for your bad luck I know that this type of weapon exists, I said. For a few seconds, Enlil was silent until the wind returned. Sigh. Well, in a few years it won't be a secret anymore, after all, it will be quite noticeable if any god saw the sword in simple terms, when Enki sealed the Abzu, the power of our primordial was connected to the sword, I admit that my brother and I are in a high position in the top 10 because of this sword. However, I want to know why you wanted to know about this? Asked Enlil. Then the sword was connected to the power of the primordial that was sealed well, that complicates it a little, I had ideas to do something similar, I said, admitting. Using Jolner has a problem. I couldn't use the unawakened Jolner without my gauntlets without my belt, the Majingjurd, I was probably dangerous enough to possibly cause Mjolnir to crack. This was something I was trying to get rid of. Mjolnir never woke up. And I had no idea how to forcefully wake him up. So I was looking to forge a powerful weapon that I could use as a replacement. If I use unawakened Mjolnir without at least my gauntlets I could break it. So I came up with the idea of forging a powerful weapon that could withstand my full strength, without my limiters. But I had no idea where to start. So I had to look in other pantheons for examples of weapons. As my old man had asked me to come and wake Enlil, I accepted the opportunity to catch only a brief glimpse of the weapon. The weapon is known by a name the Sword of Rupture. But as Enlil stated the sword was only connected to the power of the Abzu. So did that mean that the sword was only powerful, as long as it was connected to the power of the Abzu? If it's connected to the power of the Abzu what would happen if someone cut that connection? I asked. Enlil answered without hesitation. If that happened, the sword of rupture would then be an ordinary sword a tough and uniquely shaped sword, but still a mere sword, said Enlil. I was disappointed I very much doubt that such a sword would be enough to withstand my full strength, so I guess I have no choice I need to see an Astra. Only then can you consider forging a new weapon. However, this still remained in doubt. After all, I didn't know whether Enlil was telling the whole truth or half-truths or even lying. Enlil is not known as the god of truth. And since I don't want to fight him in this place and risk the safety of my group, I could only accept the answer silently and look for alternatives. I see you have my great-granddaughter said Enlil, looking at my group. In fact, Enlil ignored my entire group, there was only one person Enlil was interested in. Abana. Well, at least I was right about my suspicions. Abana was the daughter of Yudu, son of Enlil and god of the sun. I ran into her in town, she was alone I offered her to come with me, and she accepted the offer I replied. This seemed to have caught Enlil's attention. Do you want to take her? 
Ask Enlil. Enlil asked this question in a tone so bored. I admit it wasn't my original plan. But plans can change and it's up to me to adapt to the situation if necessary. Will you stop me? I said. Enlil didn't seem to mind. Not really, you can take it, I don't care about those half-bloods. It's a fact that for most of my pantheon humans are mere fun? Yes, fun is a good word to describe what we do with them, said Enlil. Abana will not be missed by the Anunnaki. That was the truth. For gods, especially the older ones, humans are mere entertainment. Enki himself had several sons and daughters with mortals. On the other hand, Enlil treated humans as if they were ants. If the ants bothered him too much, Enlil would kill the anthill. Well, thank you for waking me up. I will prepare for the meeting of the leading gods now, I wish you luck on your Asgardian travels, said Enlil, standing up. Enlil then walked a little until he stopped and turned to me. By the way, although our first meeting was peaceful as soon as you leave my territory, you are no longer welcome, as long as I am the leader, said Enlil. This surprised me. Is that what the term persona non grata feels like? May I at least know the reason? I asked. Enlil looked amused and pointed at me before replying. There's no way I'm going to let someone who has this type of seal in my territory roam free, it's too dangerous even for me. While I do not care for humans, I do care for my land, I will not let it possibly be destroyed if you end up releasing the seal, said Enlil. So the reason is the berserker brand I'm not going to lie and say it's not justifiable, even I'm afraid to release the seal. I don't know what I would become. How long am I allowed on your lands? I asked. Enlil thought for a moment before answering. Half millennium, nothing more, nothing less. You have been respectable enough so far, therefore I have trusted you for this time, do not betray my trust this guardian said Enlil. Well half millennium is not so bad. I think he said that number for the simple fact that he is one of the oldest gods in this world. Half a millennium must be considered by Enlil, but one more week. As long as Enlil had authorized us to be here, there was one good thing about it. I could go after the plant that was located at the bottom of the sea in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the place would come to be known as the Persian Gulf. The main reason to find this plant? Abana was still mortal. Thank you for allowing us to stay on your lands, we will respect the guest law, I said. Enlil just waved and then the body of the leader of the Anunnaki turned to wind and disappeared into the night. I just went back to camp and sat by the fire, I could only think of what fate had in store for me. If during all this time none of the agents came to me I have to look for them. Maybe after this journey of mine, I have to go to the Norns to talk specifically about my destination. But again, the Norns don't speak the fate of each existence lately, maybe I have to bribe? It's no use thinking about it now I have more important things to think about. I have to go to China to learn Tauki. I have to go to India to learn the spiritual side, so that I can have the possibility to bring hockey to this world, beyond the Astras. Aside from these places, there was one place I should go Greece. For a simple fact. If the current leader, who is Kronos, decided to close the borders of the Greek territory to other pantheons, I should invade. Why the hell would I invade the Greek pantheon? There were some beings I should know about. The Telkines. And as they were technically forgotten by their leaders, I could make good use of them. They were pretty underrated the main reason I wanted to meet them. These creatures were immune to magic. According to Frigg, not even Hecate's magic, during Uranus' rule, was effective on the Talkines. This could be useful considering that magic was quite common. Although I'd like to think more about my future plans I was tired. I then looked at the closest person and saw Hermod. Hermod, it's time for you to take your shift, I said, grabbing my brother and waking him up. Ugh. Is it my turn yet? Asked Hermod. I didn't respond and just summoned my water canteen and threw it in his face. This seemed to have effectively awakened Hermod. Oh. No need to do this. I'm awake. Said Hermod. I just released him and walked towards my tent. Tomorrow I will start my searches on the seabed for the plant of youth. Time. Current era 2690 BCE, Thor. 1310 years old, POV. Third person. And so years passed, until years turned into decades, and decades turned into centuries, the Asgardian group remained in the Anunnaki territory for over 300 years, though they visited Asgard from time to time for celebrations or other important events. The reason Thor chose to remain in Anunnaki territory was for learning reasons. If there was anything else Thor wanted to know, it was about the sealing magic that Enki was so well known for. 
For Thor, it was an advanced form of magic that would take centuries to learn after all, it was this magic that sealed a primordial. Thor didn't have so much patience anymore. The Thunder God had spent over seven centuries learning Thoth's self-healing technique, and he wasn't willing to spend more centuries to learn a technique he might never use, so Thor set out to learn the basics. Elemental Sealing Magic Immobilization Sealing Spell Simple sealing spells, but if used correctly can be of great help. A good example was Elemental Sealing Magic, although Thor may have a high immunity towards the lightning element, the other elements can hurt, it was then that Thor had the idea of learning elemental sealing magic, so that he would be more confident to fight beings with weapons that use elements other than lightning. As the Astra of the Hindu fire god, Anai. The Agni Astra. An Astra capable of producing flames that cannot be extinguished by natural means simply put, did Thor think the Hindus wielded the most powerful weapons? The answer would be yes. The Astra considered weakest was the Angelic Astra, an Astra that will decapitate the target it hits, it was the only Astra without much absurd destructive power. But the rest of the Astras? They held such fearsome destructive power that it was the main reason Thor told his group that they will not accompany him to India. After learning these sealing spells, Thor headed to a city, alone the reason was to buy new food for his group. Thor, wearing the amulet of shrinkage, walked along the path until he reached Uruk, protected city of Anu, another sky god, and father of the Anunnaki, as well as their former leader. It was then that Thor noticed that two people were approaching, it looked like these two people were coming from Uruk Thor, then greeted the two people, who were a man and a woman, just as Abana had spoken. Kadra. Greetings, said Thor. The man and the woman spoke. Kadra. Thor then spoke. I'm a traveler my group and I are camping nearby, I'm heading towards Uruk to buy supplies, by any chance could you tell me about the town market? Asked Thor, looking at the man and woman. The man and woman didn't respond for some time before exchanging glances. Traveler, I know it's too much to ask. But could you accompany us on a mission? Do you have the physique of a warrior, maybe you can help us, and then I will accompany you to Uruk, I am a hunter, but my father is a farmer. I can convince him to give you a share of the harvest in exchange for your help, you will not need pay, said the man. It was then that the woman spoke. Yes, and if that's not enough perhaps I can pay by other means, I'm well known in Uruk by men as one of the best priestesses in the temple of the goddess Inanna, the woman said with a small smile. It was then that Thor looked at the woman more closely and noticed the garment. The Norse god realized that he was a priestess of Inanna. In simple terms a harlot. A hunter and a harlot. This situation was a little familiar to Thor. Just a little bit of the harvest is good, but first I want to know what kind of help, said Thor. It was then that the manhunter said quickly responded. There is a man who looks and behaves like an animal that is said to come from the woods of Adam, this being is killing my hunts, and he is big and strong, a monster I tell you. I went to Uruk to talk to the king, but he only said to take one of Inanna's priestesses, according to the king, the animal will return to being a man after spending time in the arms of a woman, said the man-hunter. Thor was increasingly familiar with the situation. But to be sure I beg your pardon, I'm from far away could you tell me, who is the current king of Uruk? Asked Thor. The man and woman gave him strange looks, but the woman replied. The king of men Gilgamesh said the woman. This confirmed Thor's suspicions, as well as the situation he found himself in the hunter and the harlot are heading towards the being that was created by the gods to challenge Gilgamesh and Kidu, the beast. So will you be able to help us in exchange for free food? Asked the hunter, raising his hand. Thor then smiled. Deal, Thor said as he reached up and shook the hunter's hand. POV. Third person. So what's the plan to attract the beast? Asked Thor, looking at the hunter. At that moment, Thor, who was accompanying the hunter and the priestess of Inanna, was in a small clearing where there was a source of water. According to the hunter, this was the most likely place for the beast to come and drink water along with the other animals. Well, we are following King Gilgamesh's advice, when the beast arrives, the priestess will undress to seduce him, only then the beast will become a man, replied the hunter. Thor just stared at the hunter. You're kidding, right? Asked Thor. The hunter denied it. No sir. It was the advice the king gave me, he is the son of the great goddess Ninsuna, who is a goddess able to see the future and interpret men's dreams, so the king's advice must work, said the hunter. Thor couldn't help but think of the hunter's idiocy. However, Thor only thought about the future if he were part of this adventure, so he was willing to wait. Sigh. Alright, when you're done I'll be waiting for you by that mountain, just follow the smoke, 
I'll always have fire lit, Thor said, as he pointed to the mountain and walked towards it. The priest is soon interrupted. Now wait a minute. Will you leave me at the mercy of the beast? I know my job, but what if the beast attacks me? I thought you would be my security, said the priestess. Thor didn't even stop walking towards the mountain. So I hope your goddess loves her priests as much as she loves her lovers, said Thor. And with that, the Norse god walked away, leaving the perplexed priestess and hunter behind. Thor was in no hurry, he knew the beast was Enkidu himself, the being that was created by the Anunnaki in response to Gilgamesh's rule. The Norse god knew that Gilgamesh's rule could be considered controversial. Gilgamesh was said to be a pragmatic king according to legends, he was neither completely good nor completely evil with his people. He was from a certain point of view competent. The problem was that, like any man, Gilgamesh is a sinner. One of the king's most well-known sins was lust. Even so, Thor wanted to meet the king of men, as he knew he could be special. Although Thor knew that in the DXD world humans were greatly underestimated, the Norse god wanted to make sure humans could be considered a force to be reckoned with. And who better to prove it than the hero recognized as the oldest? Thor wanted to know for one simple reason. Although Thor had obtained the plant of youth for Abana, the Norse god managed to find four more of these plants on the seafloor, and managed to transfer and grow them in his home in Midgard. Thor had found a total of five plants of youth. Considering that one plant was given to an Abana, there were only four left. If Thor could figure out if humans were special, even before the Holy Gears, then the Norse god had plans to recruit some humans. The reason Thor did such an action was for one simple reason on the Thunder God's first millennium birthday, Baldr had given him a castle. The God of Light already gave a name for the castle the Thorn Rudhamer, Thrudheim. And for the moment, the castle was empty. It had no inhabitant. Thor had denied any inhabitant because he had no letter who could manage the castle in his absence, as the castle was located in Asgard. The Norse god was thinking of recruiting mighty and forgotten humans who could run the castle which, in the future, will be accommodating Einarjar. Abana happened to become one of the powerful humans that Thor ended up recruiting, due to the demigoddess's potential being high. Until now Thor had thought of just one more human, even if his birth is far away. In the Crusades to be exact, but which of the Crusades Thor didn't remember exactly. Thor only knew that this human was one of the greatest warriors in history, as well as an exemplary leader. But this man was unlucky enough to have been born at the same time as much more important figures. So much so that even Thor himself at the moment couldn't remember the warrior's name. The Norse god only knew that this warrior had fought alongside a leper king. Thor hoped to remember this warrior's name when the time came. Thor remembered only this man's cognomen. The young. But now, Thor still needed to know about humanity's potential, so the Norse god waited for hours. Until hours turned into days. It wasn't until the morning of the seventh day that Thor was greeted by the hunter, the priestess and a mixture of man and animal. Inkidu. Thor noticed that for some reason the priestess had a passionate look on her face when she looked at Inkidu. Although, Inkidu looked depressed. Thor then stood up and walked towards the small group. This seemed to alert Inkidu, who growled in response. Thor then stopped in front of Inkidu. Submate, said Thor, holding up his hand. This action seemed to have confused not only Enkidu, but the hunter and priestess as well. What is up mate? Asked the hunter, whispering to the priestess. The priestess just shrugged. He said he was a traveler, maybe he's from a long way off, and that's how his people greet each other? Said the priestess, uncertain. Whether the priestess was right or not didn't matter. However, strangely enough, Enkidu tried to imitate the gesture. Sup? Said Enkidu uncertainly. Thor then looked at the hunter. So are we leaving? Asked Thor. Thor's action was soon forgotten when the question was asked. Not exactly, you see, it would not be suitable for our friend to accompany us to Yurik in his present state of attire, said the hunter. Inkidu, due to being raised among animals, was wearing the same clothes as them none. Thor, understanding the situation, just nodded. Okay I'll wait a little longer, I hope you still remember your end of the bargain, said Thor. In fact, Thor had notified his group via Arun of his possible absence for a week. Although Thor went to Uruk to buy supplies, the camp could still last 10 days without purchasing supplies. Surely sir, I honor my word, said the hunter. It was at this moment that, for the first time, Inkidu spoke. Where are we going? Asked Inkidu rudely. Although he lived among animals for most of his life, Inkidu had full knowledge of the local dialect. He just wasn't used to talking. Who answered was none other than the priestess. 
my lover, we will make you presentable so that you can enjoy the great city of Yurik, said the priestess, as she took Enkidu's hand and dragged him back along the path to the city of Yurik. Thor just looked at the priestess strangely. Wondering where the word lover came from. Thor looked to the hunter for answers, and the hunter seemed to get the message. The king's advice worked, and for six days the priestess tamed the beast to make it more human-like, but it seems that the priestess became very attached to the beast the hunter said. From the play on words, Thor understood. For six days the priestess had intercourse with Enkidu. And it seems that this made the priestess a little attached to the new lover. The Norse god just shrugged and then decided to follow the priestess. By late afternoon of the same day, the group was heading towards the city of Uruk, with Enkidu now having clothes. The priestess was still clutching one of Enkidu's arms as if she were a maiden in love. So what is your king like? Asked Thor. This seemed like a bit of a complicated question, as the priestess and the hunter exchanged a look. He is a capable ruler, said the hunter. Actually, he's just a little insatiable, said the priestess. Thor asked this question just to be sure, after all, the writing of the famous epic could have been done by men for political purposes. The problem with humans was that they always changed things to be more favorable to their will. This was something Thor learned from Thoth. Humans will never record their history impartially, so there will always be inconsistencies. For Thoth, this is due to the very nature of humans. The god of knowledge claimed that even if humans knew the meaning of the word impartiality, they would never act this way. It was then that Enkidu spoke. Insatiable? Asked Enkidu, confused. The priestess seemed to give a sad smile. Our king is a great warrior, he built together with volunteers the walls of our great city, we were never threatened by some rival city again, we never went hungry again, the criminality of our city is almost none due to the fear of being punished for our king, but said the priestess, before stopping to speak, as if afraid. Enkidu looked more confused. But? Asked Enkidu, waiting for the priestess to continue. But it was the hunter who answered. But, there is always the other side, the volunteers are the men, young or old, that the king took from their homes to serve in the buildings or the army, no one can go against King Gilgamesh because he's too strong, capable of raising mountains, and while the men work. The king sleeps with any woman who catches his eye, whether married or not, said the hunter. Thor remained silent, while Enkidu looked irritated. Forced? Asked Enkidu. The priestess gave a hollow laugh. This matters? A man of power that has never known limits, that is our king. He even declared during his reign that any marriage within his lands he must be present, in addition to the first night decree being his, said the priestess. Basically, any man who decided to marry in the lands of Uruk, the groom would have to cede his bride to Gilgamesh on the night known as wedding night, in order for the king to approve the marriage. Why don't man and woman unite in another land? Asking Kidu, still irritated. The hunter laughed at the question. Ha 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 ha. Let me tell you what King Gilgamesh once said to the people of Uruk. Don't worry about our enemies, because everything that the sun touches belongs to me, and forever I will defend what is mine, may have seemed arrogant, but he kept his word. No one threatened Uruk after Gilgamesh showed his strength, however controversial it is, we feel safe in Uruk, said the hunter. Enkidu was silent. I want to meet this king, said Enkidu. It might have seemed like a simple statement, but Thor sensed Enkidu's displeasure when he said king. Location. Uric throne room. POV. Third person. In a throne room, which could be described as extravagant due to its golden adornments, a man sat on a throne made of gold. The man could be described as powerful, not only because of his physical size, but also because of the clothes he wore. Gold ornaments adorned their clothes that appeared to be made of the highest quality material. The man was currently drinking some wine as he thought about what his mother had said about the dream he had several years ago. The man was questioning the interpretation of the dream that his mother made. The meteor represents that someone you will face will be your equal in power, it symbolizes that soon you will have a friend who will be like your own brother, although the lightning that struck you, waking you from your dream, it can symbolize many things because lightning is always unpredictable, said the man, reciting what his mother had said. The man's mother even warned him about the upcoming confrontation. Phew ha ha. As if any mongrel could even cogitate the idea of calling me a friend, said the man, scoffing. Although the man respected his mother, there were things she said that were meaningless in the man's opinion. Man has never known anyone who could match him. For that reason, he never considered anyone his friend. For the simple fact that he considered that for someone to be his friend, he must first be his equal. However, an unpredictable lightning unpredictable few ha 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 ha. A change of pace should be acceptable. 
After all, predictable is so boring. Said the man, laughing. This man is no stranger to the unpredictable. Even because its very existence was considered something unpredictable. But the man never cared. In fact, the only thing he cared about was his self-proclaimed fate to be the pride of mankind. To be the greatest king the world has ever seen. Those were his ambitions. A king who will be remembered for all eternity for defying the supernatural. And when his name is recited, it will echo through time. His name will be adored by many and hated by the envious. The king of men, that was his title and his name was Gilgamesh. Location. Asgard Palace Throne Room. POV. Third Person. In the throne room of the Norse gods, a meeting was taking place to discuss a somewhat complicated situation. Odin, king of the Asgardians, looked at the gods in the room, and then spoke. I'll be brief, for some reason Nidhagr has left the lands of Niflheim and is on a collision course to Midgard at high speed, I want you to send search parties to the lands of Niflheim and the land of the dead, especially in Nastrand, to investigate the reason for Nidhagr's wrath, said Odin. While most of the gods nodded in response, there were a few that didn't understand a thing. My king what about Nidhugr? Jormungandr is no longer on the shores of Midgard, and Thor has not yet returned to Midgard from his journey, so there is nothing to stop the Malice Striker from destroying Midgard. Maybe it's time to contact Prince Thor said Eger, God of Seas. Odin just smiled in response. Don't worry I've already sent someone to take care of Nidhugr, said Odin. Location. Midgard Coast. Future Norway. POV. Third person. In a small boat, there were two men, probably father and son, who were fishing to collect food for the rest of the family, in the face of the approaching winter, however. They were heading back to the fjord after an unsuccessful fishing trip. I don't understand, yesterday we came to this place and it was full of fish, but now there's nothing. Said the younger man, complaining. Patience leave, sometimes the gods look at us smiling, but not every time they look at us with a smile, so that they teach us to be more patient, said the older man. The younger man, identified as Leaf, just looked at his father. But dad, that never happened, the fish are behaving strangely, like they're running and hiding, Leaf said. The older man looked at his son. The fish are a gift from the gods to feed us. Your wife is about to give birth to your child, and I understand that you have a duty to bring food to your family. But it's no use complaining about our current situation, so be patient my son. Also, remember we have July during the solstice, so you'll be fine, just ration food until then, said the older man. This older man was called Gorm. He was always a worshipper of the gods and always respected them. Mostly one god in particular. Thor. The reason for their worship of this god was quite simple. Thor had saved him and his family from a monster when he was only 13 summers. At the time, his family had moved near a big lake, the strange thing was that there was no other family around beside him. However, despite this unusual fact, his family settled on that lake for five moons, until the winter solstice arrived. It was on the night of the winter solstice that something strange happened. A song. A song began to play through the night. Gorm didn't even realize he had gotten up from his bed, along with his entire family, and they left the house and walked through the snow towards the lake. His father, Arvid, was closer to the lake, as mesmerized by the music as he was. Gorm watched his father enter the lake and disappear into the water. Just as his mother was about to disappear into the waters too, the sky roared again. And Gorm saw a man with red hair suddenly appear in a chariot drawn by two goats. Gorm knew who the man was from the stories his mother told Thor. Gorm then saw Thor jump out of his chariot and plunge into the waters of the lake. And then the music stopped. And so Gorm had control of his body again, his mother then ran to catch up to Gorm and his sister Sigridr, and drive them away from the lake. It was then that Gorm saw him once more. Thor leaving the lake, with Gorm's father being carried on his shoulders. And another man with his hands and feet joined like a fish, being held by the neck and dragged out of the lake, by Gorm legends, assumed it was a Grim, a troll that lives in the waters, and lures men and women into the water with music, with the intention of drowning them to eat their flesh. During that moment, Grim was screaming. Please. Forgive me. I was just eating. I am starving. Yelled the Grim, grabbing Thor's arm and trying to free himself. Gorm has never been so impressed by a god. It was then that Thor took Gorm's father back home and laid him by the fire, and then Thor made several bags appear, as well as several items that look like toys. Undress him and put dry clothes and keep him near the fire, in the bags, there are food and toys for the children. Thor said to Gorm's mother, 
who was still surprised about what had happened. Thor then left, still holding Grimm by the neck. The Grimm was now cursing. Let me go Asgardian. I was just eating. You will cause a war with my race if you kill me, do you hear me? Yelled the Grimm. Gorm only saw Thor stop and lift Grimm to look him in the eye. The leader of your race told my father about a deserter from his people. A deserter who didn't follow my father's decree to abandon the acts of eating humans, even though there are alternatives of food, I have all the power to punish those who don't heed my father's decrees, Thor said with a smile. Gorm then saw that a line of red color appeared on one of Thor's hands. It was then that Gorm witnessed Thor tie the legs of the Grimm, who was now screaming for forgiveness, the chariot pulled by goats. Thor then climbed into the chariot and looked at the Grimm. You and I are going for a walk. Ha 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 said Thor, laughing looking at the Grimm. It was then that Gorm saw the chariot shoot into the skies and violently pull the Grimm. That day would be forever marked in Gorm's life so much, that he told the same story to his children. For Gorm, the winter solstice became special. It was then that Gorm created a celebration to thank Thor on this day. The July. A celebration to be celebrated by the family, and dedicate this day to Thor. He made sure to tell his closest friends to do this celebration too, Gorm had just created and spread a tradition. I know that dad, it's just it's really weird, Leif said. Leif had been fishing in that spot for years, that spot always had a good amount of fish, but now there were no fish. It was then that the sea suddenly turned violent, startling the father and son duo, shaking the boat. And then something came out of the sea, next to the boat. It looked like a snake with wings on the sides of its body. It was Nidhogger. The snake then noticed the boat with the two humans. Rura roared the serpent in fury. The leaf man had never been so afraid in his life. What is that thing? Leaf asked, screaming in fear. Leaf's father Gorm ignored his son's question, there were more important things to do. How to ensure food safety for his family, as well as protecting his son. Leaf, take the boat and go. Shouted Gorm. Gorm then did something that surprised Leaf. Gorm grabbed an axe and jumped off the boat falling into the sea and swimming as far away from the boat as possible. This seemed to have caught the attention of Nidhogger, who looked at the action of the human who was doing a lot of movement. Dad! What are you doing? Come back here now! If that thing doesn't kill you, the water will! Shouted Leif. Leif's shout seemed to take Nidhogger's attention away from the man in the water. Nidhogger was now facing the boat. Until an axe hit Nidhogger's nose. The axe just bounced off Nidhogger's scales, the serpent didn't seem to have bothered, but his attention was now on the origin of the thrown axe. Gorm had thrown the axe from the water. Go away you fool. Rodaland, our family needs food. It's time for me to go to Valhalla. I back quote L, I'll be waiting for you. Shouted Gorm, drawing even more attention from Nidhogger. It was then that Nidhogger was about to attack Gorm. But then something happened. Bam a white-haired man appeared out of nowhere and punched Nidhogger in the head, and with the force of the blow, sent the great serpent Nidhogger towards the beach, causing a shock wave and creating violent waves in the sea. It was Balder. The god of light then noticed a man in the sea and then floated towards him. Want a hand? Asked Balder, with a small smile. Gorm then took Balder's offered hand. Balder then pulled Gorm from the sea and floated towards the fishing boat, where Leif was looking in disbelief at what had happened. Balder then left Gorm in the boat and remained aloft until he noticed the empty fishing net, and then looked at the father-son duo and spoke calmly. I advise you to go a little further, towards the sunset, have a good fishing, said Balder, with a bigger smile. The god of light then looked towards where he had sent Nidhogger, and the welcoming smile faded from his face. An aura of golden color then surged from Balder's body, and then the god quickly disappeared from the fisherman's eyes. Boom Gorm and Leif held on to the boat as a new shock wave surged up and shook the boat, and then looked towards the source. It was the same place that Nidhogger was. There was now a giant dust cloud rising in the sky. By Odin, said Gorm. It was then that Leif spoke. Father, change your clothes, or else death will give you a cold hug, Leif said quickly grabbing Gorm's clothes. But then Leif noticed something. Are they dry? Said Leif, confused. It was then that Gorm understood. Ha 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 ha. My son, I think we've just met the light of the gods, Gorm said, laughing with glee. The light of the gods. That was Balder's title from the mortal's perspective. What do we do now? Asked Leif. Gorm thought for a while, before looking at the giant dust cloud. Let's fish farther, towards where the sun rests, we'll fish while there was light, maybe we'll be luckier, Gorm said, with a smile. 
And so the father and son duo began to sail away, towards the sun, where they managed to catch the biggest fishery of all their lives. Meanwhile Thor was about to change history a bit. Again. Location. Mesopotamia Uruk Palace. POV. Third person. The city of Uruk. A city that was once ravaged by wars and natural disasters. But now, it was in a time of peace and prosperity, emerging victorious over any adversity. The townspeople believed that this was all because the current king was responsible for Uruk's current situation. A king who was a tyrant. But still, he was able to bring a golden age to Uruk. And now, this king was sitting on his throne made of gold, with a woman on his lap and drinking a cup of wine, while there was another woman nearby, who was responsible for carrying a jug full of wine to serve the king. Everything was calm. Until one of the guards quickly entered the throne room. My king. The hunter and the priestess have returned from their quest. They are being accompanied by a red-haired man and a thing, said the soldier. The king, Gilgamesh, remained calm. What are you waiting for then? That I go to meet them? Phew ha ha Don't be a fool, bring them here. Said Gilgamesh. The guard looked nervous. But my king, they are said the guard before being interrupted by a noise. Bam the massive golden doors were knocked down by something. Or rather someone. It was Enkidu. They are already here, my king, said the guard. Enkidu's appearance startled the people in the throne room, except for Gilgamesh. You false king. You tyrant shouted Enkidu, running towards Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh took the woman from his lap and threw the wine away. Enkidu collided with Gilgamesh causing an earthquake that shook the palace. The king and the beast faced each other, pushing their opponent with all their strength. While Enkidu looked furious, Gilgamesh looked confused. King Gilgamesh was recognized for being strong, being able to lift mountains on his shoulders easily. It was through this strength that he was never challenged by anyone else. But for the first time Gilgamesh didn't instantly overpower his opponent. Gilgamesh had found someone equal to him. Phew ha 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 ha. Not bad monster, not bad at all, said Gilgamesh pushing Enkidu. The castle floor began to crack under the strong pressure, the floor looked like it would give way at any moment. And the palace looked ready to fall. Enkidu. Enough. Said Thor entering the throne room, along with the hunter and the priestess. But Enkidu ignored him and continued to push Gilgamesh. More and more prominent cracks appeared in the palace. We have to get out of here or we're going to die. Shouted the hunter, taking the priestess. The priestess tried to free herself. No. We can't leave him. Gilgamesh will kill him. Said the priestess. The hunter didn't care and just dragged the priestess out of the throne room. Most had left the throne room. Except for three beings. Inkidu, Gilgamesh and Thor. Thor, watching the two face off in a test of strength. Very well, violence has always been the answer in this situation, said Thor. The Norse god quickly ran towards his first target. Gilgamesh. Bam and then he punched Gilgamesh in the face, sending him towards the wall, but it didn't stop there, the force was enough to make the wall give way, and Gilgamesh was sent flying out of the palace. Thor then looked at Enkidu, who was surprised. Bam and then the thunder god punched Enkidu's face with the back of his left hand, causing Enkidu to fly, and, like Gilgamesh, crash through the wall of the throne room. Sigh these two are more troublesome than I thought they would be, said Thor. The thunder god then left the throne room calmly. But then he heard it cutting through the air. Thor then quickly dodged. Whoosh the Norse god looked to the cause it was a sword. A sword that appeared to be made of gold. Thor then looked to the source and saw Gilgamesh standing at the wall that had been demolished. Gilgamesh no longer had an expression of interest. He had an expression of fury. I thought I got rid of mongrels like you, you stink of god. I'll make you know the pride of men, said Gilgamesh. There's something about Uruk. Gilgamesh had decreed that the gods would no longer be welcome in Uruk, not even Gilgamesh's own mother escaped the decree. This kind of decree was somewhat controversial, after all, Gilgamesh was a demigod. However, the king had stated that this realm was the realm of men, not the realm of gods. No gods came to Uruk after this decree. One question prevailed, how could a demigod succeed for gods to take his threat seriously? The answer was close to Thor. The thunder god looked at the golden sword, which was starting to disappear into golden dust, and then at Gilgamesh. What kind of toy is this? Asked Thor curiously. Thor had felt a familiar feeling. The feeling he got every time a supernatural weapon in the dwarves forge was created the weapon can harm you. Gilgamesh walked towards Thor. Phew ha 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 ha. I never needed to utilize my fate given skill be honored, you will be the first to witness the power of mankind, said Gilgamesh. 
As soon as Gilgamesh stopped talking, something happened. Small golden and white glowing portals began to appear near Gilgamesh. When Thor saw those portals he could only curse his luck. The God of Thunder recognized this ability by a name Gates of Babylon. For real? Said Thor. This seemed to amuse Gilgamesh. Oh! Astonished? This ability was given to me by fate. I never used it, as I never had a worthy opponent. Until now said Gilgamesh. From the golden portals, several gold-plated weapons began to emerge. And then the weapons fire from the portals, aiming to hit the Norse god. Thor suddenly glowed blue and quickly disappeared. Gilgamesh only witnessed a fist coming towards his face. Bam before Thor could reach Gilgamesh, Enkidu appeared and kicked Thor, causing the god to hit the wall. Fuhaha! Though I needed no help I treasure the noble intention you filthy beast said Gilgamesh, looking at Enkidu. Enkidu did not respond with words Bam for Enkidu punched Gilgamesh shortly thereafter, causing the king of Uruk to hit his throne. I must say Enkidu, tracking my speed through animal instincts is quite amazing, but it's not enough said Thor, who suddenly appeared beside Enkidu. Enkidu, surprised by Thor's presence, tried to hit him. Bam only for Thor to react quickly and punch Enkidu. Fuhahaha. This is so much fun. Said Gilgamesh, running towards Thor. Enkidu, having recovered from the blow, rushed towards Thor again. Meanwhile, the Thunder God smiled in response. So it will be free for all? Ha 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 ha. So be it. Said Thor, laughing at the situation. And then the three men met in the middle of the palace's throne room. Boom and they caused a shock wave, which was able to be mistaken for an earthquake by the inhabitants of Uruk. And so, these three fought all day. On that day, the city of Uruk was marked by a full day of earthquakes. Until late in the afternoon, the once palace of Uruk was reduced to rubble. When the townspeople went to check it out, they were surprised. The three combatants, which consisted of Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and Thor, were no longer fighting, to the surprise of the people who were present, they were drinking. Fuhahaha. I must say, Thor, your fishing story is peculiar. I have never caught a dragon. Said Gilgamesh, laughing. The people of Uruk couldn't have been more surprised their king was enjoying himself. I would invite you to stay at the palace, but due to our little power exhibition, the palace is currently unavailable, but all the houses belong to me. So let's go to noble Balthazar's house, he is one of the richest nobles, so he will provide acceptable accommodation, besides, his wife is good in bed fuhahaha said Gilgamesh, laughing with glee. This angered Enkidu. Not forced. Do not covet someone else's wife. It's wrong. Do not abuse power. Said Enkidu. Thor then spoke. I accept the accommodations, but the wife I'll pass up, it's not my style, said Thor. Gilgamesh looked disappointed. You two are too pure. Very well then, just the accommodations come, my friends, tomorrow I will rebuild my palace, and we will have a feast to introduce you to the superior cuisine of my city, said Gilgamesh, getting up. Thor and Enkidu just followed King Gilgamesh. But Enkidu looked a little disappointed, don't call me pure animals disagree, said Enkidu, frowning. Thor knew what Enkidu was talking about before Enkidu met the priestess, animals were Enkidu's friends. However, after Enkidu's encounter with the priestess, the animals were now moving away from Enkidu, it's like the animals no more recognize Enkidu as one of them. Relax Enkidu. If you really love nature, you will find its beauty everywhere, even among humans said Thor, unconcerned. Enkidu thought about what Thor had said. Everywhere hum friend Thor is right, said Enkidu, nodding. Fuhahaha. Don't tell me you're one of those madmen who pretend to be wise to get paid for advice, my friend, said Gilgamesh, laughing at Thor. The thunder god just shrugged. I don't have the patience to be wise however, I accept to be paid for my advice, said Thor, amused. What was happening further confused the people of Uruk King Gilgamesh had made friends? Location. Uruk. POV Thor. I spent my night in Uruk before returning the next morning to my group and bringing them into town. Initially, I was afraid Gilgamesh would try to make a move on Hell or Sif, but after a few weeks, I realized that my worries were in vain. Somehow, just one day after Gilgamesh met Enkidu and me, the king of Uruk drastically changed his behavior. And if Gilgamesh went out of line, Enkidu was soon rebuking the king. Enkidu changed Gilgamesh. The tyrant king began to show signs of a responsible king. Cancelled the first night law. Changed army law to be optional. And most of all, he no longer slept with other men's wives although he still slept with Inanna's priestesses, whenever he was relieved of his responsibilities as king. It was strange to witness this drastic change. 
Changing Gilgamesh's lifestyle still had a long way to go, but I had a feeling Gilgamesh was heading in the right direction. While I found Gilgamesh's rehabilitation to be something fun to watch, there was one thing I did notice, it wasn't something I noticed right away, and the reason for that bothered me. Because I didn't exactly know the answer. It all started the morning after the free-for-all showdown at the Uruk Palace. The palace was in ruins. And so Gilgamesh ordered his servants to help him rebuild the glorious house of the greatest kings of the world, so that there may be decent accommodations for his friends. I didn't know if I considered Gilgamesh a friend, but again, it was Gilgamesh's perception, not mine. Anyway, Enkidu and I helped as best we could. While I was removing the heavy debris, I found something the body of a child that was crushed by the rubble, a result of my fun during my fight between Enkidu and Gilgamesh. A lifeless look stared at me. The child must have been a servant's daughter or something like that, but what bothered me it was that I didn't care. I indirectly killed someone because I was playing during the fight and I didn't care. I have buried bodies of the dead from Enlil's last flood, and I have helped mortals here and there, but it was only now that I realized that I don't care if a mortal dies. Was this supposed to be normal? I pondered this question for a few days, and I still didn't have an exact answer. At this moment I was alone in my makeshift room in the newly built palace of Uruk. I reflected on the events that had occurred to me throughout my years in this new life in the universe. Hang on what universe am I? I wondered. I wasn't remembering the name. I always knew my memory wasn't the best, but I should remember important things. Right? Okay, a reminder to myself. Write a list of important things and names, just in case my memory fucks me up in the future. But back to the part about becoming indifferent to the death of mortals due to my actions, directly or indirectly. I vaguely remember that, before I was reborn into this world, I valued life. I mean I think. Ugh what's happening to me? Divine existential crisis? Divine memory loss? Is this curable? Well, as the saying goes. If it's bad, don't worry it will get worse. I think I need to talk to Thoth in the future, he's over 10,000 years old, and he's a god of knowledge. That old bird must have an idea about what was happening to me however, while I would have liked to think more about my memory failure, my thoughts were on something else. Like a little legend about a dragon among the shepherds who lived around Uruk. These shepherds had family in a place some distance away, on the coast of what would become the Mediterranean Sea. The Canaanites. These people had a legend about a dragon that lived in the sea, and that dragon had mysterious magical properties, which made me curious. I think I've decided on my next step. Knock knock I was interrupted from my thoughts by a knock on my bedroom door. Who could it be at this hour? I questioned. I got up and went towards the door when I opened it, I saw a woman I'd never seen before, greetings Master Thor, I am Aisha, and I will be your companion for the night by order of King Gilgamesh, said the woman, identified as Aisha, bowing to me. Company? Oh, right. I think it's that kind of company. Before I could respond, a voice resounded down the hall. Hang on. Shouted the voice. I shouldn't I looked towards the voice. It was Sif. And she was running quickly towards us, it must be something important for her to come here at that speed, he he already has company. Said Sif looking at Aisha. What? Oh. Are you the mistress of Master Thor? I see would you like me to join you for the evening activities or is it not necessary? Ask Aisha. Okay, I'm still sometimes amazed at how free the ancient world is about this sort of thing. Although while in the lands of Horus he was even more open about it. Hell, for the mortals of that land, sex was a staple of life, along with eating and drinking, and not considered something shameful or funny in any way. The most disturbing was the wedding. If it was among common people, it was enough for the woman, or in some cases the man, to go live with the partner, and that's it the person was married. This was something I never understood while in the lands of Horus no, I'm enough said Sif. But I knew Sif well enough to know that from her tone, she was lying well, that in whenever we slept together she always passed out oh? I see, in that case, I will retire, have a good night said Aisha, who then bowed and left. Sif was still outside as I stared at her. She looked nervous when she noticed my gaze. What? Don't you want me for the company? Do you want me to call that priestess to please you? Asked Sif, with a sarcastic tone at the end. She was blushing. I just sighed and invited her into my room, and as soon as I closed the door I made a rune so we could talk without the prying ears. I suspected something was wrong. Okay, I've known you for over a millennium, if you wanted to sleep with me, you wouldn't even have to ask these questions, you just walk into my room and start undressing, so, can you tell me what happened? 
I asked. If possible, Sif's face turned even redder. I've never do that. It's just look, I just came here to notify you of something that happened in Asgard, said Sif. Oh? That was weird, I haven't received any notifications of anything important in a long time. Thor, my mother communicated with me. I think you know the story of Dane and his banishment after he forged the Dane's leaf, while he was found dead by Brokra and Sindri, when they were checking to see if Dane was still in the exile, said Sif seriously. Okay, this was something I definitely should have known about, but there was still a lot of vague information. What was my old man's answer? I asked. If there was one thing Odin had the advantage of, it was the Lidskiv throne. But I was surprised by Sif's response. According to my mom, she thinks your father doesn't know yet, that's what's bothering me, Odin has the Lidskiv besides the crows, but it looks like he didn't see what happened does he didn't notify the leader of the dwarves, or in the worst case scenario, he saw it and chose to remain silent. This last scenario may cause the dwarves to suspect Odin, I came here as I trust you to answer this. Do you think your father is somehow involved? Asked Sif seriously. Honestly, Odin's involvement could be a possibility. After all, he, along with Loki, tricked me into solving the Utgard rebellion. But my old man never showed a dislike for dwarves in fact, he thinks the dwarves should stay in Asgard permanently and leave Nidavalar uninhabited. Because of that, I'm sure that he would never risk any animosity towards the dwarves, I said. That seemed to have relieved Sif a little. Well, I had to be sure, but there's something else. Nadavalar is located in the underground of Midgard, investigations so far have only found one thing, it was not in Nadavalar, but it was in Midgard, and right on the makeshift forge of Dane, said Sif. I noticed that Sif looked uncertain about what to say so I waited patiently. During the investigations in Midgard, traces of demonic energy were found, Sif said seriously. Demonic energy? But that man Thor there are devils in Midgard, Sif said. I rarely go back to Midgard after I started this journey also, Jormungandr was no longer on Midgard's shore son of a bitch. Where exactly is this location? I asked. Sif responded promptly. From your house, probably one week's walk to the Dane Forge, which is close to a fjord, said Sif. I think I'll go to that place another day, after all, someone is living on my land and they're not paying rent. My father was part of the search and investigation team, he asked me to join as well as he thinks my tracking skills would be useful, he believes this demonic energy is connected to centuries ago, unsolved disappearances of forest spirits, like the Huldras, and the humans, said Sif. Honestly, it could be possible. Another reason I moved to Midgard was because of the disappearance of spirits and humans centuries ago. As soon as I moved to Midgard most of them live close to my house, but still a respectable distance away. Once I started living in Midgard, the disappearances never happened again. I see, if you need my help just let me know when are you leaving? I asked. This was certainly important, and Sif was an excellent tracker. Tomorrow, said Sif. I nodded and headed towards the door as I thought the conversation was over. But I was stopped by Sif who had held my hand. I looked at Sif and raised an eyebrow when I noticed her flushed face and her head down, she looked shy? Is there anything else you want? I asked. Sif then looked into my eyes and spoke just one word. You, said Sif. She was blushing a lot for someone who tried to keep a straight face. Well, if there was one thing I liked about Sif, it was that she was very direct and spoke frankly when necessary. Also that was a confession, right? So why the hell do I think our roles reversed? You know what, fuck it. No matter the order of the factors, it will not change the result. Well, since you ask so boldly that it even surprised me, I see no reason to refuse, I said, with a small smile. It was then that I grabbed Sif Princess style and carried her to bed. It was going to be a long N-I-G-H-T, but I'm sure it will be a very satisfying morning. Location. Midgard Endoya Island. POV. Third person. The island in the Andoya was the furthest island of the Vesterlan archipelago, an island considered uninhabited by most forms of intelligent life. However, in this one, it was possible to find a figure in the middle of a blizzard on this deserted island. This figure was covered in a cloak and seemed to be calmly waiting for someone, it was then that he turned and looked at the nothing. May you appear, bad I have already raised the barrier said the figure, with a tone of disgust. It was then that another figure began to appear through the blizzard. The figure was a man who at first glance could be described as good-looking, and who had a friendly smile on his face, however, something was unsettling. The man was carrying a dead woman's body on his back, 
holding the body's leg with his right hand, and holding a severed head with his left hand. It was also noticeable that the leg of the dead body had a bite mark, it looked like someone had torn off a piece of meat. My, my, what's the matter? Do you miss me? Sorry for being late, it was rude of me, but I was a little hungry, I hope you don't mind my friend said the man, still smiling. The figure responded with disgust. Don't call me friend you filthy bat, you've been here a long time, and it's thanks to me that no one noticed you until recently said the figure, with a resigned tone. The man carrying the body appeared to have been hurt. Oh. I'm not your friend? What? After so many times we've spent together, is this how you repay me? I feel used. Said the man, who carelessly dropped the severed head from his left hand. And he used his, now free, hand to wipe away the tears that came out of his eyes non-existent tears. The cloaked figure didn't even look bothered, but it looked mildly annoyed. Enough of your jokes, Bat. I let you stay in these lands for centuries and hid you from other beings of my pantheon with my magic so you could hunt, and in return, you would offer me resources from the underworld. But now you've been careless and have revealed the presence of devils in Midgard. The deal is over. You have until tomorrow to leave Midgard or I will hunt and kill you myself, said the figure grimly. The man holding the body changed his demeanor quickly, and now he had a welcoming smile on his face. I understand your position, my dear friend I will hunt elsewhere, but I hope the end of this agreement is not the end of relations between devils and you. Also, I thought our relationship was quite professional and close, you won't recognize me as a friend, but can you at least call me by my name, said the man expectantly. The cloaked figure replied curtly. I refuse to associate so closely with anyone of your race, you bats shouldn't have even existed, I don't know why your former leader hasn't taken responsibility, and still cleansed you and those crows from the world figure. The man was hurt. Come o and just say my name down of Alifer. See? It's not that difficult, said the man holding the female body by the leg, now identified as Dam of Alifer, a member of the 72 pillars of the underworld. Or more specifically, Dama, son of the original Valifer. The shadowy figure just replied gruffly. Are you done? If so, leave this place before I change my mind and get rid of you right here and now, said the shadowy figure. However, Dama Valifer looked amused. Oh. And then? Do you really think your pantheon will forgive you if they find out about me? And even if they don't, do you really think the remaining 72 pillars would associate with you? Please, you and I know the answer for that question, I was just the more open-minded devil, because I acquired a very picky palate for finer meats, and you were also open-minded about me, Damas said, with a carefree smile. Balifer then took another bite of the leg he was holding, and took a piece of meat, and chewed it with pleasure. Hmm, virgins. Always have a different taste, said Dama, with a satisfied look. The cloaked figure showed disgust. When Dama finished chewing and swallowing the meat he looked at the figure, well, this is goodbye for now. See you around my dear friend said Dama. The devil Valifer then created the magic teleportation circle and waved at the cloaked figure. Bye bye. Oh. Said Dama. It was then that Valifer noticed the severed head on the ground he had dropped. How clumsy I am you can keep the girl's head, my dear friend. Put her in a vase and put her in your room. Maybe it will lighten your mood if you wake up and have such an item adorning your room, Dama said with an excited smile. And then Dama Valifer disappeared, leaving the shadowy figure alone again. Sigh filthy devil at least he won't be my problem anymore said the figure, which then disappeared shortly thereafter. Location. Uric. POV. Third person. It had been a week since Thor had said goodbye to Sif, and now the Norse god along with his group, was eating at the head table of the newly built palace of Uric. Everything seemed calm however, Inkidu seemed far away in thought. Inkidu, is something wrong? I see you are sad? Asked Gilgamesh, curious. The king changed a lot in the few days now that Enkidu and Thor lived in the palace. The people of Uruk praised their king's change of demeanor through festivals in honor of Gilgamesh. Never had the people of Uruk been so happy. The people begged the gods to stop Gilgamesh and his tyrannical rule, and the gods responded by creating Enkidu, but the friendship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu was not what the people were initially expecting however, technically, the request of the people of Uruk was granted. The tyrant Gilgamesh had been stopped by Enkidu. And now there was a good and just king. As Enkidu was constantly rebuking Gilgamesh just in case. Enkidu then looked at Gilgamesh and then at Thor, he looked uncertain. Friend Gilgamesh, friend Thor does death await us? Asked Enkidu. Thor was silent, while Gilgamesh fuhahaha. Death will not meet our friend Thor, 
but you and I? Yes, after all, death is always waiting for us mortals. She is the lover of all humans, and her kiss is the last for all of us. But don't worry Enkidu, I will order the people of Uruk to always offer drinks every day, for all eternity, we shall never feed on dust, said Gilgamesh. The answer had a melancholy sense, but Gilgamesh said it with a cheerful smile. I don't think Ereshkigal is like that, remember Kerr is a very dark thing for you, said Thor. The Kerr was an underworld unlike any other. There was no good or bad place on the Kerr. It was just all gloomy. The souls just stayed in the caves of the Kerr and fed on dust for eternity, however, if the soul had someone who was still alive and who remembered the soul in life, he could offer some other drink to the soul in the Kerr as an offering. An example would be someone offering water at the entrance of a cave to someone they knew in life. Drink only not food. There was no circle of reincarnation. So the soul's eternity just consisted of feeding on dust or offering drinks from someone who remembered them while in life, especially family. However there was a catch. But what if the people forget about us? I'm afraid that I will simply be forgotten, the people of Uruk will probably remember us just until the dust from our bones has disappeared, said Enkidu in anguish. Enkidu was a simple being. He lived among animals, and in just a few days he is living among men. Enkidu was created, not born. Enkidu didn't mind eating dust for eternity on the Kerr, he just didn't want to be forgotten. Baminois roared in the hall. It was Gilgamesh who had knocked on the table. We will not be forgotten, I will make sure our names echo through time. Said Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh only thought for a while before looking at Enkidu with a smile. Let's do something no one has ever done. Let's go to the cedar forest and kill the hideous creature that dwells there. We will offer the killing as an offering to Yudu, so that he will immortalize us in the stars," said Gilgamesh. However someone didn't seem too interested. Well, I'm sorry to inform you, but as I'm technically immortal, I'm not going to accompany you on this quest I have my own," said Thor. Gilgamesh and Enkidu didn't look insulted but curious. Oh! What is your quest, Thor? I suppose it is a glorious thing, after all, you are my friend," said Gilgamesh. If there was one thing Gilgamesh didn't change, it was his patterns. For Gilgamesh to be his friend there were standards to be met. There's a legend about a dragon from a land a little far away, the land of the Canaanite people, I'm curious about this dragon, said Thor. Gilgamesh did only one thing. Phew ha 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 ha. He laughed. As expected of my friend. I heard about this dragon, it must be the dragon king praised by the Canaanites, I was also curious about this dragon, as it is the most mysterious dragon king so far, if you know about him, but it seems that his power is on the same level as the creature of the cedar forest, said Gilgamesh. Thor was curious as it was a chance to get information before hunting this dragon. Can you say more about this dragon king? said Thor, looking at Gilgamesh. But Thor was disappointed when King Gilgamesh denied it. I do not need to know about lesser beings, the only thing I know is that the dragon seems to be either the servant of the god Yam or the god himself in disguise, other than his name," said Gilgamesh with a shrug. Thor was not discouraged, however. What is the name of the dragon king? asked Thor. Gilgamesh just smiled. Loden, said Gilgamesh. However, for Thor, it sounded something else loot. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.